So don't want to be found yet. I can make sure it gets there without anyone being able to ask questions. She beamed. Rosalind looked pointedly at Alice, but Alice was pouring more coffee and offering Kate the toast and paying no attention to her. Rosalind had no choice but to leave them there and go to her parlour. But she was certain Kate had understood Alice's veiled message. Kate might wish them to believe she was no cause for concern and that they should not pay too much attention to her. But Alice, at least, did not believe that for an instant. She would be keeping a steady eye on Kate. The question now became, what would Kate do about that? Chapter 22 A Quiet Walk in the Park My inquiries after him were indefatigable, but for some time unsuccessful. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda A thick, dank fog shrouded Hyde Park. Adam made his way cautiously across the slick grass. He carried a lantern, but the feeble light did nothing to drive back the grey and yellow vapours that blotted out the sunlight. Normally, Adam would have waited until the fog lifted, but time was short. There was no knowing when the Cato Street trial would come up on the docket. Trials were held in the order in which the cases came in. Even on such an important matter, the court might only have a few hours' notice before the case was brought. If this wild goose chase he had set himself was to do any good at all, Adam could not afford to waste the morning. Hyde Park was a huge green expanse in the middle of the city. Herds of deer wandered among the trees. Pleasure-seekers sailed on the serpentine and drove along Rotten Row. Cowherds pastured their animals on the grass and sold the milk to those same pleasure-seekers. According to the records Stafford had reluctantly given him, the man, Hyden, who had passed word of the Cato Street conspiracy to the President of the Privy Council, was a member of this fraternity of London cowherds. Adam raised his lantern in a vain attempt to see more than an arm's length in front of him and blessed his country boyhood. He was able to move with confidence across the uneven ground and make something resembling a straight track across the green. The fog muffled all sound, but gradually he was able to make out the soft lowing of cattle. Adam angled his path up a gentle hill toward a cluster of shapes that could have been anything from a line of shrubs to a group of standing stones. Slowly, though, the shadows resolved themselves into a small herd of brown cows, munching contentedly on the sodden grass. A wrinkled man on a three-legged stool leaned up against one of the cows, milking steadily. As Adam emerged from the fog, a stout girl, probably the milkman's daughter, caught up a covered pail and lugged it toward Adam. Drink a fresh milk for you, sir? Gladly. Adam gave her his pennies and accepted the ladle. He drank it off and handed it back. I'm looking for a cowman named Hyden. Do you know him? The girl hesitated, but the old man answered. What do you want with him? he asked, without looking up from the cow or stopping his task. Aye, said a voice from the fog. What do you want with me? A slight, slouching figure stepped out of the mist. Patched clothes hung loose on a lean frame. Damp and dirt left his hair stringy. He carried a cow prod as tall as he was. Even in the dim lantern light, Adam could see Hyden wore the wary, hardened look of a man who always expected trouble. The old milkman seemed to expect trouble as well. He patted the side of his cow. Susie, go fetch me strawberry. Buttercup here's finished. The girl, as quick on the uptake as any of the men, scurried away, leaving her bucket and ladle behind. My name's Harkness, said Adam to Hyden and the milkman. I'm here from Bow Street. I've some questions about the doings in Cato Street. I've nought to say, declared Hyden. You were willing enough to talk before, Adam pointed out, and you brought that warning note to his grace, the Earl of Harrowby. And what have I got from her troubles? demanded Hyden. Some lot of officious fellas saying, go there, come here, keep yourself where we can see you or we'll come after you, he scowled. And never mind we said there'd be money for you, you just do what you're told or you'll be in the tower with the rest of them. Who told you that? Adam asked. 
Hyden spat. I'm done with a lot of yous. Hear me? You can all go to the devil. He brandished his prod and then wheeled around. Adam moved forward, but Hyden had already disappeared into the fog, leaving Adam standing there with his lantern and his questions, and feeling nothing short of foolish. A rusty laugh cut through his self-recrimination. Well, that didn't go well for you, my boy, did it? wheezed the milkman. No, Adam sighed. That it did not. The milkman reached under his arm and gave himself a good scratch. Oh, you mighty robin redbreasts, with nothing better to do than scare a poor man out of his wits. He also spat into the grass, echoing Hyden's sentiments. For the lot of yous. Adam considered the milkman. The set of his shoulders and the glint in his eye said he wanted an argument. And any man who wanted an argument wanted to talk. Has someone been out giving Hyden a hard time? Adam asked him. You should know, shouldn't you? He was one of yours. Did he give his name? The milkman eyed him warily. I warned Hyden, he said finally. Told him to keep himself to himself. Don't go mucking about with troublemakers, I says. World is what it is, and it ain't been changed by a bunch of dafties yelling and barging about. But he wouldn't listen. And where's it got him, eh? He poked a finger toward Adam. We got one lot's promising to free the poor, then that don't work out, and we got the other lot's promising to pay a fortune if Iden makes his mark on their paper and swears this thing he can't even read is all right and true. And does that money they promised show up? It does not. And I could have told him that too. Can't trust any of them, I says. Adam nodded. What you're saying is true, he acknowledged. Now I'll tell you another truth. If someone's out and about making additional trouble and using Bow Street's name to do it, I want a word with him. The man spat again. Why should the likes of me believe the likes of you? Because you're a smart one, said Adam. You can tell the measure of a man, and that's why I'm going to believe what you tell me now. To prove his good intent, Adam fished in his pocket and brought out a pair of shillings. The milkman looked at the coins and then at Adam. His old eyes were searching and sly, but he didn't reach for the coins right away. Instead, he scratched under his arm again and then rubbed his stubbled chin, as if struggling to reach some conclusion of his own. Then, in a great mocking display, he swept his slouching hat off his head and held it out to Adam. Adam dropped the coins in. The man claimed them. In another show of insolence, he bit the edge of one to make sure it was good. Evidently deciding the shillings passed muster, the milkman tucked them into his waistcoat pocket. It were a tall fella, dark hair, soft hands, good clothes, and him a scarlet waistcoat and black cravat. All the trimmings came round just yesterday, just about scared the wits at old Hyden. He gave out another rusty laugh, remembering, telling him that he's bound for the gallows with all the rest of them if he don't answer true. Did he give a name, this fellow? Beecher, Beecham, something of the kind, started with a B anyway. Silently, Adam ran down the list of officers and runners he knew, but there was no one who matched the description the milkman gave. What did this Mr. B want to know about? The corner of the cowman's mouth curled up in a smile. Mr. B, as you calls him, he wanted to know what Hyden knew about the ones that got away. Accused him of helping them slip the net, especially this fella Edwards. Did he bother to ask you about this missing Edwards? The man grinned, displaying all his crooked, broken teeth. He did not. What could you have told him if he had? Adam brought out two more coins. The sly smile returned. This time there was no nonsense with the hat. He just held out his hand. Adam dropped the coins onto his palm. I'd have told him to go see Celia Ings, said the milkman. Billy Ings himself used to come down here of a morning, grousing about this and that, and boasting all about this thistlewood and his mighty friends. The milkman tapped his nose. A man that goes quiet about his work can hear a good deal. 
Adam nodded. Ings was one of the men waiting to go on trial. Celia must be a relative, possibly his wife. Was Edwards one of those friends Ings talked about? Happens he was, said the milkman. A mighty rich and clever friend at that. Promised them all the money in the Bank of England once the revolution came. Do you know where I'd find Celia Ings? The milkman gave him directions, at least as far as he could, but told him he could ask anyone. Celia was well known, it seemed, as was her man. Adam thanked him for his time. The milkman shrugged. Don't out but looking after me own, he said, and raised his voice. Susie, where you at, you fool girl? Adam left the man to his business and started back down the hill. Overhead, he could just make out the feeble disk of the sun already high in the sky. The fog hadn't lifted at all. The world still felt slowed and thickened. What sounds there were seemed sluggish. The cows on their hill, the horses' hooves and the cautious rattle of carriages, the honk of discontented geese. The footsteps moving carefully across the grass behind him. Instinct tensed Adam's shoulders. He raised his feeble lantern and struck off at an angle, heading back for the carriage road and what crowds would be out on such a morning. The footsteps followed. Adam cursed silently. He should have brought someone with him. It was not his habit to run away, but if the man behind him now was the same footpad who'd followed him and Gautier out of the cocoa tree the other night, he was dangerous. Turning to face him alone was a pointless risk. If this new footpad didn't want to fight, he could just melt away into this blasted fog. But there was more than one way to skin a cat of this kind. Adam considered. The neighbourhoods around the park were mostly occupied by the Auton and their families. He did not know many persons in that rarefied circle. But there was someone. The ground underneath Adam's boots changed from wet grass to hard-packed dirt as he reached the carriage road. Adam raised his lantern again to get what few bearings the fog was willing to give up. Then he turned abruptly to the left and headed for the park gates. The footsteps followed. Chapter 23 An Uncomfortable Conversation her ideas were in too great and painful confusion. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda. How did one tell a woman she had been poisoned? That question occupied Rosalind for the entire cab ride to Mrs. Leverton's house. After supper last night, she had written a note to Mrs. Leverton, asking permission to call early. By the time she'd been ready to retire, a footman arrived, carrying a reply stating that Mrs. Leverton would be ready to see her at any time she might choose. The footman received her at the door. The maid took her up to Mrs. Leverton's rooms. Mrs. Hepplewhite curtsied when Rosalind entered. The nurse's face betrayed nothing, neither of what she'd done nor any curiosity to know what Rosalind had discovered. Miss Thorne! Mrs. Leverton lay in bed, propped up with bolsters and pillows, with several layers of cashmere shawls wrapped around her shoulders. Her colour was somewhat better than the last time Rosalind had seen her, and her voice a little stronger. What have you to tell me? How do you tell someone? The question ran through Rosalind's mind for the hundredth time. It was imperative that they not be overheard. But there was the maid standing by the door, and the footman in the hall. Of the family... Beatrice, at least, was somewhere in the house. She might not want to wait to find out if Rosalind had brought fresh news about Kate. Any of the other Levitons might arrive at any moment and come to the room uninvited. On another morning, she might suggest they go into the garden, but that was impossible. No reputable nurse would allow a patient in Mrs. Leverton's supposed condition to be taken outside in this fog. Mrs. Leverton seemed to understand her hesitation. "'You may go, Talmadge,' she said to the maid, and tell Kinsley I am not to be disturbed by anyone. That includes any of my relations. Yes, ma'am. Talmadge curtsied and left the room, closing the door behind her. Marcus will fume, 
said Mrs. Leverton to Rosalind, but we shall have to risk it. Now sit down, Miss Thorne, and tell me what brings you here so early. Mrs. Hepplewhite moved a tapestried chair to the bedside. Rosalind sat, smoothing her skirts needlessly. How? Rosalind shook the question away. There was no good method. She could only be direct. Mrs. Leverton, there has been an attempt on your life. Mrs. Leverton paused for a single heartbeat. If this is a joke, it is in very poor taste, Miss Thorne. I'm not joking, Mrs. Leverton. Your private stock of tea has been tainted with arsenic. Nonsense! I drank some of that tea just this morning and I have not felt so well in almost a week. It is not the same tea. The original has been replaced and has been subjected to an analysis. It is poisoned, and that poison is arsenic. After this declaration, Mrs. Leverton remained rigid and still, at least for a moment. Then, slowly, she crumpled in on herself, pressing her hand hard against her breast. Mrs. Hepplewhite hurried around the far side of the bed to grasp her shoulders. Let go, snapped Mrs. Leverton, and the nurse, affronted, pulled her hands away. Mrs. Leverton stayed as she was, bowed over her hand, her breathing rapid and harsh. For a moment, Rosalind thought the other woman might be sick. But slowly, Mrs. Leverton regained control of herself and straightened up to fix Rosalind with her piercing gaze. This is a hard, distasteful thing you've told me, Miss Thorne. The words rasped in Mrs. Leverton's throat. Do you know who is responsible for this... this outrage? No, I only know that it happened. I received confirmation this morning from a trusted individual. She paused. Where is the tea caddy kept? There. She nodded to a lovely cabinet of burled maple with a marble top. And yes, it is still there. Is the cabinet itself locked? No, but the caddy is. And who keeps that key? I do, Mrs. Leverton said grimly. But the whole house knows where it is. She waved toward the mantel, and Rosalind saw a carved box sitting there. Is there any servant you have dismissed recently? Perhaps with whom you have had trouble or a falling out? Mrs. Leverton snorted. I recognise it is a common failing of the upper classes to blame their servants for everything, but it is not a weakness I share. No working person would be fool enough to risk their necks in such a ridiculous manner. I am inclined to agree said Rosalind. But the question had to be asked. I suppose, muttered Mrs. Leverton. Well, Miss Thorne, how do we proceed? Do I barricade my door? Hire a food taster? Hepplewhite here is most dedicated, but I think she will not agree to take on that particular duty. Certainly not, said Mrs. Hepplewhite. I wish I had a good answer for you, said Rosalind. But this is beyond my experience. And mine, I do assure you. Mrs. Leverton plucked restlessly at her bed coverings. Do we assume it is one of my relatives? I do not assume anything, said Rosalind. I have been wrong too many times. Very wise, but I require some plan of action, Miss Thorne. Rosalind resisted the urge to bite her lip or to pluck at her skirts in imitation of Mrs. Leverton's uneasy movements. It would seem that the poisoner's plan was to send you into a slow decline. Therefore, it might be prudent to keep up the appearance of illness. Or else they might be inclined to try to hasten things along. Mrs. Leverton shuddered, the tremor giving the lie to her calm, waspish tone. There's sense in that, but I do not like the idea of lying in my bed waiting. My nerves are strong, but even I have my limits. I understand. If you will allow, I will continue to speak to your family with the excuse that I am still helping search for Kate. Hopefully we will be able to uncover more information. Mrs. Leverton was silent for a long moment. Her sharp eyes darted back and forth, following the pattern of her private thoughts. Rosalind felt her own nerves tighten. And what can you tell me of Kate? Mrs. Leverton asked finally. May I take it you do know where she is? Rosalind was startled, but not entirely so. She knew Mrs. Leverton had a very quick mind. Yes. And you have for a while, I imagine. Yes, 
She was very ill when she was discovered, and it was by observing her that the possibility of poison was raised. Mrs. Leverton's expression hardened. And that was why you pretended not to know anything about her? Yes, said Rosalind. I thought to protect her from whoever might have done this thing. Mrs. Leverton nodded reluctantly. But she is well now. She is out of danger and rapidly regaining her strength. Does she say why she left? She says it was because she decided she did not want to marry Harold Davenport. Stupid girl, snapped Mrs. Leverton. It was all arranged. She would have had everything she could want, including her freedom. Harold would make no fuss about how she chose to live. It can be hard to face the prospect of a lifetime filled with deception. Every woman, Miss Thorne, must commit some deception. It is the only way we survive in this world. Rosalind said nothing. She did not want to agree, but the point was a difficult one to argue. Where did she think she was going? And how? I was generous with her, but I didn't give her anything like enough pin money to set herself up independently. It seems she has been pawning some jewellery. I found two receipts from a broker in her room. She paused. I am sorry to have to ask this, but has any of your jewellery gone missing? What you mean to ask is, has Kate robbed me as well as poisoned me? For what it may be worth, I do not believe Kate is the one who has poisoned you. Heaven spare me, Mrs. Leverton sighed. However, to answer your question, no, I am not aware that anything has gone missing, but I will have my maid make sure of it. In the meantime, Miss Thorne, you may proceed as you think best, and I will wait here. You may continue to apply to me for any expenses. I will allow you a week. Mrs. Leverton. A week, she repeated. I have work to do, Miss Thorne. A life to lead. I will not spend what is left of my days locked in my rooms. Neither will I permit myself to be harangued by Beatrice every day for failing to find her daughter. Now, I may not think much of her. She always was a dull person, and she permitted herself to be worn down by her late husband. But she doted on Catherine, and does not deserve to suffer because the girl has taken flight. Miss Leverton has promised to write to her mother today and say she is safe and well. That, I'm afraid, will only change the nature of Beatrice's harangues. A week, Miss Thorne. Very well, said Rosalind. A week. But I have another question. Mrs. Leverton gestured for her to continue. Why did you decide to return to London just now? Mrs. Leverton was silent for a moment, considering her words. Or her available answers. Rosalind suppressed the thought, but it did not go easily. It was time, she said at last. The old king was failing. The prince regent was believed to be a man of the world with reformist leanings. The uprising at Peterloo showed that the people are not only ready for change, they are demanding it, and the radicals in Parliament were rallying for a fight. They may withhold the vote from us, Miss Thorne, but there is plenty a woman can do to influence events if she tries, and especially if she has money. Her eyes gleamed. And then came this Cato Street business. You've read the papers? A few, yes, said Rosalind. In fact, when the papers were not talking of the old king's death or the new king's rage against the queen, they were talking about Cato Street. George Littlefield had even been roped into providing grist for that particular mill. All this was in addition to what Adam had been able to tell her. A committee for their defence has been organised, said Mrs Leverton. I'm able to lend them some financial backing, and, she waved her hand, indicating all that had followed, you frown, Miss Thorne. The fact was, Rosalind had frowned to keep from blushing. I am thinking that sometimes we come very close to making a mistake and are only saved by luck. Mariana looked at her very hard. I will ask you about that at another time. Was it known that you were once again involving yourself in politics? I make no secret of it. She lowered her heavy brows. You cannot think that has something to do with this attempt on my life. I don't know, said Rosalind. Political intrigue is far beyond my realm of expertise. 
However, it is my understanding that even while there is fresh movement toward reform, there is also a very strong movement to stop reform, and possibly at any cost. As we may see from the fact that eleven impoverished men are being held in the tower for something they did not do. Mrs. Leverton stopped. What is your view of the matter, Miss Thorne? I do not yet have all the facts, said Rosalind. Therefore I do not care to venture an opinion. You are a diplomat, that is to be expected. A pained expression crossed her face, and her cheeks grew pale. Mrs. Hepplewhite moved forward. I'm all right, said Mrs. Leverton. You may withdraw. I will not, Mrs. Hepplewhite replied, because you are not. I must insist that this interview end. You still need to rest. Miss Thorne will excuse us. Rosalind recognised the tone in Mrs. Hepplewhite's voice and knew that argument was impossible. She got to her feet. I will call again tomorrow if I may. If you do not, I will send for you. Mrs. Leverton sank back onto her bolsters. Mrs. Hepplewhite adjusted her patient's shawls and laid a hand on her forehead. Mrs. Leverton mumbled something angrily, but Mrs. Hepplewhite did not take her hand away. Since you seem to be intent on perpetuating this ruse, Mrs. Hepplewhite said, may I suggest Miss Thorne go to the breakfast room and say that you suffered a sudden collapse? Why, Hepplewhite, said Mrs. Leverton approvingly, what an excellent idea. Some light returned to her tired eyes. Then she said to Rosalind, I am trusting you, Miss Thorne. I require answers. Rosalind made her curtsy and took her leave. As she descended the stairs, her thoughts returned to what Honoria had told her. I'd advise you to be careful. She puts on the genteel mask as well as any of us, but she's tough as nails. And she does not like to be disappointed. Chapter 24 Turning the Tables It is not every man who has the clearness of head sufficient to know his duty to his neighbour. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda. Mr. Harkness! Sanderson Folks emerged from his dressing room. The dandy wore a long, scarlet, velvet dressing gown, trimmed with black satin, over his immaculate fawn linen shirt. You will excuse my déshabillé. I'm afraid I was not entirely prepared for company at this hour. It occurred to Adam that Folks was a perfect fit for his environment. The sitting room of his new expensive flat was filled with paintings, books and statuary. The furniture was overstuffed, the rugs thick. The thick green velvet curtains had been closed against the damp outside and a cheery fire blazed in the marble hearth. Adam's experience had led him to distrust men with a strong taste for luxury. They tended to think themselves innately superior to others and that could be destructive especially when combined with money or power. Folks, however, seem to love art and luxury for their own sake, and without passing judgment on others who did not share his tastes or have the means to pursue them. I apologise, Adam told him. I wouldn't have disturbed you if I had any choice. I am intrigued. Folks dropped carelessly onto his sofa. Pray, do tell me what brings you here. I picked up a footpad in the park this morning, said Adam. I think he's the same man who followed me from a meeting several nights ago. I expect that he's watching your door now, waiting for me to come back out. How rude, remarked Folks. Should I send my man to chase him away? Adam smiled briefly. I'd rather you sent your man round to Bow Street with a message from me. With luck, my colleagues and I can catch the man and find out what he's after. Aside from your good self, Folks smiled. My desk is there, he waved his hand. All writing implements and anything else you may need are entirely at your disposal. Adam thanked him and took up pen and ink. Torton should be in the station by now. Gautier might take longer to track down, as he would be out with his patrol. Hopefully the footpad was prepared to wait. When Adam finished his note, Folks rang the bell and a man, presumably the valet, appeared. He was older, square-built and stoic. His coat was plain to the point of being drab, but perfectly cut and immaculately clean. Folks gave the man his instructions 
and the man received them and the note without a word. This done, Sanderson rang his bell again, this time for breakfast. While he gave his orders, Adam moved to the front windows. Taking care to keep to one side, he shifted the green curtain and peered down into the street. The fog had just begun to lift, allowing Adam a fair view of the street. Folks lived in a lively and fashionable neighbourhood. There was a fair amount of traffic in the road, and a healthy number of loungers at the corners and in the alleys between the houses. Any one of them could be Adam's footpad. His personal bet was on either the man watching a cluster of porters settle down to their card game, or the fellow coming out of the tavern with a pot of drink in his hand. He'd have to rely on Gautier and Torton to sort out who was who. Come sit down, Mr Harkness. A table had been set beside the sofa and laid with coffee, rolls, jam and butter. Sanderson poured a cup of coffee for Harkness and indicated he should help himself to the food. He poured his own cup and added healthy amounts of cream and sugar. Adam drank the excellent coffee gratefully. The morning's chill still clung to his skin. Folks split a roll and spread it thickly with jam and butter. At last he leaned back and watched Adam buttering his own bread. Do you know, Mr Harkness, it occurs to me I know nothing of your background. My background? echoed Adam, startled. Yes. Sanderson took a healthy bite of a roll and immediately blotted his lips with his napkin. I know you, obviously, and your profession. I know you have the good fortune of having secured the interest of the most admirable Miss Thorne, but you yourself remain something of a conundrum. That's not a word that's ever been applied to me. I'm surprised, because your speech does not match your station. Adam let his brows arch. Indeed, if you were a character in one of Miss Littlefield's adventures, I'd suspect you of being an errant earl or something of the kind. Adam chuckled. If that's the case, my mother's been keeping secrets. May I ask why you're bringing this up now? For one of the few times since he'd met the man, Adam saw Folks look disconcerted. We've touched on the subject before, but I admit, as time has gone on, I have felt a certain urgency growing around the matter of you and Miss Thorne. I find I wish to know more about you, for her sake. Adam said nothing. Yes, I do know that if Miss Thorne realised I was attempting to intervene in any way regarding a man upon whom she chose to bestow her admiration, she would flay me alive. Adam cocked his head. Sanderson laughed. No, you are correct. Miss Littlefield would flay me alive. Miss Thorne would simply stop speaking to me, which would be worse. And yet here I am, risking what I consider the most precious friendship I possess— the words were light, but Folks's expression was perfectly serious. Who are you, Mr Harkness? Adam considered this question and decided to take it at face value. I am the eldest son of Adam Horatio Harkness, he said. My father was a builder, and he married Joanna Hutchison, a poulterer who kept a stall in Covent Garden. He died when I was still a boy, he said. Shortly after that, I fell ill to a dampness in my lungs. At least, that's what the apothecary said it was. He said that I must be sent away from London. My mother found a distant cousin who worked as a gamekeeper on an estate in Suffolk, and I was sent there. I spent the first month in bed, barely able to breathe. Adam set his cup down, so that the involuntary tremor in his hand would not make it slosh or rattle. My cousin's wife, Addie Hutchison, was childless, but with me she had a chance to be the mother she'd always longed to be. She was determined that I would live. She spent hours at my bedside, quite literally spoon-fed me, and when I could sit up she called in the vicar to see to my moral education, since I was not yet strong enough to go to church. The vicar, Mr Beckenridge, decided to make a sort of experiment of me. He taught me to read and to write, and spent as much time training me to say my H's as Mrs. Hutchison did brewing me teas and feeding me broth. Later he wrote a pamphlet calling for universal public education of the working class, using me as a prime example of what could be done. Folks made a noise that might have been approval or astonishment. Things were going hard at home, so my mother was glad to let my cousins keep me, Adam went on. 
When I was strong enough, my cousin started taking me out with him on his rounds. He taught me to ride and to shoot, with the idea to train me up as an under-gamekeeper. I might not have minded the work, except for the poachers. A dangerous lot, we are told, remarked Folks. A starving, desperate lot, more like, said Adam. And often they're just tenant farmers, trying to keep the rabbits and the pheasants from destroying the gardens they're depending on to get their family through the winter. Folks nodded once. My cousin was a good man, Adam went on. He tried to be fair. He knew that many men poached because their families were hungry, but he had his own job to consider, and... It was hard. There was a lot of bad feeling, and from what I saw the game laws were too harsh and the enforcement could be simply unjust. So, when I heard they were recruiting for the highway patrol, I decided to try my luck there instead. I felt I'd do better chasing after highwaymen rather than old men and boys. It would also let me come back home to London and my family. I barely knew my older sisters at that point, never mind my youngest brothers. But they welcomed me back, as if I'd never left. He took another swallow of coffee. That, Mr. Foulkes, is my background. Unexpected, murmured Foulkes. How so? I find that I envy you. He poured himself more coffee. Not your bucolic interlude. I myself would have probably perished from boredom, but you have had the luck of a family that is not only affectionate but practical and competent. It is an enviable combination. Adam bowed his head in acknowledgement. What is your next move? asked Folks, and if he changed the subject a bit too quickly, Adam did not feel the need to remark on it. As soon as my colleagues arrive, I'm going to find out who's been following me, said Adam, and then I'm going to find out why. You know that if I can be of any assistance, thank you. Adam cut him off, but not this time. If this is my man, he's already wounded a patrol captain, not to mention given me a few bruises of my own. This needs to stay in official hands. Folks ceded the point without argument and turned the conversation to platitudes and news of the day. In this way, he gave Adam a chance to simply sit and listen and gather himself which Adam appreciated. They had just emptied the coffee pot when the manservant re-entered the room, followed by Samson Gautier. Adam introduced Captain Gautier to Folks. Folks rose and bowed. You must both forgive me, he said. I have business to attend to. Vaughan, you are to follow any instructions the gentleman may have. With this, Folks sauntered out of the room. Gautier raised his brows. I'll explain our host later, said Adam. What can you tell me? You were right, he said. Our man is waiting outside. Show me. Moving carefully, Gautier stepped to the side of the window just as Adam had earlier. There. Gautier lifted the curtain and nodded to the street below. Beside the barbers, the round crown hat and blue coat standing by the porters playing cards. So he'd been right. Adam kept himself back from the window so he wouldn't be seen if anyone happened to glance up. He scanned the street until he picked out the ragged knot of men. From this angle he mainly saw battered hats and stooped shoulders under brown coats. They all hunkered around a packing crate while the crowds flowed around them. One man stood beside them, arms folded, one foot braced against the shop wall. It seemed he was watching the game, but Adam could tell by the angle of his head that his attention was trained on the front door of Folks's building. Did he see you come in? Not me, said Gautier. Split off from Torton, took a wide turn and came up the back stairs. Where's Torton now? In the cook shop. Gautier nodded toward the establishment next to the barbers. Apparently business was brisk. Waiters ran out with baskets while people jostled each other to crowd inside. Now Adam made out Torton's thick-set form standing outside with his hat pulled low and the remains of a chicken leg in his hand. All right, said Adam, and Gautier let the curtain fall back into place. I'm in no mood to muck about with this fellow. Me neither. Gautier rubbed his bandaged hand. Figured you and I could steer him toward Torton. I'll go out the same way I came in, skirt the crowd so I'm on his left. Good. 
When I see you're in place, I'll go out the front and get him to follow me. Then we'll see if he's willing to come along for a quiet word. Gautier's smile was grim. What do you think the odds of that are? We're about to find out, replied Adam. Let's go. Chapter 25 The Results of a Sudden Shock I determined to try the poison of jealousy by way of an alternative. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda Alice sat at her desk, surrounded by her heaps of books and papers. She had her page proofs spread out across her desk in front of her. A cup of coffee carried in from breakfast waited close to hand. But rather than attending to her pages, she was surreptitiously watching Kate Leviton writing letters. Kate sat at the smaller table by the window. Alice had moved the stacks of magazines and newspapers to the second chair to clear a working space for her and found an inkwell that had not gone dry and a pen that had a good tip. From where Alice sat, she could see the girl's sharp profile as she bent over the paper. Kate was objectively pretty, Alice decided, thin and wan, with large, deep eyes. She had the kind of delicacy that made people protective and kept them from asking questions. She wrote diligently and without any little habits like chewing on the end of her pen or twiddling the corners of her pages. Alice took her pen out of her mouth and laid it down. She knew that the easiest way to discover anything about Kate would be to ask Amelia straight out what she knew about the young woman and about what Kate had been telling her, and Alice would have done exactly that had it not been for one thing. It was very clear Amelia still had feelings for Kate. Alice dropped her gaze back to her pages and tried very hard to ignore the pinch of jealousy in her heart. Jealousy was useless. Worse, it was petty. Alice could not abide pettiness. But even as she reminded herself of this, jealousy pinched harder. She could practically feel the bruise forming. Alice did not want to put Amelia in the position of having to tell tales on a friend. That meant Alice had to ferret out Miss Kate Leverton's secrets for herself. Which led to yet another problem. The fact that she had no idea how to begin, which simply annoyed her. Kate straightened up and laid her pen down. Finished? asked Alice brightly. Finally! Kate blotted the letter methodically. I'm afraid I'm not much of a correspondent. Not everyone enjoys writing, said Alice. If you give that to me, I'll see it gets to where it needs to go. Kate sealed the letter and handed it over to Alice. Then she hesitated. Amelia says you taught her to read, she said suddenly. We traded lessons, said Alice. I taught her her letters and she taught me sewing. Or oh, I should say she tried to. I'm afraid I was a pathetically poor study. Alice pulled a face. At the same time, a warmth spread through her as she remembered the nights when the two of them sat so close together, laughing over Alice's attempts to pin and hem and darn in such a way that did not produce catastrophic lumps in her stockings. She remembered Amelia's hand on hers, trying to help her thread a needle. Amelia, however, has a marvellously quick mind, said Alice, before she could start to blush. I helped her begin, but she mostly taught herself from the papers and magazines. I think she spent every free minute reading, half days included. I was surprised to hear it, said Kate. I didn't think... I never... She twisted her hands. I knew she couldn't read, but I never thought she might want to. Several tart replies occurred to Alice. She swallowed all of them and tried not to wince at the taste. My father didn't like his servants to read, especially the maids, Kate went on. He said reading would just give them ideas above their station. It's a popular belief, Alice acknowledged. Yes, but I shouldn't have accepted it. I should... Kate stopped again. She's a friend. I should have known she wanted to read. I should have helped her. When you're looking over your shoulder, you can always see something you should have done, said Alice. Sometimes it's real, sometimes it isn't. All you can do is your best. Kate's mouth twitched, but Alice couldn't tell whether she was trying to suppress a smile or a frown. I didn't even manage that much. 
If I had, I wouldn't be in this mess. She dropped her gaze. And I would have written her, if I'd known, I would have explained everything so much sooner. Which meant Amelia hadn't written to her either. Alice wondered how Kate felt about that. Then she wondered if Amelia had even thought to send Kate a letter. The pinch was back. Kate, tell me about your friends in Edinburgh, said Alice, partly because she genuinely wanted to know, and partly because it was a distraction from thoughts of Amelia. She watched Kate considering her next words. Kate Leverton, it seemed, was in the habit of weighing up the people around her and adjusting her answers and her demeanour accordingly. Alice wondered if Rosalind had noticed how often that happened. Their name is Wallace, said Kate. Their sisters, Dorothea and Margaret. I met them in Bath. Their father is a jeweller. A jeweller, said Alice. That's unusual. Normally, a girl of Kate's class would not be encouraged to attend any gathering where she might accidentally mingle with artisans and their families. Kate understood what she meant. Well, things are much more relaxed in Bath than in London. All sorts of people mix together. Which was, of course, one of the reasons Bath and similar watering places were sneered at by many members of the haute ton. What brought the family to Bath? Alice asked. Their father, Mr Gregory Wallace, was there on business, said Kate. He brought Dora and Peg with him so they could have a holiday. Was their mother with them as well? No, she died when they were both young. They were raised by their grandmother for a time. They are both accomplished musicians, she went on. Dora plays pianoforte and Margaret the flute. We played together a few times. You're musical? Alice was genuinely surprised. I didn't realise. I play viola, said Kate. Dora and Margaret tell me I'm good. I don't think I'm as good as I should be, but when I practised with them, I could feel myself getting better, if you understand what I mean. I do. Alice also had the feeling that for once Kate was telling the truth. We've been corresponding regularly, well, as regularly as I can, and they've invited me to stay several times. So, when I needed somewhere to go, I thought of them. Well, I would love to hear you play, said Alice. It's not often we have music in the house. It's one talent Rosalind does not possess, and I'm simply hopeless. I'd be glad to, but I... Well, obviously I had to leave my instrument behind. Kate looked down at her empty hands. I was hoping I could send for it once I get settled. I don't mean to pry, said Alice. Kate raised her brows, and Alice could not help but laugh. All right, I do mean to pry, but what exactly are your plans? Surely a jeweller's family cannot take on a permanent guest, and even in Edinburgh one is expected to pay for board and lodging. I was hoping, well... Dora and Peg get invited to play parties and routes and so on. Professionally, I mean. I thought I might join them. She paused. They've even talked about going on the stage. It was not much of a plan, but it was something. And who knew? If Kate and her friends possessed the art of pleasing as well as a talent for music, they might manage to make a living. People did. Women did. Is Amelia planning to go with you? The question surfaced before Alice could stop it. Alice got to her feet. I was thinking we might take a stroll. The weather's fine this morning and I'm sure the fresh air would do you good. Fine, Kate frowned at her. There's a fog out there. Best thing in the world for the skin, said Alice briskly, and amazingly refreshing. I'm not sure the doctor would approve. We won't tell him. What about Miss Thorne? I'm supposed to be in hiding, aren't I? Do we think any of your family is lurking about outside? Alice would not have believed it possible, but Kate's pale cheeks actually lost yet more colour. I hope not. Well then, Alice rang the bell. Amelia appeared so quickly she must have been waiting by the door. I'm sure you've got a thousand things to do, but I was going to take Kate for a walk, perhaps down to the market. I was hoping you'd come along. Amelia's gaze flickered from Alice to Kate. Alice was a veteran of London's ballrooms, first as a debutante and then as a gossip writer. She had learned to accurately read the varied language of the meaningful glance. Amelia's to Kate said, Don't make me do this. 
Kate's silent reply was, We have to. The fierce little pinch was back in the depths of Alice's heart. But this time it wasn't jealousy. It was fear. By the time coats, bonnets, baskets and bags were all claimed, the fog had begun to lift. Alice picked her way down the slick front steps to the flagstone walk. She turned her face toward the hazy sky and inhaled deeply. The air in London was seldom what one would call truly fresh, but to Alice, just being out of doors was a restorative. It was a trait she shared with Rosalind. A brisk walk could always be counted on to shake her thoughts into proper, or at least useful, order. Perhaps today it would shake loose the correct questions to ask Kate Leverton. Something was not right about the girl. Alice could feel it, and that feeling went beyond jealousy and beyond the creeping, unfamiliar doubts that had plagued her for so much of the morning. She was certain Kate Leverton was lying. But for all her skills as a gossip and a writer, she couldn't seem to tease out what the young woman was lying about. Oh, Amelia, help me with this, said Kate behind her. I'm useless. Amelia and Kate stood together on the top stair. Amelia slung her market basket on her arm and reached up to repin Kate's bonnet, which had slipped to an awkward angle. Actually, the bonnet belonged to Alice. Kate's had been ruined by the rain, and Alice had loaned her this one. It was not one of her favourites. Pink did not particularly suit her. Of course, it suited Kate admirably. Don't fuss, muttered Amelia, as she pulled and replaced the long pins. Now! She stood back, admiring her handiwork. Admiring Kate. Alice bit her lower lip hard. When Amelia turned, her gaze met Alice's. I'm sorry, her look said. Truly. I know, replied Alice in her heart. I do. Now Kate turned as well. She smiled. At Alice, at the brightening day, at the passers-by on the pleasant street. Then she froze. Her pale face turned dead white. Alice whirled around. Her gaze swept the street. She saw women walking in pairs. She saw maids and tradesmen, nurses with their prams and charges, a gentleman in a tall hat, a cab waiting for a fare. Kate! screamed Amelia. Alice spun again, just in time to see Kate's eyes roll back in her head. She lurched sideways and fell. Chapter 26 The Beauty A young lady's chief business is to please in society. Edgeworth Maria Belinda Oh, Miss Thorne, cried Beatrice as Rosalind entered the breakfast room. Kinsley said you had arrived. Have you any news about Kate? Like the rest of the house, the breakfast room was bright and airy. It was furnished in the simple modern style with pale blue walls, comfortable furnishings and thick rugs. Everett sat at the table with Beatrice and rose to bow as Rosalind came in. Another woman, whom Rosalind did not know, was there as well. A toast-crumbed plate and half-drunk cup of tea sat in front of her. I have made several new inquiries, said Rosalind, and I hope we may hear something shortly, perhaps as soon as today. There, cried Everett, how's that for news? Oh, I hope, I pray. Beatrice clutched her son's arm. The other woman stared into her teacup. There, there, mother, said Everett. You must calm yourself. Now, Miss Thorne, I was just thinking I should go up to see Aunt Marianna after breakfast. How is she? I'm afraid she is not as well as she appeared at first, Rosalind said. While we were talking, she seemed to collapse, and her nurse urged me to leave. Should we send for the doctor? asked Everett anxiously. Mrs. Hepplewhite has all in hand for the moment, I believe. That woman has been invaluable. Beatrice rallied herself to speak coolly. And the doctor said he would call later today. She paused. But I'm neglectful. Miss Thorne, I don't believe you have met my daughter-in-law, Mrs. Marcus Leverton. Wilhelmina, this is Miss Rosalind Thorne. Rosalind had spent her life in and among the Hauteton. In that society, the cultivation of personal beauty 
was regarded as one of a woman's foremost duties. But Wilhelmina Leverton was surely one of the most striking women Rosalind had ever seen. She was, Rosalind judged, in her late twenties, but her face was still unlined and her complexion a clear rose and white. She possessed rich raven-black hair and brilliant summer-green eyes. Her body was slim, as current fashion demanded, and her cream and yellow day dress was cut exactly to the current mode, with a high waist and fitted sleeves. She held herself in the light, easy manner that Rosalind's deportment masters had tried and failed to teach her. I'm very glad to meet you, Miss Thorne. Wilhelmina's voice was low and clear. Have you eaten? inquired Beatrice. Will you join us? Thank you. Rosalind took a place at the table and allowed Everett to fetch her a cup of coffee from the urn on the sideboard. Accepting a cup of coffee in the same house where she knew a poisoning had occurred proved singularly unnerving. Rosalind told herself not to be ridiculous. She reminded herself that whoever had done this thing had a definite purpose in mind. That purpose could hardly include contaminating an entire coffee urn. Despite these silent admonishments, Rosalind found she could only manage a delicate sip. Now, what of these inquiries about Kate? asked Beatrice. To whom have you applied? What have they said? Miss Thorne believes Kate may have taken shelter with friends, Everett told Wilhelmina. You were in her confidence more than the rest of us, Mina. Perhaps you can think of someone she might have turned to. I would not say we were confidants, Wilhelmina protested, and I'm sure I didn't have a chance to meet anyone you do not already know about. Oh, come, Mina, said Everett. You can tell us. He nodded meaningfully toward the closed door. Your lord and master needn't know. Wilhelmina blushed. Everett, don't tease, said Beatrice. I'm sorry, said Everett immediately. I spoke out of turn. You mustn't mind me, Miss Thorne, he went on. We've all been so worried about Aunt and Kate. The truth is that my brother's simply a very careful husband. He treasures his reputation and that of his wife, so he's sometimes strict about whom she associates with. Another man might have said this with a twist of irony or disapproval, but Everett stated this as simple fact. Marcus has a great deal to worry about, put in Wilhelmina, I'm sure Aunt hasn't made it any easier. As for my relationship with Kate, when Marcus and I were in Bath, she and I attended a few private concerts while Marcus was out on business. But it was no more than that. And I will thank you not to say anything to my husband on the subject of whom I may or may not keep company with, she added. You know I would never do anything to cause trouble between... began Everett. Wilhelmina cut him off. Certainly you would never mean to. Rosalind felt certain there was a quarrel underneath those words, and that it was old and deep. Did you and Mr. Leviton travel to Bath frequently? Rosalind asked Wilhelmina. We generally divide summers between Bath and Brighton, she replied. My husband always says business is done at the dinner table, and so he prefers to be where society is. He's quite correct, said Rosalind. I've observed something similar many times. And are you anticipating a busy season for yourself? It was a neat and polite change of subject. I have received several invitations, Rosalind replied. I expect it will be a tolerably busy time. You are fortunate, said Wilhelmina. I know it is the done thing to complain about how frantic one is during the season, but I would rather feel too busy than neglected and dull. No one could think of neglecting you, said Everett. You hold sway over us all. He seemed to mean this as flattery, but Wilhelmina's smile was tight and obviously forced. Beatrice clearly noticed as well. Everett, please, she said wearily. No one has the patience now. I'm so sorry, said Everett at once. I only meant it doesn't matter, said Beatrice. Oh no, said Wilhelmina. I did not take it as a tease. Just, we're all on edge, you see, Miss Thorne. Between Kate's disappearance and Mariana's illness, we are none of us at our best. I only wish... Before Wilhelmina could finish, the door opened and Kinsley entered with a letter on the silver salver. Mrs. Leverton, this came for you. Kinsley bowed and presented the salver to Beatrice. The messenger said it was a matter of some urgency. Beatrice took the note, and her cheeks flushed bright red. 
This is Kate's writing, she cried. Kinsley, who brought this? Are they still here? Bring them here immediately. Kinsley bowed briefly and retreated. Forgetting everyone around her, Beatrice broke the seal and opened the letter. She read silently, urgently. Rosalind dropped her gaze, making a show of giving her hostess some privacy. From under her lowered lids, she glanced surreptitiously at Wilhelmina and Everett. Everett was pale. His hand on the tablecloth moved towards Wilhelmina just a little, but then he seemed to catch himself and took his hand quickly off the table. If Wilhelmina noticed this furtive gesture, she gave no sign. Her attention remained fixed on Beatrice. Rosalind could not help but notice that her cheeks had gone as pale as Everett's. She wondered about this. She also remembered that it was Everett who organised the disastrous dinner before Kate had run away, and before she had fallen so deathly ill. The door opened again, and once again Kinsley entered. He bowed to Beatrice. I'm so sorry, ma'am. The messenger has gone and left no name, nor any indication where the letter was given to him. Beatrice lowered the letter and took several deep breaths. Thank you, Kinsley. The footman withdrew, and Beatrice turned to her family and to Rosalind. She writes. Her hands trembled, and she had to begin again. Kate writes that she is safe and well, and she apologises for her conduct. Does she say where she is? asked Everett. Beatrice shook her head. No, that she does not tell me. But it is her hand, and it is very clear. Well, that's good. No, it's marvellous. Everett got to his feet. I'll go track down Davenport. He'll want to hear at once. You'll excuse me, mother, Wilhelmina, Miss Thorne. He bowed to Wilhelmina and Rosalind, and pressed a quick kiss on his mother's hand before taking himself out of the room. She encloses a letter for Mariana. Beatrice held up the second letter. I should go to her, Miss Thorne. You will excuse me. Of course. Forgive me, but do you wish me to continue my inquiries? Beatrice was already on her feet. She hesitated. Yes, she said quietly. Please. If, no, when you locate her, do not let her know she's found. I would not have her agitated any further, but I must know where she is and whom she is with. Rosalind nodded, and Beatrice hurried from the room, leaving Rosalind alone with Wilhelmina. The two women regarded each other. I feel I must apologise for these awkward circumstances, said Wilhelmina. There is no need at all, Rosalind rose. I am delighted to know that Kate is safe and well. You must excuse my hurry, but it may be the messenger can be traced. The truth was, Rosalind wanted to leave before Beatrice could return with more awkward questions about her investigations. I should go as well, Wilhelmina said. My husband will want to know what's happened, and it may be some time before ever it remembers to tell him. He means well, but he can be quite careless. She rang the bell, and when Kinsley appeared, she said, Miss Thorne is leaving. Have her coat and bonnet brought. Kinsley bowed and went to retrieve Rosalind's things. The two women faced each other. Wilhelmina smoothed her skirts, clearly hesitating. Was there something you wished to say to me, Mrs Leverton? asked Rosalind. Again there was an awkward pause and the loss of colour in Wilhelmina's smooth pink cheeks. No, she said, or rather, there may be. She lifted her gaze. Perhaps you could call. I will be at home tomorrow. Of course. Rosalind made her curtsy. Thank you, I would be delighted. Wilhelmina nodded and Rosalind took her leave. Kinsley met her by the front door trailed by a parlour-maid who helped her on with coat and bonnet. Rosalind turned to allow the young woman to help her on with her coat and to allow herself a moment to look over the visiting book and cards sitting out on the foyer table, along with new baskets of fruit and flowers. On top of the heap of visiting cards, she saw several belonging to members of Parliament and their wives. The banking trades were not neglected, according to the bold handwriting in the book. The maid settled Rosalind's bonnet on her head and Rosalind's time was up. She tied her ribbons and headed out the front door, refusing the footman's offer to send a boy to fetch a cab. It seemed she could not visit this house without feeling the need to walk for a time to restore some kind of order to her urgent thoughts. 
Rosalind had navigated matters of life and death before. That they had become such a part of her life still astonished her. But this was different from her previous entanglements in so many ways, not the least of which was the sense of urgency. Mrs. Leverton was not dead and not likely to die soon. This fact would soon be noticed by the poisoner, whoever they might be. Perhaps they would decide that they had shot their bolt, leave well enough alone, and allow Mrs. Leverton to live out the rest of her natural days. That, however, could hardly be counted on. Part of Rosalind's mind cried out there was no way to solve this riddle. There was no way to spool back time to find out who might have stolen the key to Mrs. Leverton's tea caddy. It could have been any family member or servant, or even one of Mrs. Leverton's many visitors. Rosalind knew there were ample opportunities to cause mischief in a house like this, if the perpetrator was clever and, more importantly, patient. But Rosalind also knew that secrets were difficult to keep. The larger and more dangerous they were, the harder it became to hold them in check, especially once an outsider became aware of their existence. Whether they realised it or not, the Levitons had already begun to put some of their secrets on display. There was clearly some undercurrent between Wilhelmina and Everett, although she did not yet understand its contours. And why had Everett hurried to tell Harold Davenport the news about Kate, but could not be counted on to tell that same news to his brother? Perhaps he assumed that one of the women would tell Marcus. Still, Rosalind found herself wondering what lay behind this apparent carelessness. What had been Everett's true purpose in arranging for that dinner and deceiving his family into attending? She had been told he was a very poor diplomat. That would seem to confirm this assessment. Or was there something else? She shook her head. A single person could not be poisoned at a family dinner. Not only would there be no time to contaminate the food, there would be nothing that would be eaten by one particular person. And what possible reason could Everett Leviton have to poison Kate? Or Mariana? Rosalind squared her shoulders. She would definitely take Wilhelmina up on her invitation to call tomorrow. Perhaps she would find some answers then. In the meantime, she had a very different appointment to keep. This one with Messrs Temple and Trigg, who had proved willing to take the jewels offered to them by a young woman in pawn. Jewels that might very well properly belong to Mrs Leverton. Chapter 27 a strange confluence of events. It was my pride to lose with as much gaiety as anybody else could win. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda. Gautier was the first to leave Fox's flat. He retreated quickly down the same back stairs he'd used to arrive unseen from the street. Adam took up his post at the window again and waited. After a long moment, Gautier stepped out of the alley that snaked alongside Folks's building. Adam's attention shifted to their man, the footpad. There was no mistaking when he noticed Gautier, who was, after all, not hard to miss, being a burly black man nearly six feet tall in a crowd of much shorter, paler persons. Gautier adjusted his hat and walked deliberately down the street, away from the cookshop where Torton was still loitering. As soon as Adam was certain the footpad's attention had been caught, he bolted out of the flat and down the front stairs. When he reached the street, though, Adam changed his pace. Now he was moving quickly, but with deliberation. He set off in the opposite direction from Gautier, striding along the sidewalks as if he'd never noticed the footpad lounging with the other men. While Gautier turned the corner past the wine shop, Adam headed for the cook shop and Torton, lounging against the wall, gnawing his chicken leg. Come on, he thought, toward the footpad. You're not just going to stand there, are you? He was not. From the corner of his eye, Adam saw the footpad tug on his hat brim. Perhaps he said something to the card players because they all laughed. Then the footpad tucked his hands in his pockets and strolled away, moving easily and without concern in the same direction as Adam. Adam passed Torton and the doorway of the cookshop. As he did, Torton pushed himself away from the wall where he was lounging and stepped right into the other man's path. 
Now then, friend, Torton said, I want a word with you. The footpad pulled up short and tried to duck around Torton, but Adam had already pivoted and now stood between the footpad and the street. The man turned on his heel and found himself face to face, or rather nose to shoulder, with Samson Gautier. You're nicked, Gautier laid his heavy bandaged hand on the footpad's shoulder. So no fuss this time, eh? Who are you? the man demanded. What right? We're Bow Street, said Torton cheerily. And you, my fine fella, are Jack Beecham, thief taker. At least you used to be. You may have found it useful to change your name a time or two. Who the devil? the man demanded. Sam Torton. Torton touched his battered hat brim with the chicken bone. We've had dealings, you and me. Torton's memory for faces was legendary around Bow Street. He could recall any person he'd met, no matter how many years might have passed. Beecham blinked in a surprise Adam felt sure was feigned. By God, so it is, Beecham cried, as if suddenly meeting an old friend. I didn't recognise you. These two some are yours. He jerked his chin toward Adam and Gautier. You need to teach them better manners, Torton. They just about scared the life out of me the other night. Now then, Jackie, you keep a civil tongue, Torton warned him. Maybe we should get off the street for our talk. Torton looked to Adam, who nodded in agreement. They were already getting plenty of curious glances, and some of the passers-by had slowed down to have a look. Then there was the possibility that Beecham might still try to cut and run. Adam didn't want to have to dodge traffic and crowds trying to catch him, especially if some in the crowd took it into their heads to help a fleeing man on general principles. A few minutes later, the four of them were all safely stowed in the little yard behind the wine shop, surrounded by stacks of empty barrels and heaps of ash and refuse. The proprietor was a Frenchman, and professed himself only too glad to be of any assistance, however small, to the officers of Bow Street. Gautier planted himself beside the yard's iron gate. Adam took up his station between the shop's back door and the area stairs that led down to the cellar. Now then, Jackie. Torton heaved a barrel off the nearest pile and sat down on it. The wooden slats creaked dangerously. Would you like to explain why you were hanging about the cocoa tree? and following honest officers out on their night's work. You really think I was following? Beecham's face was a study of shocked innocence. He spread his hands. I had no idea who you were when I left the cocoa tree. As for why I was there, I was on business, and I thought you were following me. So, of course, that wasn't you following me from the park this morning? Adam asked him. The park? Beecham blinked again, the picture of confusion. What would I be doing in the park, especially on such a morning as we had today? Look, Torton, you want to know what I'm doing? All you have to do is ask, and I'll tell you. All right, tell us. Torton leaned back and folded his arms. The barrel creaked again. Adam found himself hoping this interview wouldn't finish with Torton on the ground. Beecham looked around him, making sure he met each of the officer's eyes in turn. Just what are you looking for? Adam wondered. He also got the distinct feeling the man was sorting through his mental infantry, trying to come up with exactly the right story to distract his little audience. Adam prepared himself to be entertained. At last, Beecham said, I'm on a job myself. A girl's gone missing. The family's scared to death and they want her found. This street here's pretty much bachelor's row now, isn't it? And I've had word the girl was seen in the neighbourhood. I was keeping an eye out for her, that's all. Pull the other one, Jackie, drawled Torton. It's got bells on. I swear it's the truth, cried Beecham. That's why I was at the Cocoa Tree last night. I was asking after the girl. I was on my way home, minding my own business, when these two... He waved at Adam and Gautier. Jump out at me. Well, what am I supposed to think but they're after my purse? What's this girl's name? asked Adam. Kate Leviton. Adam felt himself go very still. 
Gautier, who knew him well, noticed and covered the sudden silence. And why would a girl's family be talking with you? Well, that's my business, isn't it? said Beecham. Finding what's lost. Ask Torton here. Oh, aye, he does find all sorts of things, Torton grinned. Sometimes even before they've been lost. Beecham's cheeky grin stiffened. Now you're the one needs to keep a civil tongue. All I'm guilty of is doing a job when your lot can't. Tell us about this missing girl, said Adam. What's her name again? Beecham frowned, and for a moment Adam thought he was going to refuse to talk. Like I just told you, her name's Leviton. Catherine Leviton. The family calls her Kate. She acts or acted as companion to her widowed aunt. By all accounts, the old girl's ready to peg out any day now. But before she shovels off this mortal coil, the aunt wants to see the girl restored to the bosom of the family. And she's willing to put up a good reward to see this happy event occur. And how is it they came to call on you in particular for this job? asked Adam. Beecham seemed to realise something was off with Adam's questions. Well, it wasn't exactly that way, he said cautiously. Happens I'm friendly with one of the maids in the house, and she, knowing my business, sent me word. It was a plausible story. Men such as Beecham frequently made themselves agreeable to servants in wealthy households so they could pick up gossip and anything else that might not be nailed down. It would also explain why none of the Leverton family had told Rosalind they'd hired a thief-taker to try to find Kate. A very plausible story, Adam thought again. The only problem was, he felt sure it must be a lie, from beginning to end. Which left the question, how did Beecham come to know so much about Kate Leverton and her disappearance? So, you never met this old lady, Adam pressed. Who is she again? One Mrs. Mariana Leviton, Beecham said, and I have yet to lay eyes on her. Got the old story for my little maid. And what's the maid's name? asked Torton. Oh, no, said Beecham. I'm not having you lot making trouble for her. She'd be out on her ear for having a follower when all she's doing is trying to help the family. And to help you as well, put in Gautier. How much is the reward anyway? Ah, oh, I see your game, said Beecham waggishly. You're thinking to poach my job, you are. Answer him, Jackie, said Torton. Again, Beecham's knowing eyes swept across each of them, weighing, judging. Fifty pound, he said, which is more than enough for a poor man such as myself. He laid his hand on his breast and dropped his gaze, suddenly assuming an air of modest piety. Gautier looked at Adam. I don't believe him. Do you? No, said Adam, flatly. Well, that's that then, said Torton. You're under arrest, Jackie. What? cried Beecham. What for? Attacking an officer, said Adam. Gautier held up his bandaged hand in case Beecham had forgotten. I thought you were hooligans after me purse, Beecham said. How was I to know you were Bow Street? Torton got ponderously to his feet. We'll just let the magistrate sort that out. Gautier stepped forward just to remind Beecham that running would do him no good. Probably you should know Mr Burney takes a dim view of the sort who goes around damaging his officers. Adam expected Beecham to protest, but he didn't. He just raised his hands, gesturing that they should all calm down. All right, all right, he said, looking directly at Adam. No need to be rude. I'm coming quietly, aren't I? He held up his hands, and his gaze did not shift at all. But you might just find out that I'm not the only one in trouble here. Chapter 28 A Private Business Matter that as to anything in the private conduct of that person, Belinda should observe on these dangerous topics a profound silence. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda. Fortunately, the cab driver was acquainted with the street where Temple and Trigg was located. 
If he gave Rosalind a measuring glance when she asked to be taken there, he did not inquire as to her business or refuse to drive her. Under other circumstances, Rosalind would have waited until one of her male acquaintances could accompany her, perhaps Sanderson Fawkes or George Littlefield or Adam. But the matter remained urgent. Therefore, she decided to take the risk and go alone. Fortunately, the neighbourhood had every appearance of at least a middling respectability. The shop itself was freshly painted and looked out onto the busy high street through clean windows. A few select pieces of jewellery and one gold pocket watch were displayed on wooden trays to hopefully catch the eyes of pedestrians. The three golden balls on its shingle overhead were understated and dominated by the gilded lettering that announced the establishment's name. Rosalind decided to take the shop at face value, paid off her cab and went inside. A booming voice greeted her. Good afternoon, ma'am. The man behind the counter was portly and balding. Perspiration gleamed on his mottled brow, despite the fact that the shop was not at all warm. He wore a black coat, a modestly patterned waistcoat and a simple cravat. A pair of gold pince-nez spectacles hung on a chain around his neck. Good afternoon, replied Rosalind. I wish to speak to Mr Trigg. You are doing so, the man bowed. I am Adolphus Trigg, unless you mean my brother, Jeremiah Trigg. He has stepped away for the moment. You are the Mr Trigg I need. I have some receipts with your name on them. Rosalind pulled the tickets from her reticule and laid them on the counter. Mr Trigg perused the tickets briefly. Did you wish to redeem these items? Not immediately. I was hoping to inquire about the person who brought them to pawn. Clearly affronted, Mr Trigg drew himself up. Forgive me, ma'am, but what possible business could that be of yours? The young woman who was holding these tickets has vanished from her home, said Rosalind. It is also not entirely clear that the jewels were ever hers to pawn. Pawnbrokers, of course, frequently dealt in suspect goods. But shops such as this tended to be at least somewhat careful about courting notice from Bow Street or other authorities. Under Rosalind's steady gaze, Mr Trigg's heightened dignity bled away, and he shrank back down to his previous stance. He also fumbled with his chain and perched his pince-nez on his high-bridged nose. He picked up the first receipt and squinted at it for a long moment. He removed the pince-nez and regarded Rosalind warily. I believe I remember the young woman, he said. Rather well, in fact. Can you tell me about her? What is your interest in the subject? The family wishes her traced. They are very concerned for her welfare. He tucked the pince-nez into his waistcoat pocket and regarded Rosalind for an additional moment without speaking. Rosalind was aware she was being assessed. The man was judging her clothes, her deportment, her speech. At last he heaved a deep sigh. She said the jewels belonged to her aunt, who was a widow, and had suffered a financial reversal, that she was in fact bamboozled by an unscrupulous stock jobber and had lost her entire portion. Her brother had refused to loan her aunt the necessary sum on any account. He paused. You should know, ma'am, that in my profession we hear many such stories. Many of them are less than strictly accurate, shall we say. Even when told by ladies of quality, it is supposed that our heartstrings may be played upon. But I recall that hers had the ring of truth. It would, thought Rosalind, considering that many of the details had been drawn from Kate's real life. Are the jewels still in your keeping? she asked. They are. May I see them? Again, Mr Trigg levelled his keen measuring glance on her. Very well, he said at last. If you will give me a moment, please. Mr Trigg vanished into the back of the shop. Rosalind waited and resisted the urge to pace. Was this possible? Was Mrs Leverton in financial trouble? Rosalind hesitated. She remembered Mrs. Leverton's flinty bargaining this morning, even after she had just learned how close she'd come to dying. She was an intelligent, experienced woman with a core of iron. It was difficult to believe that she had fallen prey to any stock scheme. 
But it was also true that those who were most confident in their own cleverness could sometimes be the easiest to fool. It certainly would explain why Kate had pawned the jewels rather than selling them outright. Mrs Leverton might believe that she could restore her own fortunes enough to redeem the pledged items. No, Rosalind shook her head at these thoughts. It did not make sense. Pawning jewellery was a last resort, not a first. Mrs Leverton was not an impecunious widow who had played too deeply at cards. She was a woman of business and property. If she needed money, she could sell one of her businesses or draw a loan against the shares. She might even sell her house. And supposing this story was true, why would Kate have pawned the jewels and then immediately run away? Was she callous enough to steal the money her aunt needed to help stave off ruin? Or did she run so that her aunt would not be forced to admit she could not make the dowry settlement she had promised? Or had she perhaps found out the trusted Mr Davenport who managed the mines was in some way responsible for her aunt's difficulties? Rosalind smoothed her hand over the counter. She felt as if time was draining away from her, carried by a flood of unanswered questions. Rosalind reminded herself to be patient, to trust herself as she always had but she could not soothe that last little frightened voice in the back of her mind. This time is different, it told her. This time, Alice is at risk. Amelia, who is in your charge, is at risk. This time, you are responsible not for solving a puzzle, but saving a life. Fortunately, Mr Trigg's return shook her out of her spiralling worry. He carried a wooden tray and set it down on the counter. Rosalind felt her eyes widen in surprise. The receipts had described a topaz and diamond necklace and a matching bracelet. Rosalind had not imagined the stones to be so big. The smallest topaz was the size of her thumbnail, the largest was a full two inches square. She could not count the number of diamonds that framed the amber stones. The gems were set in filigrees and festoons of yellow gold. Together, the bracelet and necklace looked positively garish, but they were also probably worth at least five times what Rosalind could expect to earn in a year. Quite something, aren't they? said Mr Trigg. Indeed they are, agreed Rosalind. Are they antiques? One would think. This level of baroque magnificence puts one in mind of the Tudors, or the ancien régime. A smile flickered across his face. But no, they are quite new. The maker's mark is that of a well-known Parisian firm. Mr Trigg, can you describe the young woman who brought you these? Mr Trigg considered. Slim, young, neatly but not expensively dressed, well-spoken if a little shy, a pale complexion but not overly fine, large, Dark eyes and dark hair. Rosalind nodded. That described Kate perfectly. So it was not some confederate or some stranger assuming Kate's name who came to this shop. At the same time, she thought of Mrs Leverton's airy sitting room and its understated elegance and perfect taste. Rosalind found she could not imagine Mrs Leverton wearing something so garish. As for the rest of the Leviton women, they simply could not have afforded such jewels. But if Kate had not gotten these jewels from her aunt, where on earth did they come from? Chapter 29 A Quiet Drink with Friends A report has just reached me concerning you, which gives me the most heartfelt concern. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda the livery in the next street supplied a carriage to take the officers and their prisoner to Bow Street. Beecham remained positively convivial for the entire journey. He even kept up a lively conversation with Torton about pickpockets and petty criminals they'd both known. He was still smiling when Adam and Gautier took him through to the clerks to have his name and the reason for his arrest written into the ledgers. They then ushered him down to the cramped cluster of cells under the station. Adam handed Beecham over to Wilder, the turnkey. B. 
Beecham bowed, sweeping off his hat. Until we meet again, Mr. Harkness. Disquieted, Adam turned away and started back up the stairs. Stand you to a pint, suggested Gautier as he closed the door behind them. Adam shook his head. You go. Harkness, said Gautier quietly. You're thirsty. Let's go over to the Brown Bear and have a drink, all right? Adam looked at him. Do you know it's been a long day? I think a drop of something would do me good. The Brown Bear public house stood directly across from the Bow Street station. In addition to serving drinks to the men who worked there, it served as something of an annex to the station. Suspects might be held in the cellar or the rooms upstairs, or even invited across for a quiet drink so that they could be identified by a witness who just happened to be having a drink of their own by the fire. The fire was banked this afternoon. Despite this, Adam headed to the bench beside the chimney. It allowed him a good view of the rest of the room. Half the customers in the big room were Bow Street men, so it was not that he feared anyone sneaking up behind him. Still, sometimes it was good to be able to see who might be listening. The look in Gautier's eyes when he'd suggested they get a drink told Adam this was most likely one of those times. Indeed, Adam and Gautier had just settled themselves at the long table when the door opened again and Sam Torton sauntered in. Thought I'd find you two here. He plunked himself down onto the bench. Oi, Lizzie, he shouted to the barmaid. You thirsty men here? Lizzie was a stout, strong woman with a right arm that could lay a man flat with a single blow. Her first response to Torton's shout was a crude gesture, but shortly after that she came round with a tray of pint pots and a pitcher of the pub's bitter ale. Torton took a healthy swallow of beer and wiped his mouth. Ask him yet? he said to Gautier. Just about to. What's this? asked Adam. Torton and me wanted to hear why we really arrested Jack Beecham, Gautier said. Not to say we didn't have good cause, what with him stabbing an officer, but somehow I don't think that was uppermost in your mind. It's not that it doesn't matter, Adam began. Give over, man, Torton cut him off. Summit's wrong. What is it? Adam drank his beer and tried to decide where to start. Miss Thorne is involved in a new business, he said softly. A wealthy widow is being slowly poisoned. Gautier made a sound of deep disgust. It just so happens, Adam went on, that the old lady's name is Leverton, and her niece and companion is named Kate Leverton, and this Kate Leverton is currently staying with Rosalind Thorne and Alice Littlefield. Well, drawled Gautier, that is an interesting coincidence. Torton nodded in agreement. I should say. Now, Jackie Beecham may be a scoundrel and a thief, and I'm sure he's not above taking his pound of flesh. Gautier held up his wounded hand. Torton gestured toward it with his pint pot. A slow poison. That's nasty. Can't see Jackie having the stomach for it, or the patience for that matter. But do you know what else is interesting? said Adam. How calm that Beecham was when he found out he was getting arrested. Yes, I noticed that too said Torton. You think Tanzen is keeping an eye on you again? asked Gautier. Maybe using Beecham to do it. Adam's relationship with Mr Townsend was prickly, to say the least. One irritant, unfortunately, was Townsend's mixed view of Rosalind Thorne. Townsend might not know the exact extent of their relationship, but he did know it went beyond the professional or coincidental. Townsend was a blatant social climber, and Rosalind's connections extended to the very upper reaches of society. That meant Townsend's first instinct was to court and flatter her. But Rosalind had also openly inserted herself into several cases that wound up in Bow Street, and that was not something he was ready to tolerate from any civilian, especially a woman. This, combined with the fact that Adam more than once had exceeded his orders, or simply gone around them, caused Townsend to keep a closer eye on him than he did on the other principal officers. Once he'd even tried to bribe Gautier to spy for him. I wouldn't be surprised if it turned out Townsend set someone on my heels, said Adam. 
but it wouldn't explain why Beecham would know about Kate Leverton. He gave out with far too many details for it to be a coincidence that he dropped that name. He turned to Torton. What do you know about the man? Torton took another swallow of beer and rolled it around his mouth while he thought. He's best described as a slippery character. He's a thief-taker, that you know. And if I hadn't made it clear before, he's the sort that works with the thieves. Adam and Gautier both nodded. It was an old game. Thief-taker and thief would enter into a private agreement. The thief would rob a house or a person. The victim would offer a reward for the return of the property. Shortly afterwards, a thief-taker would appear on their doorstep, offering their services and promising that the property would be returned. If the victim agreed to their fee, the thief-taker would go to their partner and collect the stolen items, or most of them. These would be returned to the victim and the thief-taker would claim both fee and reward. All the money would then be split with the thieves. Unless, of course, the thief-taker decided to turn the thieves in and keep the money for himself. The worst part of it was how difficult it could be to catch such men. Most victims simply wanted their property returned. They were willing to pay what amounted to a ransom and go about their business. Even if a crooked thief-taker was reported, there was little Bow Street could do unless the man was positively known to have been involved in the burglary. What surprises me is that Beecham's back in town, Torton was saying. I thought he'd moved on. Did he get himself into trouble? asked Gautier. More times than I can count, said Torton. Man's a gambler. Gets in over his head. Has to leave London every so often until the bully boys in the various dens have forgotten about him. Last I heard, he'd gone off to Bath to see about the pickings there. Bath, echoed Adam. There it is again, said Gautier. Arkness, you look like your beer's gone off. The widow, Mrs Leverton, she was resident in Bath for quite some time, Adam told them. She only returned a few months ago. Now there is another interesting coincidence, remarked Gautier. To be sure agreed Torton. Adam looked into the bottom of his pint pot, trying to sort through his thoughts. Does Beecham have anybody he works with regularly? Any fences who take his goods if the owners won't pay up? Torton rubbed his chin. His eyes flickered back and forth as he dug into the depths of his prodigious memory. Seems to me I heard once he was working with a woman, housebreaker. What was her name? Torton paused and then suddenly snapped his fingers. Finch. That was it. Franny Finch. Ran a gang of lady thieves. Specialised in locked houses and second story work. Could Fran Finch be the maid that Beecham was talking about? It's possible, said Torton. Or one of her girls could. But Gautier looked frankly sceptical. I don't like coincidence either, but what are you thinking? That Beecham and this woman Finch poisoned the ageing aunt and kidnapped Kate Leviton? I don't know, Adam admitted. But why did Beecham come up with the name Leviton when he needed a covering story? And how did he know she was companion to her aunt, and that her aunt was ill and possibly dying, and that Kate herself had gone missing? And, said Gautier, if he's really trying to find Miss Kate, why is he following you? Adam gestured, indicating his agreement. He and Gautier had gone to the cocoa tree before Rosalind called on the Levitons. Even supposing that Beecham really did have a confederate in the Levitons' house, and supposing that Beecham already knew about Adam's connection to Rosalind, he still could not have known that Rosalind would become involved with the Leviton family. Which meant, despite his denials, Beecham really was following Adam. And the only possible reason for that was Adam's hunt for the elusive Mr Edwards. Unless, of course, there was some other connection between Beecham and Kate Leverton. Adam froze. He's thought of something, said Gautier to Torton. I should say he has, Torton agreed. He made a gesture with two fingers. Give over, man. What is it? But Adam just stood up. Make sure Wilder and his men keep a special eye on Mr Beecham tonight, will you? You suddenly don't think our cells are safe enough? asked Torton. 
Call it a hunch, said Adam. I don't like even one coincidence on a case. Now we've got two at the very least, and I like that even less. Anything else you don't like? inquired Gautier. As it happens, said Adam, I find I really don't like the fact that our Mr Beecham was not at all worried about being locked up. Adam took up his hat and hurried out the door. He had to get to Rosalind and to Alice. Because there was another possible connection between Kate Leverton and Beecham, and that connection happened to also be resident in Rosalind's house. Amelia McGowan. Chapter 30. The Maid's Point of View. The curiosity of the servants may have been excited by last night's disturbance. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda. There you are! Amelia was still helping Rosalind off with her coat and bonnet when Alice emerged from her book room. Yes, agreed Rosalind. Alice, of course, heard the odd, flat tone in Rosalind's voice. Amelia, I think Rosalind needs some tea, she said. Can you? Actually, Amelia, there are some things we all need to talk about. Amelia froze, surprised, and Rosalind was sorry to see, afraid. Yes, miss she said reflexively. Alice was watching her, trying to guess what was coming. Rosalind moved past them both and went into the parlour. They followed her there. Alice was the one who closed the door. Amelia took her place by the fire, hands folded, ready and waiting for whatever might be coming next. It was only her eyes that betrayed her. Her gaze darted between Rosalind and Alice, trying to read their faces, trying to get ready for what would happen next. Did you find out something? Alice asked. Not as much as I hoped, admitted Rosalind. Truthfully, I wasn't able to do much more than form an impression of the Levitons. They're a troubled family. I could have told you that much, said Amelia quietly. At least that's how it was when I was in service with them. Rosalind sat down on the sofa and rubbed her hands together. It was a lovely, warm spring day outside, and yet she could not shake the chill inside her. Amelia, I recognise this matter puts you in a very difficult position. It is not right to ask you to talk about your former employers. No, that's all right, miss, said Amelia. If it'll help Kate and you... Rosalind did not miss the way her eyes flickered toward Alice. But I'm not sure what I could tell you, outside the common way. It was three years ago. You can tell me what you saw when you were there, what your impressions of the family were then. Come and sit down, suggested Alice. She gestured to the round-backed chair beside the sofa. Amelia moved forward, but reluctantly. Rosalind could see Alice's disappointment at Amelia's caution. But Alice said nothing, just sat on the sofa beside Rosalind and waited for whatever Amelia chose to tell them. You can tell pretty quick whether you're in a good house or not, said Amelia softly. It was clear from the start the Levitons was an uneasy place. Lots of sniping and backbiting, and everybody out for themselves. She twisted her hands together. As above, so below, she whispered. Rosalind nodded. They may put the blame on Kate for being the bad girl, but the rest of them made plenty of trouble of their own. Mrs. Leviton, Mrs. Beatrice Leviton, that is, she was tired all the time, too tired to keep proper watch over the staff, Left it all to the housekeeper, Mrs. Hatch. And the Hatch, oh, she was a clever one. Her and Cook had a whole set of little ways to make money off everybody's leavings. Never saw so many men coming to the back door. Everything was for sale. Candles, flour, oil. They made up the accounts and gave the Mrs. false bills. And no one caught them at it, said Alice. No one looked. Mr. Leverton, he left it all to his wife, even though it was plain that she couldn't manage. And his idea of what to do about that was scold her. We all heard him. Amelia pulled a face. Mr. Marcus was just the same. His dad scolded him, and he turned around and scolded everybody else, including his mum. Mr. Everett, he was always trying to smooth things over. Tried to make a joke out of everything. Sometimes it worked. What about Kate? Amelia bit her lip. See, things was different for Kate. 
Her mother didn't have the energy for much of anything else, but she doted on Kate. Because Kate was her only daughter? asked Rosalind. Because Kate was the one who lived, said Amelia. At least that's what I'd heard. After she had Everett, Mrs Beatrice lost four girls, all in a row. So when Kate came along, she spoiled her, her whole life. And didn't that just make the mister go spare? She bit down hard on those last words. Did they start blaming Kate for the household problems? They blamed her for being Kate, said Amelia. Mr. Marcus and their father, she couldn't do nothing right, could she? Her anger rose and her speech became less careful. Too loud, too careless, too sullen, too brazen, whatever upset them at the moment. How awful, murmured Alice. Did the late Mr. Leverton complain of Mrs. Mariana as well? asked Rosalind. Only every other day, said Amelia. When he got tired of complaining that Mrs. Beatrice was slothful and wasteful, he'd turn around and start complaining Mrs. Mariana was a conniving shrew who led his uncle around by his... She stopped, her cheeks colouring. We'll take that as red, said Alice. Go on. I was told that when his brother, Mrs. Mariana's husband, died, there was a rare to-do about the will. She'd been left everything, and the mister, he was going to take her to the court over it. Did he? asked Rosalind. What they said was that Mrs. Mariana just turned up one day, all in black, breezed straight into the parlour and called the lot of them to order. She announced she would be giving the mister an allowance, and if Mr. Marcus or Mr. Everett wanted to go to school or into business, she would set them up. But if the mister said one more thing about courts and his right as her husband's brother, she would drag him and the rest of the family straight through the mud. She paused. To hear the hatch tell it, Mrs. Mariana said she was used to scandal and it didn't bother her in the least, but the mister might not fare so well. And the mister backed down, asked Alice. Amelia nodded. Didn't stop scolding, didn't stop blaming, but he stopped all the talk about court. But he took the allowance, inquired Rosalind. Amelia nodded. Least that's what the hatch said. Said the Mr. and Mr. Marcus had a dreadful shouting match over it too. Mr. Marcus said he couldn't understand why his father would take money from such a woman. But Mr. Marcus takes her money as well, does he not? Put in Alice. That I wouldn't know, Amelia said. Rosalind considered all that Amelia had just told them. It seemed to fit with her observations of the Levitons. Her heart went out to Amelia and to Kate. Life in such a house must have been enormously difficult for both of them. Amelia would have had to constantly navigate a household filled with petty corruption and gossip. And Kate? She would have to live with the constant contradiction of a mother who cherished her, but a father and brother who always reminded her that her mother did not measure up, and neither did she. That could breed a tight bond between mother and child, or the child could also come to disregard and even loathe her mother because that's what everyone around her did. There's something you should know, Rosalind, said Alice. Something happened today. Rosalind waited. Amelia shifted her weight from foot to foot. Should I leave? No, I think you'd better stay. You may be able to help shed some light on the matter, said Alice. Did she notice the disappointment in Amelia's eyes? If she did, she ignored it. Amelia, Kate and I were going out for a walk this morning, Alice told Rosalind, but we only made it to the front steps. As soon as we got out of doors, Kate fainted right there on the steps. She claimed later that she'd overestimated her strength, but I'm sure she saw something that frightened her. Something or somebody. Could you tell who? Or what? Alice shook her head. Neither could Amelia. Rosalind looked to Amelia, who also shook her head. But Rosalind saw the fresh wariness in her eyes. Do you have any guess as to who it might have been? No, miss, said Amelia. It could be what she said. She just took a turn. She's been so ill. It was clear to Rosalind that Amelia wanted this to be true. But it was equally clear that she didn't believe it. If Rosalind had not been able to read as much in the young woman's face for herself... One glance at Alice would have told her all she needed to know. 
Oh, Amelia. She did not have a chance to say anything more. The urgent rap of the door knocker cut through the room. Should I get that? asked Amelia, who was heading for the parlour door even as she spoke. Alice had twisted around to peer out the window. I'd say she'd better. It's Mr Harkness. Chapter 31 You will do me justice when you are cool. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda Amelia nipped out to answer the door, and Rosalind tried not to see the relief that crossed her face as she did. She turned to Alice. I'd better go make sure of Kate, Alice said. Come find me afterwards. And yes, Amelia was lying. Alice's tone was light and brittle. I saw it for myself. Rosalind wanted to say something reassuring, but she had no idea what it might be. Alice left her there. She must have passed Adam in the hallway because he entered the room only a moment later. He was worried. She saw it at once. Something had happened that robbed him of his balance. Rosalind rose and went to him. They clasped hands, but only briefly. The house was too busy for any greater display of intimacy. What's happened? she asked. I could ask you the same, he said. Amelia and Alice look like they're both ready to flee the country. Rosalind found she could not smile at this. What is it? he asked. Have you learned something? Several things. None of them terribly reassuring. Rosalind sat down. She could not seem to stop rubbing her hands together. Adam sat beside her and reached for her but hesitated. Rosalind felt a pinprick of sorrow. This was the first chance they'd had to speak since his proposal to her, and it felt as if her silence on the subject now hung in the air between them. She closed her hand around his and felt him relax. It did nothing to ease her sorrow. Rosalind forced herself to muster her thoughts. Firstly, I think I know where this reward Sir Richard offered you came from, at least in part. Adam raised his brows. I don't know if it makes any difference or not, but it's possible at least some of the reward money was contributed by Mrs Leverton. Before she fell ill, she was becoming involved with the defence of the Cato Street men. Do you think there's a connection between her donating money to their cause and her poisoning? I had wondered the same thing, said Rosalind. She says she explicitly returned to London to take up her radical causes again. She is receiving calling cards from prominent hostesses and thinkers as well as politicians. I even noted one from a highly conservative man, possibly come to persuade her to cease her activities. In short, she's a known troublemaker and a person of wide influence, said Adam grimly. So it would seem. Rosalind paused. Or this could all be a case of my seeing a pattern where there is none. What do you see closer to home? Money, Rosalind told him, and family pride, and jealousy. Jealousy? She nodded. Marcus Leverton is both proud and insecure. He has a rigid idea of how the world ought to be, his father raised him to believe Mariana was conniving and vindictive, his income is limited, and he has an uncommonly beautiful wife. Any of these ingredients might be found in a recipe for jealousy. I would tend to agree, said Adam, and that's not all. Rosalind told him about her visit to Temple and Trigg. When she finished, Adam stood. Rosalind watched, confused, as he walked to the door and opened it. He peered into the hall and closed the door again. What's the matter? she asked as he came to sit beside her. Rosalind, this is extremely serious. You and Alice may be in danger. Rosalind's heart thumped hard. Tell me? Adam did. He told her about Jack Beecham and how he had attempted to divert Adam and the others with the story of a missing girl who just happened to be named Kate Leverton and how he was known to associate with a ring of housebreakers and thieves, and how he said he had an informant, a maid, in the Leverton house. Rosalind felt the blood drain from her cheeks. Her knees trembled a little, but she swallowed her emotion. Adam, Alice told me something curious. She said she had planned to take Kate out for a walk this morning, but when they were leaving, Kate fell into a faint. Adam waited. 
Alice said she was certain Kate saw someone or something that frightened her. She could not tell what it was or who, but she's very sure. Damn, breathed Adam. If the house is watched, then they saw me come in. And if whoever this is is a confederate of Beecham's, they may know I'm with Bow Street. I know I should not judge by appearances, but I have difficulty believing a young girl such as Kate. She let the sentence trail away, and a small smile formed. Of course, the exact person for such an enterprise would be the last person one would suspect. Such as a girl of good family, with all the necessary manners and bearing, said Adam solemnly. Even if she is not the thief herself, she could be given the jewels to sell or pawn. Rosalind stopped. What is it? Something else Alice told me. Kate has been saying to us that she means to go to Edinburgh to stay with some friends, a Dorothea and Margaret Wallace. She met them while she was in Bath. Their father, Kate said, is a jeweller. Adam's expression hardened. Rosalind, I need to speak with her. I don't know that that is best. Why? If we question her, she may understand that we mean to accuse her of something. Theft? Possibly of attempted murder? She may try to run, or worse. She may get word to her confederates, Adam finished for her. And if one of them is responsible for poisoning Mrs. Leverton, they may decide they cannot wait any longer for her to die, Rosalind concluded. Adam swore bitterly. I know, I cannot like it either, said Rosalind. But as matters stand, Kate believes she is safe. She plans to leave in a day or two at most. These sisters in Edinburgh are expecting her. If we continue to allow her to believe that we know nothing, we buy time to find some better evidence. Will it be worth it? It isn't just the magistrates at Bow Street who will need more proof than we have, said Rosalind. Alice, said Adam. And me, said Rosalind. Amelia is in my employ. I am responsible for her and to her. I cannot have her accused of taking part in a theft without being certain. She saw the stubborn set of his jaw. Adam, the situation is delicate. He looked down at her, and she knew all he wanted to say. The situation was not delicate. It was dangerous. By having Kate and possibly Amelia in the house, she put herself and Alice both at risk. Very well, he said at last. On one condition. Rosalind felt an odd flutter in her throat. What is it? I am staying here tonight. He held up his hands, forestalling her reflexive protest. You can lock your bedroom door against me, put me in the scullery or out on the street. I can sneak out at dawn so I can be seen to return at a civilised hour. Whatever strategy you see fit to employ, I will join in. But I will not leave you unguarded, not this time. His hand closed around hers. It was cold. She had never known his hands to be cold. A thrill of fear ran through her. Rosalind, breathed Adam, you know that I would never ask that you stop living your life, just as you will not ask me to stop living mine. But I have come too close to losing you before this. I will not, I cannot, trust to luck with danger so close. She looked into his eyes. She saw the scars on his temple and the way his ear was creased and missing the lobe from where a shot had nearly killed him. What would you have me do, Adam? She had never asked such a question, never put either of them in a position where he would need to answer it. This moment was a test of their trust in one another, their understanding of one another, and they both felt it. Write to Sanderson Folks, said Adam. When you go out tomorrow, take him as your driver. Have Alice bring George over to stay with her and Kate. It was in Rosalind's mind to make some comment about feeling faint just at the thought of all this masculine protection for their frail female forms. It was in her mind to take insult at the insinuation she could not defend herself. She could. She had. She might well do so again in the future. And yet how many times had she thought to herself that this business was different? 
Reverend Mr. Falks had been useful in past instances, not only because he was a man and could move about the world with a freedom that was denied her, but because, like her, his acquaintance was broad and unusual. And she could not deny that leaving Alice alone with Kate tomorrow was a worry. Kate, after all, was a source of danger to Alice as well as to Rosalind. So, it was beginning to seem, was Amelia. Chapter 32 Conversation After Working Hours Your reasoning is excellent if your facts were not taken for granted. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda Stafford paused in the doorway to Mr Townsend's private office and waited to be noticed. He smiled grimly as he realised it might be some time, because Mr Townsend was busy at his glass. His cravat, apparently, was in need of urgent attention. Stafford's own cravat was a simple black neckcloth, unremarkable and unadorned. Mr Townsend's was a fanciful collection of folds and ruffles that Stafford suspected was meant to imitate the fashionable choices of the new king. Finally, Mr Townsend seemed satisfied with his efforts, and he turned. Well, Mr Stafford, he said cheerfully, you're working late. I could say the same for you, Mr Townsend. Just finishing. Townsend closed up several folders on his desk. We dine with Lord Alcott this evening, and of course cannot be late. Stafford bowed briefly in acknowledgement of this blatant hint to hurry. I have no wish to keep you, of course, but there is something important I must bring to your attention. Townsend hesitated, and Stafford waited for him to ask if the matter could wait. But then he seemed to think the better of it. Well, do come in, Mr Stafford. He settled himself into his desk chair. Stafford closed the office door and came to stand in front of Townsend's broad desk. We have a problem, Mr Townsend, he said. Townsend arched his shaggy brows. I'm sorry to hear it, Mr Stafford. What is it? Adam Harkness. Ah, oh. Townsend shook his head, wagging his ample chin and jowls. What's he done this time? He's working for the Radicals. He's trying to bring them George Edwards before the Cato Street trial. Townsend's response to this intelligence was to blink and then shrug. The trial's likely to be in a day or so. I've just had word we will have to recruit extra constables to help move the men from the tower. He folded his hands across his stomach, confident and content. Whatever Mr Arkness may think he's doing, he's not going to be able to. But Stafford's patience was at an end. Edwards is still in London, he told Townsend. I ordered him to go to the Channel Islands and join his family there, but he has remained behind. Why would he? Townsend appeared genuinely surprised. The man can't actually want to be exposed. He wants more money. Ah, Townsend touched the side of his nose. And you need help persuading the ministers to loosen the purse strings. Stafford's temper flared. The idea that he would need this braggart's intercession on any matter under his purview was positively insulting. Edwards is my business, he snapped. I will take care of him. What I require is that you finally deal with Harkness. Townsend spread his hands on his desk and Stafford had to suppress a wince. The man was about to begin a speech. I don't have time for your pontificating. Townsend, of course, paid no attention to Stafford's pained expression. Arkness is an idealist, he began, and, I admit, he has an idealist's weaknesses, but he's an excellent officer. In all my time with Bow Street, I've seldom seen a mind like his. When I brought his name to his majesty, I said, yes, yes. Stafford cut him off impatiently. And every time he strayed, I've warned you that Harkness's idealism will not be contained or curtailed or bought off. And every time you have assured me you have the matter in hand. You have, for years, Mr Townsend, years, said that you can bring Harkness to a full understanding of the realities of his position and yours. You have sworn you can instil in him an appreciation of the benefits of yielding to those necessities, and I don't know what all else. Stafford waved his hand with exaggerated carelessness. 
Townsend's face was darkening now, but Stafford pressed on. And not once in all those years have I seen a single sign that you've had any effect on the man. It is only a matter of time. I... There is no more time, said Stafford, his voice low and dangerous. We are at a very delicate moment in the history of the kingdom, Mr Townsend. I am fully aware of the times we are in, Mr Stafford. Then you are also fully aware that we cannot permit a rogue officer to disrupt the public order or endanger our effort to deter those who might otherwise think that the Peterloo rioters should be imitated. Arkness won't, but I say Arkness will, Mr Townsend, said Stafford flatly, and I ask what are you going to do about it? Townsend narrowed his eyes. Stafford did not permit his expression or his attention to flicker for even an instant. If Townsend did not quite see Harkness as a protégé, he saw him as a useful tool. Townsend did not like having his decisions second-guessed. He also had the ear of the most important of men, and he could make Stafford's life and his work very difficult if he chose. Yet despite all this, and despite his love of display, Townsend was no fool. He understood that his position was founded on the support he had in Parliament, and in the palace. And there, Stafford could make Townsend's life very difficult. Very well, Mr Stafford, said Townsend at last. You have made yourself quite clear. I will handle the matter. Stafford bowed. Thank you, Mr Townsend. I trust it will all be taken care of within the week. Within the week, Townsend agreed. Mr Stafford bowed and left him. That was one matter taken care of. With luck, the other could be dealt with as quickly. But even before he descended the stairs into the lock-up, Stafford knew that was wishful thinking. Peals of laughter rang out of the cellar, and Stafford recognised Beecham's voice. And she says, well, when it's straight again, you come back and see me. Laughter rang against stone and packed dirt as Stafford reached the cells. The doors were all iron-banded wood with barred grills set in each one. The night turnkey, Wilder, lounged on his stool, laughing until his greasy face turned red. Beecham leaned up against his door so that his profile showed through the grill. Even so, he saw Stafford before his guard did. Well now, Mr Stafford, Beecham greeted him with his usual insolence. I was beginning to wonder if you'd forgotten about me. Wilder scrambled to his feet, his ring of keys rattling. Stafford ignored the guard. Perhaps I should forget you for a while, he said to Beecham. It might teach you to be more careful. Faint art never won fair lady, said Beecham cheerfully. Stafford snorted. The only fair lady of your acquaintance is a thief and a... Have a care now, Mr Stafford, said Beecham. Even I have my limits. Stafford waved this away. He looked down at Wilder, who stood awkwardly to one side, his dull eyes bulging slightly at this exchange. Let me in there. Wilder shrugged and did as he was told. Once Stafford was inside, Wilder closed the door and the lock firmly. Stafford stalked up close to Beecham. Do you understand what kind of trouble you have gotten me into? he demanded. Beecham shrugged. I'm happy to take myself and my business elsewhere. When can you get me out of here? You're arrested for assaulting an officer. It's a breach of the peace. You are going before the magistrate and likely you'll be committed to Newgate. You're going to let that happen? I don't have a choice. Beecham's grin grew strained. I should say you do. You can let me out of here right now. And I've just told you, you're going before the magistrate. You can tell him your tale, and if he lets you out, then you're getting out. You made a mistake, Beecham. You got careless. I'm not in the habit of employing or saving careless men. Beecham attempted to loom over him. Stafford was aware of what the miscreant saw, he saw a thin, old man and was wondering why he shouldn't just overpower him and threaten to break his neck so Wilder would open the door. Or at least that's what he wanted Stafford to believe. But Stafford had already measured the distance between them 
and knew exactly how quickly he could reach his penknife and where to strike if it came to that. Stafford did not maintain his position by being an easy mark. In the end, Beecham just lowered himself onto the torn straw mattress that lay on the floor and folded his arms. Well, I suppose that's just too bad for me then, he said. Stafford watched him for a moment and then turned to call for Wilder to let him out. Too bad for you as well, said Beecham to Stafford's back. What do you mean by that? What's my profession, Mr Stafford? Beecham asked, his tone all lightness and amiability. Stafford turned. The man was still grinning. But now Stafford felt a chill run up his spine. I don't... What's my profession? asked Beecham again. You're a thief-taker, said Stafford reluctantly. That's right, Beecham nodded. I find those who don't want to be found. And do you know how I do that? I presume you look for them, said Stafford blandly. Beecham's grin widened. You might well presume that, but it's a touch more complicated. He leaned forward, rested his elbows on his knees and clasped his hands. I'm a hunter, Mr Stafford and a good hunter makes it his business to know the haunts and habits of his quarries. So, I make it my business to know where the thieves are, their houses, their bolt holes, their names. He met Stafford's gaze. That way, when I need to find one of them, I'm already well supplied with the necessary information to find them quickly. Do you see what I'm getting at? I see that you're wasting my time. When I found myself in your pay, Mr Stafford, I made it my business to learn the names of some of the others on your payrolls. Many of the others. Stafford felt his mouth curl into a sneer. If you think you can do any damage by letting it be known that Bow Street pays informants, you are sorely mistaken. No. Bow Street may not care. The courts and the newspapers may not care, but your informants are not rich men, Mr Stafford and they have associates among the criminal classes. Those associates may have different priorities from the courts. He paused and added softly, They may care very much about who is peaching at Bow Street, and they may make their displeasure directly known to your informants in ways that might make a gentleman's skin crawl. This, in turn, may discourage others from continuing to pass on information to you, and Bow Street, and the government and whoever else you might work for. Stafford wanted to yell at the man, to scream at his effrontery. He wanted to summon Wilder and have Beecham dragged away to Newgate and thrown in the deepest basement cell. Let a month in the dark teach him to mind his manners and keep his mouth shut. But Beecham's threat was real. Stafford did not doubt it. Stafford hammered on the door. He stepped back, breathing deeply composing himself, shaking off the anger and the fear. The door creaked open. Wilder, greasy, flushed with cider, peered around the corner. Mr Beecham is leaving us, he said. You did not see how it happened. Wilder grinned. As you say, Governor. Stafford walked out of the cell. He did not look back. Chapter 33. Unprecedented Acts. These, from a person who wants nothing from you but your love. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda. Rosalind could not sleep. She'd dressed for bed. She'd put out her candle and climbed under the quilts. Now she blinked up at her canopy, listening to the soft sounds of the house, and tried to discern which of them was Adam. They had decided to conceal his presence from Kate. If they were at all correct in their suspicions, she would be instantly on her guard if she knew a Bow Street man was in the house. So Adam had left before dinner. Rosalind had observed the usual evening routines of writing letters, sitting up to read, and playing draughts with Alice. Kate even joined them for a while before she pleaded fatigue and took herself upstairs, Alice followed shortly afterward. Then Rosalind sent Amelia to bed, 
saying she would be sitting up a while yet and would take care of herself when she was finally ready for bed. Rosalind did have real business. She needed to write her sister, Charlotte. She needed to peruse her books, where she copied guest lists and notes of gossip and descriptions of parties from the newspapers. Such notices occasionally contained mentions about a lady's fan or a bracelet or similar article going missing usually along with some bit of innuendo about where the lady had last been seen and what gentleman had been nearby. But Rosalind was looking for a different set of connections now. When she was finished, Rosalind had taken her candle down to the cold and empty kitchen. She'd put the light in the window. A few minutes later, Adam had knocked softly at the door. What is he doing now? Rosalind wondered toward the ceiling. Was he able to get comfortable on the sofa? Was he asleep? Or was he awake like she was? Was he thinking of her the way she was thinking of him? She pictured Adam sitting in the corner of the sofa, his long legs stretched out in front of him and his fair hair silvered by moonlight. In her vision he waited, still and patient, the way he had learnt to on the highway patrol. She pictured his soft smile, his blue eyes, his shadowed profile. Her heart skipped a beat. And another. She closed her eyes. She rolled over on her side. It did no good. Her eyes opened again. Her ears strained. Ridiculous. And yet she had no idea what to do. Except that was not true. She did have an idea. And it terrified her. She curled more tightly in on herself like a child frightened of noises in the dark. But it wasn't the dark or the noises that frightened her. It was her own unsteady heart. A lifetime's training warned her to stay still, to be good, to behave. She had already brought herself to the brink of disaster in giving in to his insistence that he be allowed to stay. What she wanted or he wanted did not matter. The rules mattered. The world outside mattered. The world would find out. They always did. Everything else might be forgiven, because she was poor and an old maid and an interesting eccentric. But promiscuity would not be forgiven. Love outside the bounds would not. Shame burned. Pride rebelled. So did her sense of self. Rosalind gritted her teeth and kicked back the quilts. She did not take a candle. She did not want to risk the possibility that Kate was still awake and would see the light flickering underneath her door. I came to make sure you were all right. That was what she would say when she entered the parlour. It was true as far as it went. I came to make sure you had all that you needed. She would say that too. It was also the truth. Rosalind knocked and pushed open the door, and there was Adam, all silver and shadow and exactly as she had imagined him. Her breath left her, and every thought she had flew out of her mind. I came, she stammered. I came. Adam was on his feet and across the room. He was in her arms and kissing her in the darkness, and she was kissing him back, and there was nothing else in the world, only the warmth and strength of him, the desire of him, and for him, the need for him. Endless, bottomless, ecstatic. Eventually the need to breathe also grew urgent, and she had to pull back just a little. I came to make sure you were all right, she told him. Adam ran his fingers down her cheek to her throat. And how do you find me? Astonishing, she answered. He smiled, and her heart swelled. Come sit down, he said. I'll build up the fire. He'd pulled the sofa closer to the hearth. Rosalind sat and watched him as he uncovered the banked embers and laid on enough coal to produce a small flame. Then he sat and wrapped his arm around her shoulder. There, he said. Now we shall be warmer. Rosalind tucked her feet up like a little girl and leaned against him. I think if I were any warmer I might burst into flame. He chuckled and stroked her shoulder. I didn't answer you, she said, before, when you spoke of marriage. 
I'm sorry, Adam. It's all right. You've waited so long. You make it sound like nothing's happened, he said. And yet here you are, in the darkness, in my arms. He pulled her closer. I trust you, Rosalind. And just now I am vastly content. Rosalind cuddled close to his side and felt the gentle pressure of his arm about her shoulders. She breathed deeply, taking in the scent of the fire and the scent of him. And she let herself do what was so very difficult. For that moment, she let herself trust and be content. Chapter 34 The Morning After I am not base enough to betray her secrets. However, I may have been provoked by her treachery. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda Rosalind was back at school. She was in the room she shared with Alice, hastily trying to stuff a handkerchief full of stolen cake under her mattress. She didn't know why. Just as she didn't know why she was even still at school, or what the strange rumbling sound was, or why her face felt so unaccountably rough, or where the pain in her neck was coming from. All at once she realised she was at school because under the old rumbling she heard the unmistakable sound of girls muffling their laughter. Then she realised her eyes were closed because she had been asleep just a moment before and the pain in her neck came from her head lolling at a strange angle and the weight on her shoulders and roughness of her cheek. Rosalind came fully awake in a single heartbeat and jerked upright. Her sudden motion dislodged Adam's arm from around her shoulders and brought him suddenly and silently awake as well, which cut off the rumbling noise, which it seemed had been him snoring in her ear while her cheek rested against his stubbled jaw. Alice was collapsed against the doorway, both hands pressed over her mouth and doubled over in laughter. I'm sorry, she wheezed. Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't. Oh, dear. She darted out the door and slammed it behind her. Her laughter grew fainter as she presumably retreated back upstairs. Rosalind, her cheeks warm, turned to Adam. Adam pushed himself off the sofa. His chin was unshaven. Had she ever seen him that way before? She must have. Why did it take her breath away now? It was ridiculous, but the strength of the feeling it aroused in her was not to be denied, especially when combined with the sight of his disordered curling hair, his rumpled shirt with its open collar and his stocking feet, his faint, sweet smile, his laughing eyes, the way he bowed so solemnly. Good morning, Miss Thorne. Good morning, Mr Harkness. Rosalind returned her most correct curtsy. I'm afraid we may have shocked Miss Littlefield. I'm afraid it's more likely we shocked Amelia first. She would have come down to light the fires. Ah, yes, of course. Should I go? No, I'll go see to matters and... She looked down at her wrapper and nightdress. I should dress. I'm sure breakfast will be ready shortly. She looked up again. Adam reached out and straightened her nightcap. Rosalind's feeble attempts at dignity collapsed. A giggle, every bit as absurd as Alice's, escaped her. She slapped her hand over her mouth. But Adam was only smiling. He took the hand she had over her mouth and planted a kiss against her palm. Rosalind thought she might melt down like an ice left in the sun. Go, he said. Rosalind went. In fact, she fled. Alice was, of course, right beside her bedroom door, and she was still laughing. Oh, Rosalind, I truly, truly am sorry. I can't help... Rosalind opened the door to her room. Inside, she said, in her best headmistress voice. Alice bobbed an exaggerated curtsy and ducked inside. Rosalind closed the door after them both. Now that she was in her own room, Rosalind found her knees were shaking. She sank onto the chair in front of her dressing table... Alice grew suddenly serious. I really am sorry, Rosalind. I shouldn't have laughed. I know you don't find this situation funny at all. No. Rosalind caught sight of herself in the glass. She might not possess a stubbled chin, but she was every bit as rumpled and flushed as Adam had been. 
she looked entirely unlike herself. No, she looked exactly like herself. Only it was a self that was never seen except in her mirror first thing in the morning. Now Adam had seen her disarray. He had seen her cap and her wrapper, her nightdress and slippers. They had done nothing, at least not anything irrevocable. And yet he had seen her entirely stripped of art, artifice and manners, and she had seen him the same way. That intimacy opened a new door. Are you all right? asked Alice. Yes, said Rosalind, only slightly surprised at how easily the answer came. A little flustered, I suppose, but yes, I am all right. Alice hesitated. Is there anything we should be aware of that might affect your monthlies, perhaps? Rosalind knew exactly what Alice meant and shook her head. No, there was nothing of that kind. Oh, Alice evidently could not tell whether to be relieved or disappointed. Well, I'll let you get dressed, and I probably should do the same, and I'll go talk with Mrs. Singh, shall I? I think I'd rather do that myself. Will you check on Kate? Of course, said Alice. She left then, and Rosalind set about her morning ablutions. The water in the washstand jug was tepid, but she scrubbed her face anyway. Amelia had pressed and hung up her pale green day dress, which also happened to be one she could put on by herself. She unbraided her hair and pinned it up again in a simple twist at the base of her neck. She added a string of jade-green beads. She looked at herself in the mirror for a long, long time. When she was certain she could meet her own gaze with equanimity and good humour, she got up and left the room. One of Alice's favourite aspects of her new life as lady novelist was that most days she did not have to care one jot about what she wore. This morning, however, she dressed as carefully as if she was going out to make morning calls. She put on her best blue muslin day dress and pinned her hair into a neat twist at the nape of her neck. She eschewed her cap and scrubbed her hands to rid them of extra ink. Cloaked in the armour of respectability, she left her room. Amelia was nowhere to be seen. She paused for a moment outside Kate's door and, quite openly and blatantly, listened to see if there was any sound yet from inside. She heard nothing. Satisfied that she had honoured the spirit of her promise to Rosalind, she descended the stairs. There was something important to be done and she had only a limited time to see to it. Alice knocked at the parlour door. Come in, said Mr Harkness from the other side. Alice entered. Adam was standing at the window, but in such a way as he'd be shielded by the partially open drapes. He watched the street outside, giving over his whole attention to that activity, and did not turn at all as she entered the room. Mr Harkness, Alice said. Now Adam did turn. He was, of course, still unshaven, but had managed to make himself rather less dishevelled than previously. He opened his mouth, probably to say good morning, but she was faster. I'm going to ask you a favour, Alice said bluntly. I've never asked anything of you, not as a Bow Street officer at any rate, and I never would, but this once. What is it? Mr Harkness asked. You know if there's anything I can do, I will. Whatever inquiries you're making with the Levitons, with Kate, leave Amelia out of them, for now. Adam went still. He did not sigh. He did not spread his hands or make any other show. He only said softly, I don't know if I can do that. I know, I know, but the situation is, well, it's complicated. I want some time to ask a few questions of my own. Alice, I don't know how much Rosalind's had a chance to tell you, but right now there's a thief-taker sitting in the lock-up at Bow Street. He knows your Miss Leverton has run away from home, and he's been following me. That means in all likelihood he's aware of Rosalind and that I have a relationship with her. He's known to be associated with thieves and housebreakers. Amelia McGowan used to work for the Levitons and now she is here and Miss Leverton is here while back with the Levitons a woman is dying slowly of arsenic poisoning. I know, I know, said Alice. None of this looks any good at all. She stopped when she saw the expression on his face. 
Yes, all right, none of it is any good at all, but you know what will happen if word gets out that Amelia might be involved in any of this. She's a servant. Whether she's guilty of, well, anything or not, she'll be blamed. Not by Rosalind, of course, but by others. And if, whatever this business is, finds its way into the papers, it will be very bad for her. Adam said nothing. He just looked at her. Alice's cheeks coloured and she lifted her chin. Yes, I care for her, and you know I do, and I'm not going to pretend I don't. And yes, it is because I care for her that I'm asking you to leave her be just for now. I don't know what's happening. Frustration filled Adam's voice. I've got a mare's nest in my hands and I haven't been able to unsnarl it yet. But it's very possible that by having both these women in your house, you and Rosalind are in danger. Are you asking me not to do everything I can to help? If we're in danger, it's not from Amelia, said Alice. I trust her with my life. You are, Adam reminded her. Yours and Rosalind's. It's not like that. How can you be sure? A woman, possibly two women, have been poisoned. Amelia hasn't been employed by the family for years. And yet somehow Kate Leverton found her and insinuated herself into this house. Adam stabbed a finger at the floor, and she stayed here, neatly and comfortably hidden, when, forgive me, Alice, the story she has been telling you about running away from an engagement could easily be a lie. Except it isn't. We know that. Rosalind has it from her fiancé. Her fiancé knows she left home. He may only assume it was because of the engagement. Alice bit her lip. She felt her anger burning through her, and she knew her face was flushed red. With every bit of strength she possessed, she forced the feeling down. I'm asking for time, said Alice, evenly. That's all. Please, Adam, you know I love Rosalind and would never do anything to hurt her. Not knowingly. Please, said Alice again. Her heart thudded, this time from fear. He might refuse. He might tell Rosalind. He might insist on speaking with Amelia, with Kate. He might... All right, said Adam, but the words were slow and reluctant. Alice felt sure he was already regretting them. But only because Rosalind promised you would keep George with you today. I sent him a note last night, said Alice immediately. He will be here in time for breakfast. And if any of us discover any tie between Amelia and this thief-taker Beecham, or to Mrs Leverton's poisoning... Tears swam in front of Alice's eyes, but when she spoke her voice was steady as stone. If that happens, I swear upon my life that I will hand Amelia over to you myself. Adam took a step toward her. Alice was certain he meant to say something sympathetic, but they were interrupted by the arrival of Mrs Singh. Rosalind must have spoken to her because she betrayed no surprise at the sight of Adam or at the state he was in. I beg your pardon, she said, but a boy is at the kitchen door. He had this for Mr Harkness. She held out a piece of folded paper to Adam. Adam thanked her and took the note. He unfolded it and read. When he looked up again, his face creased with a species of anger Alice had never seen in him before. What's happened? she asked. He did not answer her, not directly at any rate. Tell Rosalind I had to leave, but I will be back as soon as I can. He was already moving toward the door and thrust the paper into her hands as he passed her. Alice stared at the note. It had been written in a strong, slanting hand and read, Get back to station. Beecham's gone. S.G. Chapter 35 The Means of Escape it is not every man who has clearness of head sufficient to know his duty to his neighbour. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda What the devil happened? demanded Adam as he came into the wardroom, where Gautier and Torton sat, stolid and glum. Adam met Gautier's eyes briefly, but the captain did not make one gesture or any change of expression to hint that he knew where his note had reached Adam so early this morning. Wilder says he stepped away to take a piss, says Gautier. Says he told Cantwell to keep an eye on things. 
Cantwell fell asleep, he says, and when Wilder came back, the door was open and Beecham was gone. Adam uttered several oaths. I should have known. I shouldn't have left it. I should have... I should have left Rosalind to handle things herself and kept my own eyes on Beecham. Except he couldn't have done that. It was beyond him. Wilder's still down there. Adam jerked his chin toward the door that led to the stairs and the cells. I asked him to hang about for a bit, said Torton. Thought you'd want a word. Too right I want a word, muttered Adam. But he'd have to wait to get it. The door to Townsend's office opened, and Townsend himself stuck his head out. Ah, oh, Mr Harkness, will you step in? Adam faced Gautier and Torton. A favour, he breathed. Take Wilder to the brown bear. Buy him a breakfast. I'll be over as soon as I'm done here. With that, he squared his shoulders and marched into Townsend's office. Townsend was seated back behind his desk, his hands folded across his paunch, at ease with himself and the world. Adam made himself take a deep, slow breath. It would not do to let Townsend see him angry or worried. He had to set aside the morning and the night before and anything else that might serve to distract him. So Adam waited, his shoulders back, his jaw set. For his part, Townsend contemplated him for a long moment. Then he did the last thing Adam expected. He laughed. You may relax, Mr Harkness. I've just asked you in to issue an invitation. An invitation? echoed Adam, genuinely surprised. Just so, Townsend beamed, to dine at my house tomorrow evening. I've been promising Mrs Townsend to bring you and I've been most neglectful. Unless you're already engaged for the evening, he added. Adam found himself caught entirely off guard. I am not, sir. Very good. It will be potluck, but I do not expect you will care about that. I would be honoured to join you, said Adam. Townsend nodded, seemingly satisfied. I shall see you tomorrow at seven, then, and we will go together. Thank you, sir, said Adam. But Townsend was already busy sorting through his papers. The interview was done. Adam took himself out and closed the door behind himself quietly. But he could not help but turn and stare, because for the life of them he did not understand what had just happened. He knew perfectly well how Townsend worked. For him, social position and society itself was all to be used for the furtherance of the career of Mr John Townsend. So there was no question to Adam that this sudden invitation meant Townsend wanted something from him. But what can that be? He also had no time to worry about that now. He still needed to sort out why Beecham was no longer in the cells. It might be early, but the brown bear was already crowded. Men came in for a pint of ale or for bread and cheese and whatever might be on the fire. Adam spotted Gautier and Torton seated with Wilder by the windows. Roast fowl, fresh bread, and tankards of warm cider sat on the table between them. All of Adam's instincts shouted at him to hurry. Beecham was walking the streets, free as a bird, and there was no knowing what might be about. But he forced the urges down. There were things he must make sure of, or he was at grave risk of wasting yet more time. As Adam slipped into place on the bench, Wilder swallowed uneasily. Now then, Mr Harkness. Wilder said. Mr Torton tells me this is your doing and I do thank you. He wiped his mouth on his sleeve. But I can tell you no more than I already said. I didn't see now and I don't know what happened. Wilder stood. And while I do thank you again for your generosity, I'd best be getting on home. Not at all, said Adam easily. I just knew it'd go hard with you, losing a prisoner like you did. Stafford and Townsend aren't the charitable sort when it comes to a man's duty. What'll you do now? Wilder froze, like a rabbit caught in a hedge, but only for an instant. Mr Stafford, he's been very understanding, he mumbled. Mr Townsend, too. Glad to hear it, said Gautier, because they aren't always. I imagine they took into account your years of loyal service, suggested Torton. That's it, said Wilder, palpably relieved. He took a great swallow of cider, as if to clear his throat. 
and slapped the pot back down. That's it, exactly. My years of service, they said. Wilder crammed his round-crowned hat on his head. Good day to you, gentlemen. Adam made no gesture to detain the turnkey. He already had what he needed. Well now, Gautier took a swallow of cider and tore a wing off the roast fowl. That was interesting. Do we all assume Jackie Beecham was let go? said Torton over the rim of his cider mug. No other reason for Wilder to still have his post, said Gautier. Question is, where's Beecham gone? Adam considered this. The answer could well depend on who opened the door for Beecham. Was it Stafford? Or Townsend? Stafford knew Adam was looking into the Cato Street business. Townsend had just invited Adam to dinner, much in the same way Adam had just stood Wilder to breakfast. But Stafford was the one who maintained Bow Street's network of informants. It occurred to Adam that a seasoned thief-taker might have a great deal of useful information and be willing to sell it if he knew he could get a good price. And Beecham had been at the Cocoa Tree the night Adam met with Sir Richard. I know where he's gone. Adam got to his feet. He's gone to find Edwards. But he can't know where the man is any more than we do, said Torton. Unless you think Stafford told him, asked Gautier. He doesn't need Stafford, said Adam. Beecham followed me through the park yesterday. I talked to an old milkman there. The fellow knew Hyden, the one who gave the warning note to the Earl. He told me Celia Ings would likely know where Edwards is now. With the fog as bad as it was, Beecham could have been listening three feet away and I never would have known it. Torton whistled low. It's bad, I admit. But are you sure we should do anything at all? If Beecham is Stafford's man, on Stafford's business, interfering with him could put all our posts at risk. Torton was right, of course. And under other circumstances, Adam might have turned his head away. It would have stung hard. The Cato Street men were still in prison, facing an evil death they had not earned. He should do whatever he could to bring them some kind of justice. And, of course, the reward beckoned. It brought the possibility of a life with Rosalind within reach. But even that could be set aside to protect his colleagues, if not himself. There was, however, something else that he could not ignore. Whatever Beecham may know or do about Cato Street, he is also involved in some way with this business around the Leverton family. Ah, oh, yes. Torton refilled his cup from the jug. This latest business that your Miss Thorne has taken an interest in. Any more about that? Gautier was refilling his own mug, and Adam had the feeling the man was deliberately avoiding catching his eye. It's more like events have taken an interest in her, said Adam. Some of the facts of the case are just as Beecham told us yesterday. A young woman, Kate Leverton, did run away from her family. She was acting as companion to her aunt, Marianna Leverton. Seems to me I know that name, said Torton. She's a political hostess, with a lot of friends among the radicals, said Gautier. Oh, aye, that'd be it. Torton drank his cider. She's also been poisoned, said Adam. Not dead, but dying. And her niece may have been poisoned as well. Struth, muttered Gautier. That's a nasty bit of work. The niece, before she ran, pawned some jewellery. Miss Thorne found the shop and the jewels, and it's possible, maybe even likely, those jewels were stolen. Gautier's brows rose. Torton set his cider down. Further, when the young woman's companions were taking her out for a walk, she apparently saw something, or someone, that scared the wits out of her so much so that she fainted and had to be taken back indoors at once. Adam paused to give all this time to sink in. So that's on one side. On the other, we've got Jack Beecham, who somehow knows enough about the Leverton household to use their troubles as a covering story, and who associates with a ring of female housebreakers. Now, I'll concede his relationship with Stafford may or may not be our business, but housebreakers definitely are. If Beecham is helping a gang of thieves, we need him found. All right, agreed Gautier. Then what do we do now? Adam got to his feet. First, I go point out to our Mr Stafford that he's been a damned fool. 
Then, with luck, we'll all be able to make up for lost time. Adam left them there and hurried back across the street. As usual, the lobby at Bow Street was filled to the brim. Angry, urgent voices echoed off the walls as people of all concerns and walks of life crowded toward the clerks. As usual, Mr Stafford perched on his stool, attempting to impose some semblance of order on the scene. Adam pushed his way through the mob, blunt and undignified, and clapped his hand on Stafford's shoulder. Stafford twisted abruptly round, his face a mask of outraged dignity. How dare you, sir, he bellowed. I need to speak to you, Mr Stafford. You will have to wait. I will not wait, replied Adam. If you will not speak to me, I will go find Mr Burney and let them know you may have just destroyed all possibility of convicting the Cato Street men. For a moment, Stafford looked at him as if he'd lost his mind. Adam didn't wait for the man to recover himself. He let go of his shoulder and marched toward the wardroom. He did not need to turn around to know that Stafford was following. The door to Townsend's office was closed. Adam knocked once and opened it. Townsend stood behind his desk, admiring his portrait of the Prince of Wales. What is this? he cried as Adam came inside. Then he saw the head clerk close behind. Stafford, your man is out of control, Townsend, Stafford growled. He also shut the door. He has taken it into his head to threaten me. Mr Stafford came to the cells last night and set the prisoner Jack Beecham free, said Harkness. Beecham is one of Mr Stafford's paid informants. As that is the case, Mr Harkness, said Stafford, I wonder that you find Mr Beecham any of your business. Beecham followed me to a meeting at the Cocoa Tree where I met with Sir Richard Phillips. Townsend raised his brows. You admit meeting with radicals then, Mr Harkness, said Stafford. Sir Richard, who is a Member of Parliament, wished to consult with me about finding a certain George Edwards, who he believed had information about the events of the Cato Street conspirators, said Adam. He is part of a committee being formed for the defence of the men being held, and he offered me the sum of £1,000 as a reward for bringing Edwards to him. You never told me this, Mr Arkness, said Townsend. No, sir, I did not, agreed Adam. Neither did I tell you that this man, Beecham, overheard this offer and has been following me across London ever since. With the help of Captain Gautier and Mr Torton, we finally corralled Beecham for his assault on Captain Gautier, but Stafford had him released, and I believe that was a colossal blunder. I suggest you tread very carefully, Mr Arkness, grated Stafford. Mr Stafford, said Adam evenly, I ask you to think about this from Beecham's point of view. There is a reward out there of £1,000 for the location of George Edwards. He now knows how that man may be found. Do you truly believe Beecham cares that Edwards is in your pay? Or what policy matters rest on keeping him hidden? Stafford searched Adam's face. Slowly, Adam could see a sliver of doubt working its way into the clerk's mind. Beecham knows full well that his employment with Bow Street depends on his reliability, said Stafford. And exactly how many years will it take Beecham to earn a thousand pounds in your employ? inquired Adam. Beecham is a gambler. He runs himself to debt and ruin regularly. That is not a man of thought and prudence. He will always play for the biggest pot within reach. Today, that means handing Edwards over to Sir Richard and his radical friends. You are very sure of yourself. Yes, Mr Stafford, I am. Stafford's eyes flickered toward Townsend. Adam pivoted. They all waited while tension filled the air until he felt near suffocated by it. At last, Townsend spoke. I would trust Mr Arkness's judgment in this matter. Do you know where this Edwards may be found? asked Townsend. It seems to me if you want the fella to remain anonymous, I'd say you'd better send Mr Arkness after him. And have him claim the radical's reward. Anger burned bright in Stafford's words. I think Mr Arkness understands his duty to Bow Street and the Crown in this matter, said Townsend mildly. Don't you, Mr Arkness? Harkness bowed. As he did, private hope turned to ash inside him.
but he let it go. Other hope, other plans would come. He trusted fate and Rosalind, but now he had work to do. Stafford's jaw worked itself back and forth several times. George Edwards is an itinerant plasterer and model maker by trade, but as to where he actually is now, I don't know, and he has taken care that I should not. Adam regarded Stafford for a long, hard moment, trying to determine if this was the truth. Stafford returned his stare without flinching, or giving any sign he meant to say anything more. At last, Adam turned on his heel and strode out the door. Chapter 36 The Consequences of Eavesdropping Those men of genius are dangerous husbands. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda Sanders and Fulkes had arrived at Rosalind's door promptly at half-past ten. A torturously early hour for a man of my constitution, he'd said, with his habitual air of mock suffering. He wore a coat of plain burgundy, leather breeches and plain brown top boots. With his fair hair tied back in a queue, he looked entirely the part of John Coachman, ready to drive her wherever she might choose to go. There were many reasons for Rosalind to enlist Mr. Volks for this particular enterprise, not the least of which happened to be that Rosalind knew he kept his own enclosed carriage and a team of matched chestnuts. She was therefore surprised to see the carriage had been harnessed to a pair of sturdy greys. My chestnuts are too well known on the street, Sanderson told her as he helped her into the carriage. We don't want any ill-mannered fellows hailing me and giving away the game. Thanks to Sanderson's experience with negotiating London's infamous traffic, it was only a short time before they arrived at Marcus Leverton's residence in Upper Seymour Street. Rosalind's first impression was that the house was respectable. It was not particularly grand, but neither was anything about it mean or second-rate. Rosalind knew from her acquaintances that this neighbourhood was rapidly becoming fashionable, so it was a prudent place for a man on the rise to set up his establishment. The footman who opened the door was dressed in plain forest green and white. He took Rosalind's card and bowed. Mrs Leverton is expecting you, he said. She is sorry that she was detained by some last-minute correspondence and has asked if you will wait for her in the morning room where she will join you shortly. Rosalind, of course, agreed. The footman signalled to the waiting maid to help Rosalind with her things. The foyer was furnished with a heavy mahogany table for Mrs Leverton's visiting book and the salver for cards. An elaborate silver vase with two curling handles held a wealth of hothouse roses. Rosalind considered whether she should risk a peek at the visiting book, but she had no time. Miss Thorne? Rosalind turned to see Everett Leverton descending the stairs. How do you do? Come to call on Wilhelmina? Yes, I did not realise you were also in residence here. Afraid so. He gave her a sheepish grin. Can't afford my own rooms, and can't ask Marcus to bear that particular expense, so here I am, and here I shall remain until... well, until further notice, I suppose. Everett, who... Wilhelmina came down the stairs as well. Oh, Miss Thorne, I did not realise you had arrived. Everett, what do you mean by keeping Miss Thorne standing in the foyer? My apologies, Miss Thorne, Everett bowed. I'm afraid my manners are entirely shocking. Ask anyone. She can begin with me said Wilhelmina tartly as she came to stand beside Rosalind. However, I am glad you are here. If you would care to follow me, I've given instructions for tea to be served in the morning room. May I join? asked Everett. Or would I be intruding? Wilhelmina frowned at him. I'd be intruding, concluded Everett immediately. Hey-ho, what's to be done with Everett? I shall take myself up to my lonely apartment and hope I may be summoned later when my face is washed and my hair is neatly combed and I know how to behave myself. He bowed again and took himself back up the stairs. Wilhelmina watched him for a moment and Rosalind was startled to see the anger shining in her dramatic green eyes. But when she turned to face Rosalind, that anger had vanished and she was entirely the cool, experienced hostess. You must not mind my brother-in-law, she said mildly. When matters become grave, he feels it's something of a duty to try to play the clown. Shall we? She gestured down the central hall. The Leverton's morning room overlooked a narrow strip of garden. 
The curtains were drawn back, flooding the room with sun. It was a tasteful room, devoid of display. In fact, if anything, it was a little spartan. There was only one rug on the floor, and the walls were simply painted. The only decoration was a formal portrait of Marcus and Wilhelmina over the fireplace. The mantel, however, was crowded with invitation cards, many of them gilt-edged. Mr and Mrs Leverton were popular guests, it seemed, and these were hardly the mundane round of charity balls and public concerts to which many middle-class hostesses found themselves relegated. Rosalind quickly discerned that several addresses were in Grosvenor Square, the centre of the social world, and at least one hostess was known to be an intimate of the new king. Rosalind felt her brows inching up. She also realised she was staring and edging close to openly snooping. That is a lovely array of invitations, said Rosalind, conversationally, as Wilhelmina poured their tea and handed her a cup. You must be anticipating a busy season. The season is always such work, do not find, replied Wilhelmina, pouring out her own cup of tea and adding a slice of lemon. I am quite exhausted with going out every night and planning our own dinner party at the end of the week. Naturally, this is the time when our housekeeper has left us. Rosalind made a sympathetic noise. She was hired by a hotel, said Wilhelmina confidentially. A hotel? It is past comprehension, is it not? Unless one considered that the position probably came with shorter hours and better wages than she could make in service, it might seem to be. Rosalind did not mention this. Have you found a replacement? she asked. Not yet, Wilhelmina sighed. We dined with Lady Worth yesterday. I had hoped she might be able to recommend someone, but the woman she had in mind had already accepted a place with Mrs Robbins, and now I don't know what we will do. Our current staff is very capable, as far as it goes. I fear, however, they will not be able to keep things up to Marcus's standards. She noted the inquiring tilt to Rosalind's head. My husband cannot abide any form of chaos in his home, Miss Thorne. An artefact of his childhood, I believe. His mother, well, you've seen Beatrice, she is not one to rise gracefully to any sort of challenge. Rosalind returned a non-committal murmur. We have several important dinners this season, Wilhelmina went on. It is imperative everything be perfect. I may know of someone looking for a new position, said Rosalind. She had always made it her business to be as aware as she could of experienced persons seeking new situations. There was no better way to earn a hostess's appreciation and trust than by being able to help with her servant problem. She is quite skilled, but she is also married. I recognise that can be a problem in some houses. Is her husband also in service? asked Wilhelmina at once. Would he need a place as well? It would certainly be an inducement if it could be managed. I think it could. Please do write to her, said Wilhelmina. We have had such troubles of late. She paused, and Rosalind watched her decide not to finish her sentence. This is extremely helpful, Miss Thorne. But then that is your reputation, is it not? Being helpful in all circumstances. I recognise it is an unusual mode of living, said Rosalind. For my personal preference, I believe I would choose quiet retirement. This statement was untrue from beginning to end, but Rosalind had found the sentiment was acceptable to conventionally-minded company. Unfortunately, we cannot always choose our own paths. No, that is very true, replied Wilhelmina. Rosalind heard the barely suppressed bitterness under the words. And you have certainly proved yourself to be most efficient in our present difficulties. I cannot tell you how very glad I was to see those letters arrive from Kate, you have no conception of how distraught Beatrice has been, or what kind of things she's been saying. It is all nonsense, of course, but in Mariana's precarious state of health I was afraid she might take notice. Surely Mariana would make allowances for Beatrice. Her daughter is missing. You do not understand the depths of the breach between Mariana and Marcus. She harbours a deep grudge over his unwillingness to accept her as family. He, on the other hand, will not forgive her for favouring Harold Davenport over him, then when she took Kate's side against his father, she glanced toward the door. I have never seen him so angry. She took Kate's side. I had understood the family agreed to send her to Mariana's. Only after Mariana offered, said Wilhelmina. 
Everett tried to make a joke of it, that she was taking in the family strays again. Again? Oh, yes. Beatrice is subject to the vapours, and when a particularly bad bout overcomes her, she always goes to stay with Mariana. As far as Marcus is concerned, it is another black mark against his aunt. He says she encourages Beatrice's hysterical tendencies. And does she? asked Rosalind. Wilhelmina's smile was so thin and so brief, Rosalind almost missed it. If I was to hazard a guess, I would say Beatrice uses the time as a vacation from her cares at home. She always took Kate with her when she went, you know, and that, I'm sure, was why Mariana was so willing to take Kate in. And Beatrice, once her husband died? suggested Rosalind. Actually, I believe that was Everett's doing, said Wilhelmina. I'm not sure how he managed to impose upon her. Mariana finds Beatrice dull and somewhat incomprehensible, and yet she has made no move to rescind the invitation. Perhaps he persuaded her that Beatrice should be allowed to try to reconcile with Kate. Perhaps, said Wilhelmina, but she clearly did not believe it. Rosalind found herself wondering about Everett, the awkward clown and peacemaker. On the face of it, it did not seem likely that he could persuade Mariana of anything she did not already wish to do. Before Rosalind could form her next remark, the door opened. Startled, she winced. But Wilhelmina just raised her head, her expression at once tired and expecting. Marcus Leverton stood in the doorway. My apologies, he said, although he clearly did not mean it. Morris told me you had come home. He should have perhaps mentioned Miss Thorne had arrived, said Wilhelmina. Perhaps he did, Miss Thorne. Marcus bowed and then turned his attention entirely back to his wife. Were your errands successful? I believe you were to visit Lady Talbot. Lady Worth, Wilhelmina corrected him. Ah, oh, yes, of course, about the pastry cook. The housekeeper, said Wilhelmina. A replacement for Mrs. Deal. It must have been a long meeting. You left right after breakfast. You know how Lady Worth loves to talk. Wilhelmina smiled, and her expression was as strained as her voice. Were you successful then? I'm afraid I was not. However, I mentioned our housekeeping dilemma to Miss Thorne, and she thinks she may know of someone suitable for us. Does she? Well, then I suppose we must thank you, Miss Thorne. Marcus made the briefest bow possible toward her. Rosalind returned a stiff nod. I'm glad I could be of assistance. I hope that you are better at finding new servants than you are missing children. Marcus, began Wilhelmina. But Marcus ignored her because you seem to be spending much more time sitting about gossiping than you do actually looking for Catherine. My aunt may choose to throw her money away on another female oddity, but I do not have to humour her, he paused. Neither does my wife. I apologise for my husband, Miss Thorne, began Wilhelmina. Don't you dare, thundered Marcus. Wilhelmina scarcely seemed to notice. As you can see, he is tired, and not knowing where his sister is has been preying upon his temper. If you had any news at all... I'm afraid not, said Rosalind. I apologise for taking up so much of your time, as I know you have a busy morning. Not at all. You will write to me about the housekeeper. Certainly, Mrs Leverton. She rose. Thank you for the tea. A pleasure to see you again, Mr Leverton. Rosalind curtsied and took her leave. She had just reached the foyer and told the footman she was in need of her things when she heard footsteps behind her. A word, Miss Thorne. Marcus strode up the hall from the morning room. If you would be so kind, he added in a sarcastic drawl. Rosalind took refuge in her coldest dignity. What can I do for you, Mr Leviton? You can leave my house and not return. Rosalind drew herself up, but Marcus took no notice. I do not care what oddities my aunt may choose to keep around her. She will have her come up and soon enough. But you will all stay away from my house and my wife, or I will have the law on you. Rosalind said nothing. And you will not insult my intelligence by suggesting your being here has anything to do with my disgrace of a sister. I am fully aware of Mariana's vindictive plans to lure my wife from me, and you are welcome to tell her so. He turned to the footman. See this woman out, and do not admit her again. With that, Marcus strode back into the depths of his house. Rosalind let out a long, slow breath. 
she also turned. The footman bowed. My apologies, miss, he murmured. With that, the maid was summoned. Rosalind was quickly and efficiently bundled into coat and bonnet and quite literally shown the door. Fortunately, Sanderson was at that moment driving the carriage out of the mews and to the front of the house. Success? he inquired as he leapt down from the box and opened the door. I don't know, admitted Rosalind. How unusual, murmured Sanderson as he lowered the step and extended a hand to help her into the carriage. Given this state of uncertainty, what is our next port of call? Rosalind's mind raced. The night before she'd spoken of jealousy to Adam. Then it had merely been a possibility. Now it had become a certainty. Quite apart from any insult Marcus may have dealt her, it was very plain that Marcus Leverton did not trust his beautiful wife. Even if his probing questions had not made this plain, his shocking accusation that Mariana was attempting to interfere in his marriage would have. I think that we need to wait a while and see who leaves the house next and where they go. Because while Marcus was jealous and watchful, Wilhelmina was angry and wary, and Everett, Everett was a go-between. But for whom? And how trustworthy was he? It was possible he'd forced Kate into a lie because he believed it would be best. Then, too, there was the other thing Marcus had said about Mariana almost in passing. A cold, casual declaration that sent a chill down Rosalind's spine. She will have her come up and soon enough. Chapter 37 The Comfort of Siblings Could I borrow a sigh or a tear from my tragic sister? Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda Oh, hello, George. Come in and sit, won't you? Alice's brother, who was very accustomed to her ways, shoveled the pile of newspapers off the slat-back chair nearest the hearth, took a cup off the mantel and filled it from the pot on the hearth. Well, the truth of the matter is you've probably saved me from being thrown out into the street. George sat in the chair he'd just cleared and stretched his long legs out to rest his heels on the hob. Like Alice, George was dark, sharp and quick. He was, however, a good eight inches taller than his sister. You'd really be thrown out by your pregnant wife, quipped Alice. Or someone in her family. Hannah's mother and sisters are all settled in and they complain I'm in the way. He made a face at his coffee. But when I try to go to work, the Major says he's tired of my staring out the window like I'm trying to lay eyes on the stork. Poor George, said Alice. I'm sure they all know you mean well. George drank his coffee and made another different face. How long has this been sitting here? Not that long, said Alice, I don't think. She poured herself a cup, drank and pulled her own face. Perhaps I'm wrong. She set the cup on the mantel. And how is Hannah? Aside from being surrounded by female relatives. Blooming, George smiled. He also sighed. Impatient. Her mother is certain it will be any day now, and she's had seven children of her own. I suspect she would know. And how are you? I don't know, he admitted. I want this child. I think I want this more than I have anything in my life. And at the same time, I'm terrified. What if I... What if I'm... Alice took his hand. You are nothing like our father. You will not desert your child, children, because I am quite convinced this is the first of half a dozen. I'll have to ask the Major to increase my salary. Never fear, Alice raised her cup to him. When my books are an enormous success, I will make sure they are all provided for. All I ask is you name at least two of them for me. George grinned. What if they're all boys? Well, then they'll just go through life profoundly embarrassed, won't they? George chuckled and Alice smiled. She started to drink her coffee, remembered it was bad and set it on the corner of the desk. And what about you? George asked. How are you doing? Alice had not been looking forward to this particular question. If it was anyone else, she might be tempted to put them off, but that would never work with George. She had no choice but to tell him the truth. I don't know she said. Rosalind says you're in love. She may be right. 
George leaned forward and rested his elbows on his knees. Alice, you're my sister. You will always be my sister, no matter what. But... But? Are you sure? About Amelia, I mean. Alice rolled her eyes toward the ceiling, looking for patience. Were you sure when you started courting Hannah? When I started, no, George admitted. But eventually, yes. Well, I'm still waiting for eventually. And if eventually comes? That was, unfortunately, an excellent question. Rosalind had pointed out that it was impractical, not to mention unfair, for her to carry on a romantic liaison with a servant. Rosalind was, as usual, right. Then there was the small matter of not being entirely certain she wanted to continue living with Rosalind if she was also one half of a domesticated couple, especially if Rosalind's painstakingly slow courtship of Mr Harkness continued. Perhaps we will run off to Wales and set up housekeeping next to the ladies of Langotlin. The famed ladies lived in a cottage, wore masculine dress and regularly hosted parties for the literary lights who came to visit them. You would be bored stiff in Wales, said George. I don't see why I should be, replied Alice. I'll have my novels, and I'm told nature is quite lovely and fresh air is most fashionable nowadays. How does Amelia feel about Wales? I haven't had the opportunity to ask her yet. As I said, we are still waiting on eventually. Alice paused. And if you say anything mawkish about not letting her break my heart, I shall deny you were ever my brother and your children may whistle for their inheritance. You needn't bother. The Major would fire me outright if I dared fall so far into a cliché. Now it was George's turn to pause. Well, if Wales doesn't answer, we'll find you something. We? Oui? Hannah was the one who brought it all up. She said you'd probably be wanting your own room sooner or later. I knew I liked her. This, of course, made George go all misty-eyed, as he habitually did when thinking of his wife. It didn't last long, however. All the same, Alice, you will be careful. I don't like this business with what's-her-name. He pointed toward the ceiling. Kate Leverton, Alice supplied. Yes, her. Things are unsettled right now. The king's in a rage, the world's afraid of what's coming next, and... Alice's brow furrowed. What has any of that to do with Kate? Her aunt's Marianna Leverton, isn't she? Well, Mrs Leverton is closely involved with a lot of persons who are making a lot of noise right now and drawing a lot of attention to themselves. Alice sighed. You've been talking with Adam. I've been reading the newspapers. Trust me, George, this is nothing Rosalind hasn't seen before... I shouldn't be surprised if she didn't have it all sorted out by supper time. I hope you're right, Alice, said George. I truly do. Before the seriousness could become truly awkward, however, he raised his cup. And I hope you can convince your cook to brew us some fresh coffee, because, dear sister, this is absolutely undrinkable. Alice laughed and reached for the bell. Before she could ring, however, there was a soft scratching at the door, and a moment later Amelia leaned in. She was wearing her cloak and bonnet, and had her basket slung over her arm. If you please, Miss Alice, I'm going to market. Was there anything you needed? Alice looked at her and felt her heart begin to melt, as it always did, even as fresh frustration built inside her. Because Amelia's voice was too tentative, and her eyes were darting back and forth, and she was twiddling with the end of her bonnet ribbon, because everything about her said something was wrong. I want you to tell me the truth, Alice wanted to shout. Out loud, she said, Not at present. How is Kate? Amelia's fingers knotted around her ribbon. She said she was going to have a bit of a nap, so I thought it would be all right to go now. Very good, said Alice, brightly, as if she believed this. You should check with Mrs Singh to see if she needs anything. George raised his cup and made a pleading face. Oh, and ask her if she could make some fresh coffee, please. Yes, miss said Amelia, and she ducked out, and Alice tried hard not to hear the word goodbye ringing in her mind, because Amelia hadn't actually said that. Had she? All right, Alice, said George. What's the problem? Nothing. You're lying. I am. All right, I am. Alice glared at the closed door. 
Something's wrong with Amelia, and I've had enough. She got to her feet. What do you want to do? It's not what I want to do. Alice's coat hung over the back of one chair. Her gloves lay on the corner of the desk next to her battered reticule. It's what I have to do. Which is? Never you mind. Alice yanked her gloves on. Your job is to stay here and keep both eyes on Kate Leverton. You're not going to talk to her? Ha! <laughs> Alice laughed grimly. That one wouldn't tell me water is wet. I'll tell you what she did say, though. She said she had friends in Edinburgh who would take her in. Sorry, missing the significance. If she had friends, why bother with this business of running away in the middle of the night? Why not just say, oh, I've got a letter, I'm going to visit the Wallaces, goodbye and I'll write soon? Alice felt all her old news instincts rising. And if she wanted to vanish, she could take the first stage from London and then get off as soon as they stopped to change horses and from there she could go anywhere. Alice swept an arm out, indicating the whole world waiting beyond the windows. So either she's lying through her teeth about these Edinburgh friends or something drove her out of that house. And what's more, she barely escaped with her life. So what did she discover, hmm? Or what was discovered about her? Alice, began George. Alice ignored him. She also plucked her bonnet off the corner of the chair where she'd tossed it. I'll be back in a few hours, she said as she tied her ribbons. You aren't going to follow your maid, are you? Don't be ridiculous, George, said Alice. If I did that, I might get caught. Then what are you going to do? Alice grabbed her reticule and smiled darkly. I, dear brother, am going to remember I'm a newspaper woman and follow my nose. Chapter 38 Followers Women, you know, as well as men, often speak with one species of enthusiasm and act with another. Edgeworth Maria Belinda What shall we do now? asked Sanderson as he handed Rosalind into the carriage. From your expression, your interview with the Levitons did not go as you hoped. Rosalind tried to relax her furrowed brow. She met with limited success. She felt like she had seen and heard a great deal, if only she could understand it properly. What was clear was that Marcus Leverton was an intensely jealous man. Was it possible that jealousy had a foundation? It was easy to dismiss that possibility. Marcus was the angry husband of a woman of more than ordinary beauty. His fears could easily be all in his imagination. And yet... She had seen how Everett's hand strayed toward Wilhelmina's when he was frightened. She noted that he seemed to be in no hurry at all to leave his brother's house, even though he was a young man of a well-connected family who could have easily claimed a place at law or in the church or purchased a commission or even gone into business. What, then, kept him at home and unmarried? And if Marcus was afraid that Wilhelmina was unfaithful... Why did he permit his unmarried brother to remain in his house? And could she find out anything about these Levitons when she had been expressly forbidden the house? I think, said Rosalind to Sanderson, that we should keep watch on this house and see who leaves next and where they go. It might be that the destination would reveal something significant. Or, even better to Rosalind's way of thinking, it might provide her with a way to cross paths with either Everett or Wilhelmina in a way that would allow her to open a fresh conversation. As my lady requires, Sanderson fastened the carriage door. I hope you've brought all your patience. This may take a while. You sound like you've had experience in such matters. Sanderson's smile grew mischievous. Now, Miss Thorne, you must allow me to keep some of my secrets. With that, he climbed back on the box and touched up the horses, leaving Rosalind little to do except settle back on the bench, watch the house and think about all she knew and all she did not. Sanderson's carriage, although immaculate, was plain black and unmarked. This should have rendered it fairly anonymous, but the street was exceedingly quiet at this time of day. If they simply stood across the street to watch the Leverton's house, they would quickly become conspicuous. Sanderson solved this problem by driving sedately around the block. After several circuits, Sanderson drew up to the corner and made a pretense of examining one of the horse's hooves. 
Rosalind climbed out of the carriage to join him. To any passers-by, it would appear she was consulting with her driver about a horse that was coming up lame. She could rely on the carriage and her plain bonnet to screen her face from anyone who might happen to look casually from the window of the Leverton's house. Sanderson set the horse's hoof down and patted his neck with the easy assurance of a person who was experienced around horses. "'I had a visit from my younger brother,' he said conversationally. "'Did you?' Sanderson had left his family years ago, and for the most part they had been content to let him go. His elder brother was ambitious, but his ambitions were firmly rooted in the family estate and line, and he had become indispensable to their father. His younger brother, Theodore, was put on the usual course of schools for a young man of a landed family. Sanderson sent him the occasional letter and the occasional gift, and everyone seemed to consider themselves satisfied with the arrangement. Yes, it seems he's developed a taste for drawing. He'd like to pursue it seriously, see if he has a talent, or at least flair. What does your father think of that? According to Theo, his exact words were, Not another one which sounded very much like Sanderson's father. He's asked me to sponsor him, send him to school in Paris, let him find out if he's any good. What did you say? I said yes, Sanderson told her. Somewhat to everyone's surprise, certainly to mine. I warned him I intend to be a harsh taskmaster. I've no objection to him trying out life for himself, but if he's going to school, he must actually go. I believe I was quite firm. He smiled slightly. I blame your Mr. Harkness for this, you know. And you. Rosalind arched her brows. Me? How on earth is you deciding to pay to send your brother to school my fault? Because before I began assisting you and Mr. Harkness in your little endeavours, I was quite content to be the dissolute bachelor. Now I find I have been drawn into the softly seductive allure of being useful, even in a small way. Well then, Rosalind assumed a prim air. I hope Theo appreciates all I have done for him. I shall see to it the boy writes you a note of thanks, Sanderson returned solemnly. He finished tugging at the harness. There, I think we have lingered long enough. Rosalind looked over his shoulder toward the Leviton's house. She was beginning to wonder if this wait was in vain. Perhaps she would need to employ a different stratagem. But what? Her normal way of proceeding took more time than she had. Even without Mariana's restrictions, she did not like to leave Kate in the house. She feared for the friction Kate's presence would cause between Alice and Amelia. More than that, however, she feared the simple fact that Kate could not be trusted. But even as she considered telling Sanderson they should start around the block just once more, an open landau with a team of sedate bay horses drew up to the front of the Levitons. Mr. Fawkes turned to see what had caught Rosalind's attention. "'Well, I think we're all right now, miss,' he drawled. "'Shall we go?' "'Yes, indeed.' Shielded by Sanderson's tall frame, Rosalind watched as Wilhelmina, wearing a broad bonnet lined with yellow silk and white lace, came down the steps, with not one but two maids following her. "'I believe we shall.' The exercise of following Wilhelmina Leverton was, unfortunately, mostly one of frustration. Enclosed in the carriage, Rosalind was comfortably anonymous, but it also meant she had no way to keep an eye on Wilhelmina's carriage. She trusted Mr. Fawkes, of course, but at the same time she was conscious of an absurd need to see things for herself. She tried to concentrate on the passing streets and to occupy her mind with considering where Wilhelmina might be going. There was, of course, no guarantee it was any place of significance. She recognised the neighbourhood of Bond Street, land of the most fashionable shops. Wilhelmina might well be simply going to purchase some new items needed for her upcoming dinner parties. The presence of the maids might just be to keep her husband's suspicions calm, or it might be she planned to make a number of purchases and expected to require assistance. It could very well be that whatever lay between Kate and her family and Mariana and her family was entirely separate from Wilhelmina and Marcus's marital difficulties and that Rosalind was wasting what little time she had. And yet... And yet... 
There had been a calculation in Wilhelmina's manner when she spoke to Rosalind about her husband and his family. Perhaps she was just being protective. The family had endured scandal already, and she had a social position to guard, on her own behalf as well as her husband's. And yet... The carriage stopped. Rosalind risked putting the window down and peering out. They had stopped in front of Rees & Co., a popular draper's shop. Wilhelmina's two maids stood on the walk. From their attentive attitudes, Rosalind guessed they were listening for instructions. She saw Wilhelmina's yellow-gloved hands giving a purse to the older of the pair, who immediately stowed it away inside her cloak. Then the maids turned away together and hurried into the shop. Walk on, said Sanderson from the box. The carriage moved. Up ahead, Wilhelmina's conveyance presumably did the same. Rosalind dropped back onto the bench. Well, that answered one question. The maids were window-dressing to placate and distract Marcus. Possibly Marcus and Everett. But from what? Rosalind was still turning both thought and doubt over in her mind when the carriage began to slow. Rosalind shook herself and looked out the window again, realising, much to her chagrin, she did not know what street she was on. The carriage stopped and rocked gently as Sanderson climbed off the box and came round to her door. It would seem that Mrs Leverton has unconventional ideas of where to go on her afternoons out, he said. Rosalind peered over his shoulder. They were in a commercial street, lined with good shops and several private hotels. She caught a glimpse of Wilhelmina's back as she entered one of those doors. It had a good red brick façade and bright windows with freshly painted black trim. It may be she goes to meet a friend, said Rosalind. Perhaps I... She most certainly goes to meet a friend, said Sanderson, of a particular sort. Rosalind raised her brows. I blush to disclose this information. That hotel, he nodded toward the building Wilhelmina had entered, is operated by a Mrs. Oglethorpe. It is a strictly private establishment that facilitates discreet assignations between men and women who do not happen to be married to each other. As a gently bred, unmarried woman, Rosalind was not, of course, supposed to have any knowledge of such places or what might go on inside them. I see you are not shocked, murmured Sanderson. I am sorry if you're disappointed, said Rosalind. But I have, in the past, intervened on behalf of an erring personage whose visit to a similar establishment was unfortunately observed. Ah, yes, I should have realised. He paused. Would you like me to go inside and see if I can ascertain whom our Mrs Leverton is meeting? There is no need, murmured Rosalind because the answer was even now striding easily down the street. He wore a curly-brimmed beaver hat and carried a silver-headed walking stick in his gloved hand. His easy stride and lifted chin suggested he was enjoying his walk and the prospects for his day. Harold Davenport rested his stick on his shoulder and disappeared into Mrs Oglethorpe's hotel. Chapter 39 Reclaiming Personal Property Do you imagine that through this tragical disguise I have not found you out? Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda Fran watched the little chaperone trot down Rosalind Thorne's steps. According to the scullery maid from next door, who'd been out scrubbing steps this morning and was more than willing to take a moment to gossip, that quick, dark woman was a Miss Alice Littlefield who was a lady writer for the newspapers and might even be writing a whole book. Fancy, Fran had murmured. The pretty maid had left just before Miss Littlefield. She'd come up out of the area stairs, her basket on her arm and looking like she was about to burst into tears. Somebody had clearly put a flea in that one's ear over something. By Fran's count, that left the tall gentleman and the cook inside. And, of course, Kate. Fran schooled her features into a polite smile and hurried across the square to knock on the door. She stepped back and waited, her hands neatly and properly folded. After a few moments, the door opened. It was the gentleman. Fran remembered to look startled. Oh, 
Forgive me, I'm calling for Miss Rosalind Thorne. Is this the right house? It is, said the man, but I'm afraid Miss Thorne is not at home. Oh, oh dear. Fran fiddled with the strings on the reticule hanging from her wrist. This is awkward. I... may I step in a moment, please? She let her gaze slip toward the street, hinting that she would prefer not to discuss things standing out on the stoop. The man seemed to understand. He stood back and allowed her to enter. The little foyer was as Fran expected, with the stairs running up on her left hand as she faced them. A single hallway ran to the right, with the first floor rooms opening from it. Now for the tricky part. Fran ducked her head as if hiding a blush. You must forgive me, Mr... George Littlefield, he answered with a slight bow. My sister Alice is also resident here, he added, lest she should be shocked by the unaccountable phenomenon of an unaccompanied gentleman answering Miss Thorne's door. Mr Littlefield, she gave him her best shy smile. I am Wilhelmina Leverton. Miss Thorne may have mentioned I was going to call. No, I'm afraid she didn't. Oh, oh dear. She tugged at her reticule string again, in a further show of uncertainty. You see, my sister-in-law Kate is staying here, and I've come to see her. The family is... Well, if you're a friend of Miss Thorne's, I'm sure I can tell you. She gave him another tentative smile, indicating that if he was a friend to Miss Thorne's, surely he must be her friend as well. But there have been difficulties, and we are most anxious to know that she's all right. She blinked rapidly as if she might cry. Most gentlemen would have fallen over themselves to escort her inside and bring Kate to her at once. George Littlefield stayed where he was, and his open, guileless eyes grew just a touch wary. I'm surprised Rosalind didn't tell Alice you were coming, he said. She was planning to be out this morning and would not have neglected to mention it. Oh, perhaps Miss Littlefield simply forgot to pass the message on. He was looking at her far too long and too suspiciously. Who was this man? His clothes said he was of the middling classes, but his air said he was a gentleman. She glanced quickly at his hands. There were ink stains on his fingertips. He had a trade then, perhaps a clerk or a lawyer, or even a newspaper writer, as his sister was. I'm sure Alice would have mentioned it, said Mr Littlefield, or waited for you herself. Damn. Fran bit her lip and let her chin quiver. Please, she whispered, if I could just see her. Her mother... She got no further. A harsh pounding rattled the door at her back. Littlefield frowned. Excuse me. He stepped around her to open the door. A girl in plain dress and apron stood on the steps, flushed and panting, as if she'd just run all the way across London. Bella, cried Littlefield. George, gasped the girl. You've got to get home. The baby's coming. The colour drained from Littlefield's face. He staggered as if the words struck him a blow. Yes, yes, of course, yes, he babbled. I must, I... Uh, he stared at Fran. Mrs Singh, who must be the cook. I can let her know what's happened, said Fran helpfully, and she can help me leave a note for Miss Thorne. Yes, yes, thank you. Littlefield grabbed his hat off the peg by the door. He bolted down the steps, catching the drab girl by the arm as he rushed past. Fran heard him saying something about a cab as she quickly closed the door. Silence enveloped her. Even in a modest house such as this, the kitchen was down in the cellar and probably in the back. The cook probably hadn't heard a single sound. And Kate, of course, was in hiding and not likely to come poking about out of idle curiosity. All the better for me. Fran hiked up her skirts and ran lightly up the stairs. The second floor mirrored the first, with the rooms on the right-hand side of the hallway. All the doors were closed. Fran considered her options. She chose the middle door. She scratched softly as a properly trained maid would. No answer. She slipped up to the next door and scratched again. Amy? whispered Kate from the other side. Fran opened the door and ducked inside. Kate was sitting in a chair by the open window. She looked up and then jumped up as Fran shut the door and turned the key. The chair tipped over backward and fell with a thud. Hello, Kate, Fran grinned. How? began Kate but Fran just shook her head. Really, Katie girl, you know my profession. 
Did you really think I couldn't get in some place if I wanted? Kate looked to the door. Now, now, no noise. Fran wagged a finger at her. It's just you and me here now. Your chaperone's gone out, and her brother's gone to see his baby being born. You might see if you can scream for that cook, but that might not end up going so well for anybody concerned, yourself included. Fortunately, Kate knew her well enough to understand that she was perfectly ready to back up any threat she made. What do you want? Kate croaked. I came to see how you do. Fran stepped lightly across the room, picked up the chair and promptly sat down in it. You look to have fallen on your feet among good company. How much have you taken them for? I never, gasped Kate. No? Fran arched her brows. Ah, but when they find all those jewels you've stolen off me and the girls, are they going to believe that? What jewels? I handed you over everything. Fran got slowly to her feet. Kate tried to back away, but Fran was across the room before she could take her first step. She seized Kate's wrist, not tight enough to bruise, just hard enough to let her know that playtime was over. Now, Katie girl, breathed Fran, don't you try to lie to me. Kate swallowed hard. Let me go, Fran, she pleaded, just as soon as you tell me where you put my property. Please. Tears shimmered in Kate's eyes. I don't have anything. I mean it. If something's gone missing... Fran pressed one finger from her free hand against Kate's lips. What did I say about lying to me? I'm losing my patience now. Where are my jewels, Katie? She opened her mouth to say she didn't know, or maybe she meant to blame Amy, but at the same time her eyes darted toward the wardrobe. Fran snorted in disgust and pushed Kate away. She staggered. Fran stomped to the wardrobe, which was, of course, unlocked, because this was a quiet, respectable house, and threw open the doors. Inside, along with a pair of neatly pressed dresses, waited a familiar, battered brown valise. You kept it, I see. Fran helped herself to the bag. I suppose one never knows when such a thing will come in handy. Fran, said Kate behind her, you've got to understand... No, Katie, I don't think I do. Fran seized the bag and turned to face her. In fact, you're lucky I'm in a hurry, or I'd see to it that you understand how much trouble you caused with this little caper of yours. Kate blanched, and Fran grinned at her, baring all her teeth. Now a little bird tells me you're planning on leaving town. This was a guess, but the signs certainly pointed that way. Kate's nervous swallow told Fran she'd guessed right. You best be getting on then, Fran told her, and if I was you, I'd not come back. Fran gave her one more hard shove for good measure before she barged out the door and down the stairs. Here now, cried a woman's voice behind her. What's all this? Fran didn't permit herself to break stride or waste time looking back. She bolted for the door and left it swinging open in her wake. Fingers brushed her back as she leapt down the stairs, hit the flagstone walk with only the slightest stagger, and sprinted up the street, the heavy bag banging against her thigh and a mad grin spreading across her face as she ran. Let proper Miss Thorne explain this one to the neighbours. Chapter 40 On the Hunt But he was so easily led, or rather so easily excited by his companions, and his companions were now of such a sort that it was probable he would soon become vicious. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda London's rookeries were where people wound up where there was simply nowhere else to go. A rookery was not so much a building as a maze of them, connected by rickety stairs and walkways. Walls were put up and taken down at random in the dark, fetid interiors that could stretch on for what might be the length of a whole block in more regulated parts of the city. Most people weren't lucky enough to have a proper room. Hanging blankets divided the living spaces, such as they were. Sometimes there weren't even blankets, just an understanding of whose spot it might be, or the fact that one family could defend its territory against all comers. It was not safe for anyone with a good pair of shoes to walk here, never mind a man who was known to be an officer of the court. Adam, Gautier and Torton kept close to each other. It was almost noon outside. In here, Adam carried a lantern. 
Torton and Gautier had their truncheons out. Even with the other men supporting him, Adam wished for eyes in the back of his head. There was no telling how many people lounged around them in the darkness. If it came to a fight, they stood very little chance of making it out alive. But for the price of a few pennies given to a grizzled, toothless fellow perched on an empty barrel, they were given directions to the rooms Celia Ng had claimed for herself and her children. These rooms were found through a basement that was dark as a mine shaft, and up a flight of back stairs that dipped and creaked under their boots. Torton puffed and swore, as grim as Adam had ever heard him. A ragged child sat at the top of the stairs, watching their approach with wary fascination. Where can we find Celia Ings? Adam asked. The child took their time looking them all over, then cried, Ma, it's some gents. A greasy, torn blanket was lifted back. What do you want with me? A woman demanded. Celia Ings was a thin, grey woman with a square face and big, raw-boned hands and wrists. She held up a single guttering candle stuck to a bit of broken dish. My name is Harkness, said Adam. This is Captain Gautier and Mr. Torton. Well, what of it? She folded her arms. You got news about my man? No change, said Gautier. I'm sorry. The woman's face hardened and she turned away. Adam caught the blanket as it fell. We've a few questions to ask you, Mrs. Ings. She shrugged. There was a packing crate in the corner. Adam reached into his coat pocket, pulled out a few packages and laid them down on it. What's that then? Mrs. Ing asked. My mother's baking day, said Adam. Bread and some cake, a bit of butter and cheese. Keeping one eye on them, Celia moved to unwrap the paper. Three children appeared, seemingly out of the woodwork. She distributed bread, cheese, honey cake clouts and shakes in equal measure to all of them. This rough care completed, she tore off a hunk of the remaining bread for herself and crammed it in her mouth like she thought someone might steal it from her. She may have had reason for that. Well, she said, spewing crumbs, speak your piece. We're looking for the man George Edwards. Celia's eyes narrowed. Can you tell us anything about him? asked Adam. Celia's eyes shifted back and forth. Loose, she bellowed. Another child, a head taller than the others, appeared out of the dark. Celia swiftly bundled the food up in its paper and handed it to her. Luce nodded without a word and vanished. Celia herself shoved her bare feet into a pair of wooden clogs and led Adam and the others out of the warren and into a long, crooked yard. The only way he could tell they were even outside was by the strip of grey sky overhead. Celia Ings faced them all and folded her arms. You see what we is, she said. Ain't got nothing, do we? Ings, he worked the butcher's trade when he worked at all. Fell to pieces, didn't he? And wasn't the kids hungry and half dead all winter along? And then this fella Edwards comes along. He's talking about rising up and killing them's in charge. And Ings, he listens. And why shouldn't he? What's them toffs me to us? But Ings knows there's no chance. Who's going to stand and fight when the militia gets their rifles out, eh? But this Edwards, he says if they all get together, there's money to be had, and a thousand Irishmen all ready to fight, and a thousand Scots coming on down as soon as the word's given. Ings didn't believe him at first, but then this Edwards starts buying drink and bread and brings him to a thistlewood, and I don't know who all else... And what's he got to do all day except listen? And then suddenly he's bringing home money and bread. Says it was the big shots give it him, she added. Did you tell this to Bow Street? Torton asked. For all the good he did any of us, muttered Celia. Made my mark on the paper and all. And they still took him. And they say he's in the tower. Could be in Timbuktu for all I can get to him. We want to find Edwards, Adam told her. What do you know about him? She shrugged. He worked in plaster, models and figures, ornaments and things. Would hawk a basket load up and down the street sometimes. Where did he live? Gautier asked. All sorts of places, Ings said. Do you know where he might have gone after Cato Street? tried Adam. 
Celia sneered and spat. If I knew that, do you think he'd still be alive? It was him that tipped the nod to the soldiers and all. You know that for sure? The woman looked at him like he'd lost his mind. I've said my bit, she snapped. I've got nothing more for any of you. And I understand that, but it's important we know who gave you the money. Which of the big shots was it? She shrugged. What did it matter to me? They paid, that's all I cared about. Adam wanted to press the point, but it was clear Celia was done talking. It was even more clear from the way that the other people in the yard were beginning to turn their heads that they were close to overstaying what very little welcome they had in this place. Thank you, said Adam. Celia nodded and spat again. That way, she said, jerking her chin behind them. You'll come up in present alley. Ed, she left. Yes, I'll find your way. They all thanked her again, and in tight formation they headed up the narrow yard. The buildings leaned close overhead, all but cutting off the strip of sky. Adam tried not to hurry, or to show the unfamiliar knot of fear that was building inside him. But Celia had not steered them wrong. The yard did spill out into an alley, and to the left they could make out a proper lane. Oi! croaked a tentative voice behind them. Adam turned. There, in the alley shadows, stood the girl Mrs Ings had called Luce. She emerged into the daylight, careful as a cat, and just as ready to run. Can you get me down out of the tower? she asked. We can try, said Adam. Luce rubbed one raw red foot against the other. Ma says not to trust a gent. She says none of yous care about the likes of us. Adam made no answer to this. Celia Ings probably had plenty of reason to deliver this lecture to her children. He gone back to the shop, whispered Luce. In a cellar, hard by Carlisle's shop over in Fleet Street. Bobby Tim says he seen him. Says he's lucky it was him and what saw, cos his plenty says it was him that peached on Dino. You ever seen Edward yourself? asked Torton. Can you say what he looked like? He had a crooked back, said the child. And a long neck. Black hair, all in curls. Like mine? asked Gautier. Luce shook her head. Loose and stringy like, all around his ears, long ears, she added. Hands always white like they dipped in flour. Thank you, said Adam. Gautier bent down. Do you know where Waterby Street is? Luce considered him and then nodded. You find Mrs. Gaultier's shop there, and you go round to the back door. Tell her you talk to her man, and he says you're a good girl. She may have some work for you. Lucy's wary expression didn't shift. You be the man, then? Samson, he told her. Luce nodded. Thanks. Gautier nodded back. So did Adam. They didn't stay. In this place it would do the child no good to be seen in their company, and there was not a moment to waste. If Luce knew where Edwards had gone to ground, doubtless others did too. One of them might have already told Beecham. They might not be inside the rookery anymore, but the maze of unnamed alleys and yards was only slightly less confusing. It was Torton who took the lead. He'd haunted these byways for longer than either Adam or Gautier had been alive. A run-down stable slumped at the edge of a cluster of shops. All of them sold a full range of third- and fourth-hand items where they were not selling gin. The owner knew the name Carlyle and was able to give the shop's address as number 55. Won't find no one there, he added. Why not? asked Torton. Well, they shut it down, didn't they? Old Carlyle was one of them radicals, hung about with a nasty crowd... The stableman was also willing to provide horses to the officers as long as there was ready money, but had no conveyance for hire beyond a market wagon, even more battered than the horses. The problem here being that neither Torton nor Gautier knew how to ride. You go ahead, said Torton to Adam. Look the place over for us. We'll catch up as soon as we find a cab. The nag Adam mounted was old, ugly and bony, but mettlesome, and with a mouth like iron. But it was clearly a canny city resident, 
and when it realised Adam would not be fooled or brushed off, they proceeded well enough. And the animal was even willing to put on a burst of speed when the traffic cleared out. Soon Adam was trotting toward the fleet market and the bridge. At first glance it would seem a fool's move for a man being hunted to return to a familiar haunt, but it often worked out better than one might think. A man's home and work would be the first places searched, but then they would be left alone while the search ranged further afield. Also, it was ground the fugitive would know and understand. Most importantly, there would be friends and family willing to help. Like all of London's oldest thoroughfares, Fleet Street changed character multiple times along its length. This end was broad, winding, and crowded with carts, vans, wagons and men on horseback like Adam. The buildings were close, but not huddled. The world here drove a hard bargain and would take what it could get off the unwary, but there was a rough pride in the work and an eye to better things. Print shops jostled crabbed booksellers, gin shops mixed with coffee houses. In the middle of the noise and bustle sat number 55, Carlyle's bookshop. Squat, dark and shuttered, even in the middle of the day. Adam found a porter on the corner willing to hold his horse, and even more willing to tell Adam of the shop's travails. So banned books they did, got themselves arrested and all. Filthy French stuff, they said, and this Yankee fella pain and all sorts. I heard there was a plasterer lived with them, said Adam. Was, maybe is, dunno. His shop was around back. Thanks. Adam added another few pennies to the man's outstretched hand. Keep an eye out for two men, a tall, black man in a blue coat and tall hat, and a stout, red-faced fella in green and buff with him. You see them, you tell them what you told me, all right? The porter agreed that it was, with a sly smile and a finger laid alongside his nose, to show he looked forward to having a good story to tell when the day was done. Adam didn't intend to go inside, not until the others arrived. He meant to circle the shop at what distance he could, looking for signs of recent habitation. When Torton and Gautier got there to help cover the obvious exits, he'd go in closer. But when he found the muddy alleyway that led him to the ragged yard and the low door that was fifty-five and a half, Adam's plan changed in a heartbeat. Because despite the rest of the building being shut up tight, that low door hung wide open. Adam looked quickly about him and saw no sign of Torton and Gautier, and no knowing when they'd get there. It was a lunatic decision, and Adam knew it, but he moved forward anyway, keeping to one side of the tiny yard, trying his best to see in all directions at once. No sound came out of the doorway. No sound came from the yard or the houses on either side that did not belong there. Adam ducked down and peered into the doorway, and swore and ducked inside. A man lay face down on the floor, a dark stain spreading over the back of his buff coat. A round-crowned hat lay beside him, and a dark, shining pool spread all about him. A wickedly curved knife lay on the packed earth floor just out of reach. Adam dropped to his knees and heaved the man onto his back and swore again. It was a man with a long neck and curling black hair that hung in strings all round his ears. George Edwards was dead. Chapter 41 The Peacemaker He met her with the air of a man of gallantry who thought that his peace had been cheaply made. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda And what do I do now? That question occupied the whole of Rosalind's mind as Sanderson drove them through the streets to Mariana's house. It would not be a very long drive. The traffic was clearing as the shops closed. The fashionable hour was over, and much of the world had already gone home to prepare for an evening of parties and routs. Do I tell Mariana about Harold and Wilhelmina? It was Mariana whose interest she was engaged to uphold in this business. Mariana had her life threatened. Was there some connection between the poisoning and Harold Davenport's affair with Wilhelmina Leviton? There could very well be. 
Mr. Davenport had a great deal to lose if Mariana found out about his affair with Wilhelmina. He might be Mariana's favourite, but he was also her employee. She could not only refuse to sanction his marriage to Kate, she could dismiss him out of hand at any moment. Both Harold and Wilhelmina had been at the dinner the night Kate decided to bolt from Mariana's house. Had Kate seen something? Or said something? Or had Wilhelmina? She knew how Mariana had been poisoned, but when could they have given the poison to Kate? And how? It could not have been at dinner, or even afterward, when Wilhelmina and Kate retired to take tea as custom dictated. Wilhelmina would have presided over the teapot, but she could hardly have poisoned the tea that she herself would have to drink. Rosalind bowed her head and pinched the bridge of her nose. She did not want these possibilities in her mind. She liked Harold Davenport. She empathised with Wilhelmina's situation, and yet she could not ignore what had been done to Kate and Mariana. Of course, it was still possible that she was wrong. The affair between Wilhelmina and Harold might have nothing to do with Mariana's poisoning. A family might have many different secrets and many reasons for keeping them. The carriage turned onto Upper Brook Street. Sanderson brought the horses to a gentle halt and hopped down from the box. In his character of attentive driver, he let down the step and helped Rosalind out. Miss Thorne, called a breathless voice. Rosalind's bonnet hampered her view and she had to turn herself fully around to see Everett Leverton hurrying toward her. He was dishevelled and flushed, as if he had run or ridden too hard. Sanderson, still playing the diligent attendant, stepped between her and Mr Leverton. Have a care, fellow, he growled. Everett pulled up short. My apologies, but Miss Thorne, before you go into my aunt, I beg you, we must speak. Sanderson glanced back at Rosalind, who nodded. Sanderson stepped aside with a bow. Really, he was taking his part rather too seriously. She would have to speak with him when opportunity arose. What is it, Mr Leverton? she asked. Everett drew a deep breath. I know what you have discovered regarding Harold and Mina. The words dropped heavily between them. Rosalind barely managed to contain her surprise or dismay. We cannot stand talking in the street, she told him. We will be noticed and remarked on. Yes, of course, agreed Everett. But you will let me talk with you first before you go upstairs. Rosalind nodded her assent. Good, excellent, thank you. Let us go inside. Your man can see to your equipage. Of course. I should only be an hour, Fawkes. Sanderson was not the only one who could play a part. He bowed, his face entirely serious. Miss Thorne. Everett showed Rosalind inside. The maid came for her outdoor things. She had just removed her coat when Beatrice came hurrying down the stairs. Oh, Miss Thorne, she cried. My maid said you'd arrived. Have you discovered anything new about Kate? Not yet, Mrs. Leverton, said Rosalind. Has there been another letter here, perhaps? No, nothing. Beatrice's cheeks were flushed. She carried a crumpled handkerchief and her eyes were bright red. Mother, Everett stepped up to her side and put his arm around her shoulders. Surely you should rest. Beatrice shook her head violently. I cannot. I had thought that if only I could know she was safe, I'd be able to rest. But she squeezed her handkerchief more tightly, as if she were attempting to wring reassurance straight from the cloth. With no word, no hint of where she is. But I have thought of something, though I wish to God I had not. She stopped and started again. The maid, Miss Thorne, the one who corrupted my daughter. What if she discovered that Kate had returned to London? What if she has managed to get her hooks into my daughter again? Rosalind bit her tongue. I'm sure that's not what's happened, mother, said Everett. How would she have heard? These people have their ways, said Beatrice coldly. You were the one who pointed that out at the beginning. Rosalind felt her jaw clench. Everett seemed to have said a good deal at the beginning, and all of it at Amelia's expense. Kate, she is a good girl, Miss Thorne, Beatrice went on, but she has a trusting nature, and this McGowan creature, she was so plausible, so insinuating. She induced Kate to steal for her. Were you told that? Steal from her own family? Rosalind hoped the blank expression on her face would be taken for shock. Everett looked at Rosalind. 
Rosalind had seldom in her life been in danger of dissolving into true hysterics, but the combination of outrage and maddeningly inappropriate laughter that rose in her throat threatened to push her over that precipice. Thank you, Mrs. Leverton. Rosalind was astonished at how steady her voice remained. What you say is a possibility, and you may be sure I have not neglected it. There now, mother, you see, said Everett brightly. Miss Thorne has everything in hand. Will you go rest now? He took both of his mother's hands and pressed them gently. Rosalind fastened her gaze on the wall and the landscape painting that hung over the umbrella stand. Kate will need you more than ever when she's returned to us, Everett was saying softly to his mother. You won't be able to care for her if you've worried yourself into an illness. I know, I know, Beatrice kissed her son's cheek. What you must think of me? I think you love Kate, said Everett, as we all do. Yes, yes, and you are, of course, right. Rosalind could hear from Beatrice's voice she was attempting to compose herself. I will go up to my room, and I think I will be able to rest now. Miss Thorne, you will excuse me. Yes, of course, said Rosalind. I'll go up with you, said Everett. Miss Thorne, have you seen my aunt's picture gallery yet? He nodded down the hallway. It's right at the end. She has some very fine works, I believe. Thank you. I believe I will take a look, said Rosalind. While Everett helped his mother solicitously up the stairs, Rosalind retreated down the central hallway to the round gallery. She paced the room slowly, paying little attention to the artwork that hung on the walls. She needed to calm herself and to focus her mind. She could be angry on Amelia's behalf later. Right now, I cannot give any hint I know her. She was repeating this to herself when Everett joined her. He stood beside her, although at a proper distance, and they both made a show of contemplating the landscape in front of them. Doubtlessly, Sanderson could have told her all about the artist, and whether it was any good. "'Tell me more about this maid your mother is so concerned with,' she said. "'Did she really convince Kate to steal for her? I have never heard of such a thing.' "'Yes, well,' murmured Everett. "'It's easier for mother to believe that than to believe Kate did what she did of her own volition.' He strolled casually to the next painting, a formal portrait of a lady in a lace gown and tall wig. I must beg you, Miss Thorne, to tread carefully around my mother. She loves her daughter, said Rosalind. A little too much, perhaps, said Everett. When he saw Rosalind's surprise, he smiled a little. Does that shock you? It happens sometimes, you know. Kate was always mother's favourite. She could do no wrong. I was jealous, I think. His smile was fleeting. She'd dreamed of such a perfect future for her perfect girl. That must have been a great deal of pressure on Kate. Do you know I believe it was? Regardless, losing Kate once and then losing her husband and then losing Kate again like this, it's just been too much for her. I understand, said Rosalind. Do you? Scepticism filled Everett's words. Do you understand that my mother can't bring herself to blame Kate for anything? She lost four girls between me and Kate, and for the first couple of years we weren't sure Kate was going to live. After that, mother doted on her, could barely stand to let Kate out of her sight, and whenever Kate got into trouble, well, all Kate had to do was say it was someone else's fault and mother would believe her. Did Kate do this a great deal? Get into trouble? Or tell tales? Both. Everett sighed. Yes, I'm afraid she did. It wasn't entirely her fault, of course. I mean, she was a child, and if it was a choice between getting into trouble, especially with father, or telling a lie... Yes, of course. Rosalind moved to the next painting. This one was a still life of a brass vase full of flowers. Fallen petals lay scattered on a damask cloth. You must not think my parents were wicked or careless... They loved us all, and they did their best according to their lights. It can be difficult to see such things from outside, but I assure you it was so. Rosalind nodded. And did you decide it would be easier for your mother to continue to believe that a servant corrupted her daughter than that Kate chose to leave on her own? Everett's brows lowered. I think that, Miss Thorne, is not your business. 
I apologise, she said immediately. Everett bowed his head, letting her know he accepted her apology. Rosalind stared hard at the still life until she was sure of her voice again. May I ask, Mr Leverton, how did you know where I had been this afternoon? I saw you, he said, because I'd gone to the same place. You were following Wilhelmina? Following you, actually, he said, and there was the tiniest trace of smugness in his words. He paused, clearly expecting some display of outrage, or at least surprise. But Rosalind simply regarded him with her usual polite, cool gaze. You will have to forgive me, Miss Thorne, said Everett, but you were engaged by Aunt Mariana and Mother to find Kate. I don't understand how this private business between Wilhelmina and Harold can have any bearing on that, he paused. Unless you're playing a double game. Rosalind held her tongue, hoping her silence would be mistaken for surprise at this discovery. You are, Everett exclaimed in a hoarse whisper. Did Mariana set you on their trail? Or were we all mistaken in how you came to be here? Or was it Kate who engaged you to take Harold's measure while she made herself scarce to throw us off? None of these things, I promise you, replied Rosalind calmly. Then how? It can't have been Marcus who brought you here. Forgive me, but even if he could be so far gone with his desire for revenge that he'd actually gather evidence of Crimcon, he'd never hire a woman for the job. Crimcon was the popular term for criminal conversation, what the law called adultery. Mr Leverton, said Rosalind firmly, I trust you will understand that I cannot betray this particular confidence. I beg your pardon. Naturally you cannot. But you don't intend to tell Marcus, do you? I mean, Kate, I suppose, has a right to know what her fiancé is up to. It really is too bad of Harold to be carrying on like this, but if Marcus finds out, I'm not exaggerating, Miss Thorne. Not only will he throw Wilhelmina out into the street, but he'll lodge a crim-con suit against Harold and take him for everything he has. Criminal conversation was a peculiar and infuriating aspect of English law. The idea being that since a wife's body belonged exclusively to her husband, if another man had intimate relations with her, he was, in effect, robbing her husband, and he, in return, had the right to sue for property damage. Is your brother so litigious? asked Rosalind. Most men would do anything rather than suffer the embarrassment of publicly admitting their wife had been unfaithful. Lord, yes! Eight years ago, he had a man thrown into debtor's prison over a sum of fifty pounds. The man's still there, and he might never get out, because Marcus swears he won't forgive the debt. Rosalind suppressed a shudder. I'd become aware of Mina keeping company with Harold some months ago. I begged her to break it off. I warned her Marcus was not the most imaginative of men, but he was not a fool. If he discovered them, he would not treat her any better than he had treated Kate. His voice shook. Does Mariana know? asked Rosalind. Good Lord, no. She'd never have tried to match Kate to Harold if she did. However highly she may regard him, she can't abide a cheat. Rosalind nodded. Mr Davenport indicated that marrying Kate was his own idea and that Mariana's offer of a settlement came afterward. Is that true? I still do not understand what this has to do with finding Kate, Everett said. Rosalind faced him directly. Mr. Leverton, before you asked how I am engaged here, I told you I could not betray that confidence. I may, however, tell you that the matter is a complicated and delicate one. I may also say that I am doing all I can to protect both Mariana and Kate. I believe they have both been put at risk of grave harm. Everett considered her for a long while. Rosalind made no attempt to fill the silence or redirect his regard. He did not entirely trust her, and she did not blame him. She had given him very little reason for trust. For all his foolishness, he was an intelligent man. A wounded one, too. He also had grown up in a harsh household, and had lost his father, struggled against his brother, and loved his sister and his mother and now he lived through this latest rift and was surrounded by secrets. Extraordinary, he murmured. And yet, I think I believe you. 
Rosalind hoped he did not hear her long exhalation of breath. The answer to your question is that the engagement between Harold and Kate was Mariana's idea from the first. I think if Kate had showed aptitude for an independent life, our aunt would have left her to find her own road. But Kate, well, Kate has not got a head for business or art or writing, any such thing. So I think Aunt Mariana looked for a way to help her to a future. And what would be better than uniting her two favourites? Especially as neither had a particular emotional entanglement. Or so it seemed, he added ruefully. Rosalind nodded. On the face of it, it was a perfectly reasonable arrangement. Appearances would be maintained for all concerned. Mariana could make a gift that would do a great deal of good for her favourites, and to the larger world, that gift would appear highly laudable. That meant it would be likely to survive should Kate's litigious brother decide to try to find a way to drag the matter into court. Further, if Kate were married to Harold, Harold had charge of her and any fortune she might possess. That put her and her money entirely out of her brother's reach. Does your mother approve of Harold Davenport? asked Rosalind. Oh, yes, said Everett, very much. I think she hopes that she'll be able to go live with him and Kate once they're married. Rosalind imagined the possibility of living with her beloved daughter rather than her cold and jealous son must be an exciting prospect for Beatrice. She found herself wondering if Beatrice knew about the affair and had, so far, kept it to herself. Well, Everett was saying, you should probably go see Aunt Mariana. From what the nurse says, you may not have many more chances to speak with her, he added. When Harold comes home, I'll have a word with him. Perhaps you should not, just yet, Mr Leviton. There is a great deal about the present situation we do not know, and tensions are very high. Everett looked at her steadily, and Rosalind thought she saw a spark of anger in the depths of his worried eyes. I will think about it, he said. But Aunt Mariana is waiting for you, Miss Thorne, and you must not disappoint. There is one other question I would ask you, Mr Leviton, if I may. A spasm of impatience crossed his features, only to be quickly smoothed away into an attitude of attention. I am told you organised a dinner for the family the night Kate chose to leave her home. Was it your hope to help mend the breach? Well, you are partly right, Miss Thorne, he replied. I did organise things, or at least I tried to. But as to why it happened, frankly, you would have to ask Marcus that. It was his idea. Chapter 42 A Few Pointed Questions I know that this must appear to you extravagant, but depend upon it that what I tell you is true. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda Alice returned home from her private errands in a foul mood. Nothing was improved by finding the foyer dark and silent. George, she called. Amelia? She barely had time to frown and strip off her gloves when Mrs Singh appeared at the top of the stairs. Miss Alice, if you'd come up, please, I need a word with you. Alice pulled off coat and bonnet, dropping them both on the seat of the bench beside the door. She grabbed her hems and ran upstairs, not caring that her half-boots were shedding mud all the way. Something's happened to Amelia. Something's happened to Rosalind, to George. When she got to the top of the stairs, she saw Mrs Singh standing in front of the door to Kate's room with her arms folded. Inside, both Amelia and Kate were sitting beside the bed, as guilty as a pair of schoolgirls caught rifling the headmistress's desk. Alice's fear turned abruptly to annoyance. What is going on? she demanded. Mrs Singh pointed her calloused finger at Kate. This one seems to have been entertaining a thief. Alice made herself listen to the story of a person who came to the door, of George being called away because the baby was on its way, and how that person simply walked into the house and ran out again with a valise belonging to Miss Kate, if she can be called so. And that was after knocking Mrs Singh to the floor. Alice knew full well what Rosalind would have done. She would have sat down, possibly called for tea, and calmly sorted through these various occurrences. She might even have gone so far as to call them distressing. Alice favoured a different approach. What have you done? she bellowed at Kate. 
We took you in. We sheltered you when someone out there was trying to poison you, and this is what you do. I'm sorry, whispered Kate. I never meant for her to come here. I was planning to leave. Right away. You can ask Amelia. Alice glowered at Amelia. And where were you while we were being robbed? And don't tell me it was the market, because I won't believe you. Amelia didn't even look up. She... Kate... Send me to buy her a ticket for the stage to Edinburgh. Alice clenched her fists and gritted her teeth. Get hold of yourself, Alice. She made herself face the cook. Mrs. Singh, are you all right? she asked. Mrs. Singh drew herself up. I am well enough. Good. Do you mind staying with Kate? I need to have a few words with Amelia. I should say. It was the most difficult thing Amelia had ever done, but she followed Miss Alice into her book room and closed the door behind them. When she turned around, Alice was staring into the fire, her arms crossed tightly in front of her. Miss Alice, Amelia began, but Miss Alice turned so abruptly that her words were cut off. Amelia fully expected Alice to begin shouting immediately, but instead she stalked over to the table with the remains of a basket of muffins and a pot of tea. She took up one of the muffins and speared it onto a toasting fork. Would you like one? She held up the fork to demonstrate what she was talking about. There's jam and butter. She waved the fork and the muffin towards the tray. I think the nicest thing about living with Rosalind is she never makes a fuss about toasting muffins. My mother used to positively howl if she caught us, and you should have heard the teachers at school. She plumped herself down in her chair and held the muffin over the fire. No, oh, thank you, miss, whispered Amelia. You've had your tea? said Miss Alice to the fire. Yes, miss. Good. Alice pulled the muffin from the fire and dropped it carefully onto a crumb-covered plate. Then you can tell me exactly what on earth you were thinking, lying to me all this time. Amelia felt her jaw drop. I don't. I never. Not much. Not much! The force of her shout pulled Miss Alice to her feet. You stole! That's why you got thrown out of your last job. Not because they caught you kissing Kate, because they caught you stealing. And it wasn't the first time. Who told you that? Amelia demanded. But as soon as the words were out of her mouth, she knew it was the wrong thing to say. Miss Alice's eyes blazed like fury. Alice took a step forward. Amelia imagined she could feel the heat of her anger burning through the air between them. I used to be a newspaper woman. Do you think I can't find things out? she demanded. I went to the registry office and I got the references they have on file for you and I spoke to the women whose names are on them or I should say I spoke to one because the other one doesn't exist and neither does the address you gave. Amelia felt like there was a hand around her throat. She couldn't breathe. She tried to speak but all that came out was a small choking noise. And you know what the woman I did speak to told me? She said you were dismissed for thieving and she never wrote that reference. Good God, Amelia, how on earth did you find a registry that wouldn't check? Most of them don't, she mumbled. They say they do, but they don't. Too much bother. She felt tears prickle at the back of her eyes. She couldn't cry, not now, not when Miss Alice wouldn't believe it was real. I trusted you. Tears streamed down Miss Alice's cheeks. Rosalind trusted you. We counted ourselves so lucky to have found a girl who wasn't frightened by what she does and who could fall right in with our household, and it was because you were a thief. Amelia lifted her eyes. Her face flushed, but not with shame, with anger. Yes, all right, I stole. You don't have any idea what it's like being an upstairs maid, she croaked. Oh, yeah, you get a cot in a drafty attic, and you get to eat the family's leavings. But there's the cost of uniforms, and if you've broken anything at all and money to be sent home to help Mum, and half the times the family in the house don't bother to pay you at the end of the year, or invent excuses not to. So you pick up things sometimes, here and there. Amelia's words broke off in a sharp, choking sound. Alice folded her arms and did not let herself move, however much she wanted to. She said she loved me, said Amelia. She told me she wanted to run away. That was all I ever wanted. Run away from home, run away from service, from everything. She wiped at her eyes with the heel of her hand. But there was no money. I told her I knew what to do if she'd help. And she said yes. 
and so we... She turned beet red. She picked things up at the party she went to. Little things, snuff boxes and ear bobs. These people have so much. Alice's glare didn't flicker. I sold on what she stole. There's plenty of pawn shops that won't ask questions for just a little extra. Sometimes she came with me to see. She liked the adventure. She swallowed. It became, I don't know, fun. I felt like Robin Hood or Dick Turpin or one of them. I guess when she was off in Bath, she kept at it on her own. She bit her lip. I don't know who that woman was who came here, the one Mrs. Singh talked about. I swear to you, I don't. I just wanted to help Kate because... because... She choked again. I wanted to help her get away. When Miss Alice spoke again, her voice was low and cold. Did you feel anything for me? Or did you just realise you could... that I would... No, cried Amelia. I... you're everything to me. When you're in the room, sometimes I can't think straight. I feel so much. She pressed her fist against her chest. I lie awake nights thinking about you, about us. I'd stuff the pillow in my face and cry because I'm so afraid you'll find out what I really am. And now you have, and I want to die. Alice said nothing. The silence stretched. Amelia's thoughts were pulling in a hundred different directions. She didn't know what to think. She didn't know what to say. All she could do was stand there and wait and hope. And the hope hurt worse than despair. Have you ever stolen from Rosalind? Miss Alice demanded. Amelia shook her head. From me? Amelia lifted her eyes, mute. What? Amelia reached into her apron pocket. She pulled out a handkerchief and held it out. Miss Alice's beautiful eyes widened. It had your scent on it, Amelia told her. I keep it under my pillow. Miss Alice stared at the square of linen and then looked away. But Amelia saw the tears spilling down her cheeks. I don't forgive you, she announced. No, miss. I don't know if I ever shall. Yes, miss, said Amelia. Her voice quavered. And I want to be perfectly clear. If I ever catch you lying to me again, I shall be the one to throw you out on your ear, even if we are in a moving carriage. Do you understand me? Yes, miss. Amelia's voice trembled again. She could not tell if it was because she was about to begin bawling or laugh out loud because it wasn't over. Not yet. Because Miss Alice believed. She might not understand, not yet, but she believed. And that was what mattered. And when Rosalind gets home, you are going to tell her absolutely everything you know about all the Levitons. She probably knows it all anyway, but she'll want to hear it from you. Yes, miss. And you stop calling me miss. Yes, Alice. Alice let out a long, shuddering breath. Amelia found that her heart seemed to have steadied which was a promising sign. Now, what about this valise? Alice asked. The one Mrs. Singh said was stolen. What do you know about that? Amelia stared at Alice's handkerchief and then at Alice herself. She tucked the kerchief into her apron pocket. If she took it out of Kate's room, it would be the bag that Kate had asked me to hold on to for her last week, with her clothes and things in it. Do you know why anyone would care about that? Amelia was aware that Alice was watching her closely. She surely saw the struggle going on in Amelia's heart. You have to decide. You have to decide right now. Amelia took a deep breath. It's got a false bottom, she said. I found it when... Well, I found it and there was a bunch of jewellery hidden inside. So this woman, she broke in to steal the jewels, cried Alice. Amelia felt a cheeky grin spread slowly across her face. Well, 
If she did, she's in for a bit of a surprise, Alice. Chapter 43 A Small Matter of Money My fortune was the most convenient thing in the world to a man in his condition. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda As soon as Mrs. Hepplewhite admitted Rosalind, Mrs. Leverton exclaimed, Miss Thorne, I beg of you, tell me you have some news. Mrs. Leverton was on the lounge in her private sitting room, a pile of books and correspondence waited on the table at her elbow. As Rosalind took the tapestry chair she was waved toward, Mrs. Leverton tossed down the letter she'd been reading. I'm about to go mad, Mrs. Leverton declared, and poor Hepplewhite cannot endure me much longer. We may have spoiled one attempt on my life, but I swear she is set to finish the job. Mrs. Hepplewhite listened to this declaration with an air of patient stoicism. I confess, Mrs. Leverton, I'm not at all sure what I have to tell you. Come, come, Miss Thorne, that will not do. You cannot mean to say with all this time you've discovered nothing at all. Rosalind thought to point out it had been scarcely a single day since she had last spoken with Mariana, but she decided that it would not be productive. It is my experience, Mrs. Leverton, that if a person is driven to a drastic action, they must believe both that they have a great deal to gain and that they have no other choice. That would seem sensible. What I have not been able to resolve thus far is the question of a gain, which leads me to a delicate question. Are you about to ask me about my last will and testament, Miss Thorne? Rosalind nodded. I see. So we have abandoned politics for the consideration of simple greed. Mariana folded her hands on her lap. Well, that is much less interesting and, may I say, a blow to my sense of self-importance. However, I imagine that despite what the novelists would have us believe, the simplest answer is most often correct. That, generally speaking, is the case. So, my will. I've made no secret of it. I have left an income to Beatrice and another to Kate, because I cannot trust Marcus to properly care for either one. What about Everett? Everett has the means to make his own way in the world. He has, as of yet, chosen not to do so. I do not feel the need to support this choice with any legacy. She does not like to be disappointed. Honoria's observation echoed in Rosalind's mind. At the same time, she could not blame Mariana for her choice. Beyond that, I have placed everything in a trust and named my attorneys as its executors. The businesses and properties are to be sold. I have given my managers first options to purchase. The monies are then to be used in the support and furtherance of a series of political and charitable organisations. And your family knows of your decisions? I have been very frank with all of them. I had hoped candour would prevent any of them borrowing against their expectations or hanging about waiting for me to close my eyes. I seem to have failed in that end, she added bitterly. And you left nothing to Harold Davenport in your will. He will have the option to purchase a controlling share in the mines he manages, but otherwise no. So he will only have outright ownership if he marries Kate. That is correct, and yes, he knows that. And this arrangement is not part of your will. Mrs. Leverton's eyes narrowed. You do not mean to accuse Mr. Davenport of this... this outrage? I do not mean to accuse anyone, said Rosalind, because I do not yet know enough. I will say that if the motivation for the poisonings is gain, Mr. Davenport seems to be the last person who would take such a step. His clearest route to his fortune rests with you and Kate. But it is you and Kate who were poisoned. So we are back to the beginning. It is difficult to know admitted Rosalind. It may be the answer has already been presented, but we do not yet understand it. Mrs. Leverton snorted loudly. That, Miss Thorne, smells badly of humbug and frustration. Despite everything, Rosalind felt herself smile. Perhaps frustration. I hope that I have banished humbug from my daily life. There is no shame in a little humbug as a seasoning. It is the duty we must pay to convention. It is my understanding that you have never been one to deal in convention, 
said Rosalind. Mariana smiled sadly. I did my best to eschew it when I was younger. Those, however, were different times, Miss Thorne. Better times. A woman could get away with a great deal if she did it with style. And I had style. Her back straightened at the memories. We rode and we drove and drank in the taverns and made all the gentlemen stare. Is that how you met Mr. Leverton? Would it shock you if I said yes? We'd made a wager, Colin and I, over a horse race, and as it happened, I won. He said he'd never met anyone like me and that I would save his life. Her eyes grew distant, and I decided to believe him, and I never once regretted it. Rosalind let the silence sit so that Mariana could hold her private memory for a moment. At last, she shook herself, coming fully back to the present. But none of this is to the point, Miss Thorne, she said, with an air of mild accusation. My apologies, said Rosalind. I did mean to ask you. I understand there was a family dinner the night Kate disappeared. Yes, I heard something of that. I had hoped to attend, but... In the end, I was too weak. Wilhelmina told me Everett arranged it, but Everett told me that it was Marcus's idea. What could that possibly have to do with anything? asked Mariana. It is a question of timing, Rosalind told her. Kate says she was well up until dinner time and only became ill afterward. It is therefore probable that any poison was administered to her during the dinner. How would that even be done without poisoning the whole party? I don't know that yet. But if the dinner was arranged to bring Kate into a situation where the poison could be administered... Yes, yes, Mrs. Leverton murmured. Her hands began plucking at her quilts in an agitated rhythm. Forgive me, Miss Thorne, she said. That Marcus would poison me, I can believe. Rather too easily, as it happens. But that he would poison his own sister. So... It was Marcus who arranged the dinner. That is what Beatrice said. She believed he was trying to reconcile himself to Harold and Kate's marriage. She and Everett had put it to him that not only would the marriage tend to remove any lingering suspicions about Kate's character, but Harold might be more amenable to materially helping with Marcus's various business ventures than I had been especially if such donations would smooth relations with his bride's family. Mrs. Leverton cocked her head toward Rosalind. You appear frustrated, Miss Thorne. I admit that I am, said Rosalind. I had believed that money must be at the root of this matter, but I may have been mistaken. Well, I cannot blame you, said Mariana. I would hardly be the first wicked old lady done in for her fortune which leaves one remaining possibility for someone to wish for your death, or Kate's. What is that? Rosalind met Mrs. Leverton's inquiring gaze. Secrets. She drew in a deep breath. I had hoped I would not have to tell you this. However, one thing I've been able to ascertain for certain is that Mr. Davenport is carrying on a romantic affair with Wilhelmina Leverton. No, snapped Mariana. Rosalind said nothing. Harold would not be such an inconsiderate idiot. Furthermore, he knows perfectly well that if Marcus ever found out, he'd be dragged into court. Not to mention what I would do to him, she added grimly. I will not bear a cheat or a liar. I do not care who the man is or how I may have regarded him previously. Outrage shook her voice and lit a dangerous spark in her eyes. It was Everett who told you this, wasn't it? If you hadn't noticed, Miss Thorne, Everett is not above lying to accomplish his goals. What reason would Everett have to lie about a liaison between Harold and Wilhelmina? Who knows? snapped Mariana. I certainly do not know. I am imprisoned in here and must pretend to be dying lest I be poisoned at my next meal. I am employing you to find these answers, Miss Thorne, not to subject me to pointless interrogation. Forgive me. Rosalind got to her feet. And I thank you for your patience. I will return when I have something of substance to tell you. See that you do. 
I warn you, Miss Thorne, this week of yours is strictly on the condition you produce genuine results. I may yet decide to withdraw my support for this deception of yours. Rosalind curtsied and left her there. Out in the hallway, she took a moment to catch her breath and compose her features. She was conscious of a sinking disappointment. She had felt it before. It came when an answer she had sought was both certain and unwelcome. Marianna Leverton had made it very plain that whatever her relationship with Harold Davenport might be, it was not simply that of a trusted employee, or even that of a husband's beloved favourite. It was the secret Marianna kept. Possibly that they both kept. And that secret might be dangerous enough to Mr. Davenport or to another member of the family that they would use any means to keep it from becoming known. Chapter 44 Desperate Measures He is one of those men who require great emotions. Fine lovers these make for stage effect, but the worst husbands in the world. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda when Fran opened the door to the flat, she felt in fine fettle. Had she been less of a lady, she might have whistled. But the instant she stepped inside, all her good feelings vanished. Jack was in the chair in front of the fire, doubled over in open and obvious pain. My God, Jack! She dropped the valise and ran to his side. She pushed on his shoulders to sit him up. That was when she saw the blood all over his shirt and waistcoat. What? She backed away and looked reflexively at her own hands. There was blood on her palms as well. Don't worry, Fran, he said through gritted teeth. It's not mine. Well, most of it isn't, he added. Show me, she demanded. Jack shifted in his seat to show her his side. Coat, waistcoat and shirt were all torn. So was the flesh underneath. The long, ragged cut had begun to crust and blacken. Fran swallowed her gorge and stomped across the flat to get her work basket and the bottle of brandy they kept in the pantry for both celebrations and emergencies. The better part of an hour later, Jack was stitched as tight as she could manage and had drunk the part of the brandy that had not gone to soaking the needle and thread. Fran's mother had always told her that soaking the needle in spirits helped dull the pain and speed healing. Fran didn't know if she believed that, but now was not the time to question such things. She also helped ease Jack into his other shirt and coat. Thanks, Franny, he breathed as he eased himself back in the chair and drank down the last of the brandy. Fran straightened up, wiped her hands on the ruin of his other shirt and then clouted him hard on the ear. Ah, oh, Franny, cried Jack. You fool man, she roared. What have you been doing? Jack actually looked sheepish. Getting us in trouble, I'm afraid, Franny. As if that wasn't obvious. What sort of trouble? Jack licked his lips. Fran tried to brace herself. Whatever it was, it was going to be extra bad this time. Edwards is dead. Fran felt her jaw drop. You're joking! I wish I was, he said grimly. I found him hold up in his old shop. I told him not to fuss and just come along quiet, that there were men who wanted a word, he'd be paid for his time. Jack lifted his head. Turns out the bastard was waiting for me. He had a knife ready. It was only luck that he caught me coat on his first pass instead of a carving a fillet out of my side. Fran said nothing. We fought. I got the knife away from him and he came at me again and he winced. Well, that was that. That was that, she said, her voice perfectly even and deathly cold. You went and killed the man that was going to bring us a thousand pounds. And now the Redbreasts really will be looking for you. You're going to have to leave the country. Jack smiled sadly. I was thinking Paris this time. Fran paced across the flat. She should just leave him here, take the goods and just go. 
Start over with just Jenny C and the girls, and never mind men and their stupid antics and their stupid promises and stupid handsome faces. She glowered at Jack, pale as death in his chair, by their tiny smoky hearth. Serve him right if I did go. But then he turned and he looked at her, and she saw again the one person, man or woman, who'd never run out on her. Never asked more of her than she could give, never once betrayed her secrets by night or day. Stupid, unsteady, sweet-talking, pretty Jack Beecham was the one thing she could really count on. Well, aren't you lucky one of us was thinking ahead, Fran growled, and went to pick up the valise from where she dropped it. Jack smiled, a beatific grin that was half delight and as much brandy. I knew you'd see us through, said Jack. How much did you get? All of it. Fran set the valise down on the rickety table next to Jack's chair and opened the catch. Very considerate girl is our Kate. She kept it all packed up and ready to go. She lifted out one of the lumpy brown paper packages and tugged open the knot in the twine. The paper came open. Fran Finch screamed at the top of her lungs as lumps of coal tumbled out across the table and onto the floor. Chapter 45 Never Truly Passed Scandal, like death, is common to all. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda With some difficulty, Rosalind convinced Sanderson to leave her at her sister's door she assured him that Charlotte had a carriage and driver of her own and that she would see Rosalind got safely home. Further, she promised she would write to him immediately so he could come and hear the conclusion of today's inquiries. I declare I shall not be able to rest a single minute until you do, he told her. Now, a footman in plain livery showed her to Charlotte's private sitting room. Rosalind, Charlotte cried as she entered. I must say I had quite despaired of you. I'm very sorry to be calling so late. Rosalind quickly leaned down and embraced her sister so she did not have to rise from the sofa where she was lounging with her feet up before a good, clear fire. How are you? Very well, as it happens, Charlotte replied, settling onto her pile of pillows and resting one protective hand on her swollen belly. Charlotte's pregnancy was the only reason she remained in town. Her fond husband had planned that they should live in the country but like many a new father, he found himself anxious for his wife's health and discovered a grave distrust of country doctors. As a result, Charlotte was undergoing her confinement in a London house that was only one street away from Harvey Street, which had recently become a byword for the most reputable of medical men. My dearest hovers over me like an old woman, Charlotte went on, as Rosalind settled herself in the overstuffed chair opposite her so they could talk comfortably and the doctors are constantly amazed both by my consistent health and his insistent worries. For some years, Charlotte had been a sought-after courtesan, first in Paris and then in London. But her final protector, who had made his fortune in India, was an older, childless man, and when Charlotte fell pregnant with his child, he determined to marry her and provide the child with a home and a mother and legitimacy all in one fell indulgent swoop. That said, Charlotte continued, I will confess that I am tired. My feet swell, and I'm prone to tears. But I am assured that's all shockingly normal. In a month's time, you should be an aunt. It was, Rosalind felt, almost too much to contemplate. Yet another new, irritating irrationality to deal with. Are you afraid? Rosalind asked. Terrified said Charlotte simply. Are you sorry? Now her sister looked startled. About what? Rosalind opened her mouth and closed it again. What you've lost. What you might lose. That you might be an invalid if the birth is hard. That you might die. That he might leave you after all. I don't know, said Charlotte quietly. But I am content. I made my decision for my own reasons. What happens next will happen, and I will meet that as well. Yes. Charlotte frowned. 
and for a moment she was entirely the older sister Rosalind knew from her childhood, with the cutting wit and unforgiving eye. What's the matter? Nothing. Well, no, it's... Rosalind closed her mouth to cut off her stammering. I am disappointed in myself. Why? Because I can't do what you just said. I can't make my own decision for my own reasons. All I can do is cry and be angry and afraid, and I can't make myself stop. Charlotte laughed. Rosalind drew herself up. Oh, dear, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I apologise, Rosalind. Come back down. I came here looking for help. Which was hard enough, I am well aware. No, Rosalind, don't. She held up her hand. I am sorry. I shouldn't have laughed, and had I not been so jealous of you, I might not have. Jealous? That you have so much in your life to choose from? It doesn't feel that way. I'm sure it doesn't. But it's the truth. You have made a life that offers you a kind of freedom that leaves much to envy. Independence is not a quality much valued in a woman, as I should know. Rosalind said nothing. Charlotte's mouth twisted up into a tight smile. But the kind of independence I created has a very short span. I knew from the start that I must either quickly make enough money to last me the rest of my days, or I must find a man to keep me permanently. I was not able to do the one, but thankfully I did do the other. Rosalind felt distinctly that it would do neither one of them any good if she peered at that statement too closely. So she did not. But you do at least care for him, I thought. Oh, yes, said Charlotte comfortably. He is a good man and faithful to me. But would he be so faithful if I also could not or would not give him what he really wants? She rubbed her hand over the curve of her belly. Or if something goes wrong and the babe does not thrive? Oh, Charlotte, began Rosalind. But nothing will go wrong, said Charlotte quickly. It will be a few hours of mess and inconvenience, and then my child will enter into a very comfortable world, and both our futures will be entirely secure. Yes, agreed Rosalind firmly. I have every faith in you, Charlotte, and your child. They smiled at each other, and Rosalind decided now was the time to change the subject. George Littlefield's wife is also expecting any moment now. Would a letter of congratulations be welcome, do you think? Charlotte was not ashamed of the life she had led previously, but she was also keenly aware it created a gulf between her and much of what was termed polite society. I believe it would. Then I shall write one, and you can see it delivered. Now, Charlotte frowned at her again. You are looking entirely done in, Rosalind. I hope you are planning to stay for supper. I did not mean to stay, only Charlotte cut her off with one sharp gesture. If you wish to talk to me, you will also eat. This child has made me entirely ravenous, and I cannot eat unless you do. Well, then I cannot possibly refuse. Excellent. Maud, Charlotte turned to the waiting maid. You may tell Cook it will be two for supper after all. While Charlotte was not in anything resembling close confinement, she was clearly enjoying this time of informality that her pregnancy had brought her. Instead of the two of them going down to the dining room, a small army of footmen brought a trestle table and cloths up to the sitting room. There followed an array of dishes. Sole in cream sauce, stewed capon, asparagus, onion tart, and a compote of preserved fruits served with custard to finish. Thankfully, remarked Charlotte, my doctors do not believe in a reducing diet while pregnant. Indeed, one of them specifically said that, in his opinion, an expectant mother required more nourishment than usual, not less. I could have kissed him, she added, as she helped herself to another slice of tart and more capon. At last, the table was removed, and they returned to their places before the fire, with cups of tea and sweet cakes to nibble. There now, declared Charlotte, as the maid finished adjusting her pillows. You are looking yourself again, Rosalind. So... Tell me what's really brought you all the way out here. I really did want to see you, Rosalind told her, and to know how you were doing. Well, I'm sure it's true since you say so, but what else is there? What else? Rosalind watched the fire for a moment, attempting to put her thoughts in order. 
you used to spend a great deal of time in Bath, she said. In my previous life, yes, but I haven't been back since last summer. Thankfully, my husband doesn't care for watering holes. I'm wondering if you ever heard anything about Mariana Leverton. Good heavens, Rosalind, Charlotte exclaimed. Have you become involved with Mrs. Leverton? I take it you've heard of her, replied Rosalind. In a place where half the women were trying to live down some scandal or the other, Mariana Leverton was positively infamous. Drove her own carriage, did her own business, at least as far as the law would allow, was a famous shot. It was even rumoured that she rode horseback in trousers. Rosalind arched her brows in mock surprise. Charlotte nodded solemnly. This was some years ago, of course, but the stories positively swirled wherever she went. Was there ever any talk of her having a natural child? Now it was Charlotte's turn to look surprised. That's what you'll hear about. I know it sounds like I'm digging for common gossip, but it's important. Well, let me think. Charlotte placed her hand on her rounded belly and rubbed it back and forth slowly. Rosalind watched, wondering what it would feel like to have that second life inside, wondering how Charlotte remained calm, how she would face the very real possibility that everything could go wrong, that the child could die, that she could die, that her life, changed forever, might become unbearable in ways that could not be guessed at. Rosalind knew her fear verged on the hysterical, but such things did happen, every day. Yes, said Charlotte, at last. There was something. A gentleman I was entertaining, we went to a concert. I can't even remember who was singing. He was much older, glad to be seen with a pretty and popular girl. Not too demanding. But at the end, after the applause, the crowds were leaving. Marianna Leverton, well, she was not Leverton then, but she swept past us on the arm of a fairly good-looking man. The gentleman I was with, he saw her and said, Good Lord, I wonder if the fellow knows what he's getting. Naturally, I teased him about it, and he demurred, but in the end he told me Marianna... I can't remember what he said her given name was. I'm positive this baby has taken up all my wits, but she had run completely wild as a girl, and in the end she had to be sent away for about nine months. Yes, murmured Rosalind. I thought it might be so. Is this one of your particular inquiries? Charlotte asked. I'm afraid so. I... Do you remember, Charlotte, what Mariana Leverton's given name was? She frowned. I'm sorry. I don't remember. It was something odd, like messenger... She wrinkled her brow. No, Herald. That was it. Mariana Herald. Chapter 46 The Cause of Contradictions If a person kills another in a fray, with a concealed weapon, ma'am, by a sword, in a cane, for instance, tis murder by the law. Edgeworth, Maria, Belinda it was several hours before George Edward's body was removed to the cellar of the Brown Bear, and several more before Sir David Royce, the coroner for Middlesex County, could be summoned to examine the body. Well, there is no mystery as far as what killed this man. Sir David was a portly, balding man. His eye and mind were sharp, and unlike many coroners, he had a physician's training. He was stabbed, and you have the knife there. He indicated the curved blade that Adam had found beside Edwards's body. His knuckles are split and his face is bruised, so I'd say it was a brawl. Stafford and Townsend stood beside Adam, which allowed Adam to observe Stafford closely. The man's face remained absolutely immobile as his attention shifted from the corpse to Townsend and Sir David and to Adam himself. What are you looking for? Thank you, Sir David, said Townsend. I'm sorry to have taken you away from your supper. Sir David waved this away and set about washing his hands in the chipped basin that the landlord had brought down for him. Pleased to have the matter be so straightforward, he said. If you would be willing to come with me to Bow Street and sign a statement to that effect, said Stafford. Yes, of course. Sir David dried his hands. Townsend, Harkness, let me know if there's anything further you require. Stafford left with Sir David 
leaving Townsend and Adam alone with the dead man. Well, not the ending I would have seen, Townsend sighed. Killed in a brawl. But, he shrugged, it is the way of things. Adam was looking toward the stairs. What are you thinking? asked Townsend. Adam faced him fully. I am wondering if it is true that Mr Stafford did not know where his man Edwards was holed up. Townsend puffed out his cheeks and shook his head. Well now, he said, that is hardly something that can be discussed here. I promised you a dinner and we are past time. Come along. Adam hesitated. There were questions that needed asking. He wanted to see Torton and Gautier and get their opinions on the matter. Now, no fuss about changing or any such. I'll promise you Mrs Townsend is quite used to us rough fellas who come in straight from the street. Adam wanted to cry off. A dinner at home seemed a waste of time given what had just happened. He needed to get back to Rosalind to make sure all was well with her. At the same time, he also needed to talk with Townsend, convince the man that there were inquiries that should be made. Thank you, sir, said Adam at last, and he followed Townsend up the stairs. John Townsend's home was entirely what Adam would have expected. A tall, narrow townhouse, comfortably furnished, on a thoroughly respectable street. Mrs Townsend was a stout woman, whose nature seemed designed as a perfect match for Townsend. She greeted Adam with a comfortable courtesy, brushing off his apologies for his appearance. During the meal she kept up a steady flow of easy conversation, inquiring after his mother and family, and offering plenty of opportunities for Townsend to regale them both with his own store of anecdotes, some of which Adam had heard three and four times already. The pair made it abundantly clear that news, or work, was to be banished from the table. Adam ate, and gladly. He'd barely had time for a bite all day. He chatted. He tried not to feel the time crawling past, or to wonder what had happened to Rosalind and Alice, or what Stafford was doing now that Edwards was dead, if he was doing anything at all. He needed to write Sir Richard. He needed... Adam realised that Mrs Townsend had gotten to her feet. Embarrassed at his own inattentiveness, he struggled to rise himself. I'll leave you gentlemen to your port. She smiled at Townsend with fond affection and at Adam with courtesy. Townsend brought a decanter of port from the sideboard. A maidservant entered to clear the remains of the meal. Never mind that, Deborah, said Townsend. I'll call you when you want it. Deborah curtsied and left them. Townsend resumed his seat and poured himself a large glass of port. He shoved the decanter to Adam and leaned back and unbuttoned his waistcoat. To the ladies, he raised his glass, without whom we would surely perish in darkness. Adam raised his glass and drank. To the king, said Townsend, long may he reign. Adam, aware that he was being watched, raised his glass. To the king. Resentment and impatience stirred. He forced them both down. Townsend was clearly leading up to something and he needed to hear what it was before he tried to make his own case. Now, I've some news for you, Arkness, said Townsend, confirming Adam's assessment. You're being sent to Liverpool. Adam went still. Townsend met his gaze without hesitation, his expression mild, even tranquil. When? asked Adam. Immediately, said Townsend. The Lord Mayor has written us expressly, asking that I send a man at once. Adam set his glass down. With respect, sir, there is this matter of Edward's murder that Lavendale will deal with it. Townsend reached for the decanter and topped up his own glass. Or Torton, if that will ease your mind. I'll have your letters of introduction for you tomorrow. He sipped his wine. I would prefer to remain in London. There are several matters requiring my attention here. I'm afraid your preferences do not enter into it, said Townsend. I have been asked to send an officer. You are that officer. Sir, said Adam, it is very clear that Mr Stafford was the one who let the thief-taker Beecham out of the cells last night. Beecham knew Celia Ings was likely to have information about Edwards's location, 
Beecham needs to be found and questioned. It is possible he is responsible for the man's death. It is even possible he was sent specifically to get Edwards out of the city so he could not be found by the Defence Committee for the Cato Street men. Now it may be enough, Mr Harkness, said Townsend. But if that's the case, sir, then I said enough. Townsend brought his hand down hard on the table. Will you listen to me? I'm trying to save you, man. Adam stared. Good God, Harkness, Townsend cried. How can a man as sharp as you be so blasted blind? You're one of the best officers we have and you are hell-bent on destroying yourself. Adam paused for a long moment and then said, This is about Stafford. It is about Stafford and Edwards and Manchester and all the rest of it. It is about the fact that you consistently defy orders, you make blatant use of your relationship with the coroner, you involve civilians and women in matters that are strictly Bow Street's provenance. On top of it all, you have everything to lose by your outrageous conduct. I've been trying to tell you this for years now. <laughs>